Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Um, I'm going to call to order, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Farouk, our clerk, if we have a, a uh, quorum. Yes, we have a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. I'm Tom Hunt, president of the RUSD Board of Education. On behalf of my colleagues, myself, and Superintendent Renee Hill, I welcome you to the RUSD Board of Education's business meeting for October 21st, 2021. The meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you'd like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found at our website, riversideunified.org. Riversideunified, one word, dot org. This meeting will be held in person in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School in the historical boardroom and is the open to the public. We'll be following the current state and county health and safety guidelines during the meeting. The California Department of Public Health's COVID-19 public health guidelines for K-12 schools in California 21-22 school year have imposed mask requirements on everyone, students and adults, in a K-12 indoor school setting. Because this is a board meeting and not a K-12 school setting, we will be following the Centers for Disease Control CDC guidelines in which masks are not required for those who are fully vaccinated. And this is on the honor system, per, uh, so you decide. A limited overflow meeting room with a television monitor will be available if the main boardroom meets capacity. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD meetings YouTube channel. For members of the public who would like to address the board on education items of business to be transacted or discussed today by the board, please see a staff member at the entrance and they will assist you. Dr. Farouk, do we have any public participation requests for the closed session matters? No, we do not. All right, then I will adjourn us to closed session and the board will return at 5.30 p.m. Thank you.
Good evening. Good evening. Please come to order. Thank you. Find a seat. Are you comfortable? Good evening. I'm Tom Hunt, president of the RUSD Board of Education for 2021. On behalf of myself, my colleagues, and Superintendent Hill and her, her cabinet staff, I welcome you to the Board of Education's meeting of October 21st, 2021. The meeting will be live streamed on RUSD's YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found at our website, www.riversideunified.org. www.riversideunified.org. I'd like to introduce our assistant superintendent, Sergio San Martin, to provide these directions to our public in Spanish for the live stream channel. Assistant Thank Superintendent. Thank you, President Hunt. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta de Educación del 21 de octubre del 2021. Esta reunión se transmitirá en vivo en el canal YouTube del Distrito Escolar. Si gustan ver esta reunión en español, sigan el enlace incluido dentro del orden del día, el cual puede encontrar en nuestro sitio de línea en www.riversideunified.org. Muchas gracias. Back to you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. San Martin. All right, so uh, this meeting will be held in person at the live, at the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. We'll be following the current state and county health and safety guidelines during the meeting. The California Department of Public Health, the CDPH, COVID, quote, COVID-19 public health guidance for K-12 schools in California, 21-22 year, year imposes mass requirements on everyone, students and adults in K-12 indoor school settings. Because this meeting is not a school setting, we will be following the Center for Disease Control, CDC's guidelines in which masks are not required for those who are fully vaccinated. If you are here without a mask, then you're attesting that you have been fully vaccinated. This is strictly to your own personal sense of uh, uh, integrity and uh, for this board and your neighbor in RUSD. If you are here maskless and unvaccinated, then your present place in the district is a position of legal liability to your district and others. The public health requirements and current discussions at the state and federal levels about vaccines are prompting a wide range of personal and emotional reactions. We hear the full spectrum, we hear the full spectrum of your thoughts, empathize, from those who you ask for masking indoors and outdoors, and trust that vaccination saves lives and those who say masking is unnecessary, indeed some argue is unhealthy, from those with anti-vaccine sentiments. Uh, on behalf of your Board of Education, I want you to know, your school community, that we hear you, we empathize, we are parents, and we respect it is your absolute right to share your point of view, and it is your right and responsibility to advocate for your children. We are glad you are raising your voices, not too loud, sharing your concerns, and we'll be sure to pass along your concerns to our colleagues, as well as we've committed to Sacramento in public health and the state. On a personal note, at our previous meeting, uh, and during a brief recess, I made a comment uh, that was um, a reaction, a visceral, uh, to a speaker's, earlier speaker's words in opposition to gender identity, which I found inappropriate. My comment was not meant to be demeaning, and by the way, my comment was mine, not this board's, nor the, the uh, district. Um, yet a speaker in California public settings within some parameters, has the right to their personal point of view. And, uh, and yet I sit up on the other side of this lectern, so I must remember and be reminded that my words um, and actions uh, to always be mindful of others. Uh, I uh, meant to not offend anyone, particularly the, the earlier speakers, and uh, I hope you, the community, and my colleagues will accept my apology. Now, we are... Uh, a limited overflow meeting room with television monitors will be available in the main boardroom meets capacity. Which it may, how are we on that? Where are you? All right. Um, so there may be over there, and if you're called, please let us know. Uh, be available meets capacity, and as always, the meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD board meetings YouTube channel, as noted. Uh, we are also broadcasting closed captions today, so those watching the meeting's live stream can follow the live transcription of the closed captions through the link on YouTube. For members of the public who would like to address the Board of Education, 
on items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board that are on the agenda then, please see a staff member at the entrance and they will assist you in filling out a request to address the Board of Education. That's fine. Uh, while the business meeting of the board, while this is a business meeting, excuse me, while this is a business meeting of the Board of Education is held in public, yet under the governing laws, Brown Act, this is not a public meeting. Therefore, the meeting will be perceived in an orderly manner. If one or more persons cannot abide by such reciprocal decorum, other speakers are disrupted or there are outbursts, then under the authority granted to the board by the state of California and then assigned to the chair, me, uh, we will call a recess of the board and if not, it continues, we will under the Brown Act clear the room. Um, later with the elective to invite back into the room those we determine were not involved in the disruption. I'm sure we can all do much better than that, what that expectation uh, puts. So I want to report to you now in closed session, there was no action taken, and then we will now take the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we not have a child to do that? Okay. Mr. Keeler, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Chris? I pledge allegiance. The Board of Education, this is item E, the Board of Education will be provided with the presentation on grading practices and policies. Dr. Ryan Lewis is assigned uh, to lead this. He's our Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction, K-12. And uh, now it, uh, he will introduce our speaker tonight, Mr. Feldman, Dr. Lewis, or Dr. Angola. Good to see you. Angola. Good evening, President Hunt, Superintendent Hill, and Board of Trustees. I am very excited to have Joe Feldman here to present on grading for equity. Before we bring our guest speaker, I would like to provide the board some background information as to what led us to today. So if we could have the presentation presented. Perfect. Excuse me. In 2019, RUSD was in the process of reviewing grading policies. As we know, they're extremely important in the educational system and to our stakeholders. As part of that process, we, at the start of the review process, we sent out a homework and grading survey to students, to teachers, and to families, parents. We also convened a grading policy advisory committee to review the survey results, creating research and surrounding district policies. We also gathered input from a variety of stakeholder groups, such as PTSA, DLAC, and other groups. The advisory committee had several recommendations. One was to hold a board study session on grading research by an expert on grading practices. Another was to develop an RUSD philosophy statement on grading. The last was to the last one was to convene a team to update elementary report cards. We were planning on holding the board study session at the end of the 1920 school year, but due to the pandemic, that meeting is, has been postponed to, to this evening. So it is my privilege to introduce Joe Feldman to you this evening. Joe has worked in education for over 20 years as a teacher, principal, and district administrator and is the founder and CEO of Crescendo Education Group, which since 2013 has supported K-12 schools, districts, colleges, universities nationwide to improve grading and assessment practices. He leads the Equitable Grading Project and has presented at numerous education conferences, and his writings have been published in Education Week, Education Leadership, District Administrator, and Black Press USA. His book, Grading for Equity, What It Is, Why It Matters, and How It Can Transform Schools and Classrooms, was published in 2018. Crescendo Education Group has partnered with the National Education Association, as well as the American Federation of Teachers, National Association of Independent Schools, and Stanford University's Challenge Success. Joe's earned his BA from Stanford University, a master's degree in teaching curriculum from the Harvard School of Education, uh, he lives in Oakland with his wife and two children. 
So after the presentation, there will be uh, time for questions. I will come back and talk next steps, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end of the presentation. So at this time, I'd like to bring up Joe Feldman. Good evening. Um, my name is Joe Feldman. It's really a pleasure to be um, in front of you all today. I want to thank the Board of Trustees for inviting me to share a few words about the, this work. Um, I also want to thank um, uh, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Angulo uh, and certainly Ms. Hill um, for um, having this be a part of the district's conversation and recognizing the key value of tackling what is often a very difficult topic for um, districts to tackle, which is grading. So I've got the PowerPoint all ready to go, and here we go. So um, this presentation is really going to have three parts. Uh, I'm going to talk about the why, why talk about grading, um, and address it explicitly. The second is the what, um, what is equitable grading, um, and how does it work, and, and, and what is the value of it. And then lastly, a little bit of the how, which is how have districts um, moved forward in this work and what are some do's and don'ts as we think about um, improving practices in our schools. So uh, she gave the bio. I, uh, when I was a principal and a teacher, um, tackling with, uh, grading was always something that was very difficult to get my head around. Um, and in 2013, started researching. Um, and finding that many of our grading practices are actually fossilized from 100 years ago. Um, and in fact, many of them undermine um, effective teaching and learning and, um, and uh, okay. And uh, perpetuate um, historical achievement disparities. Um, and so began doing this work and now have had the fortune of partnering with lots of districts and schools um, and colleges and universities across the, the country. Um, and you can see it's both large districts and small and charter schools and independent schools. Um, they're particularly because of what we have learned, I think, during the pandemic. Um, it showed a bright spotlight on the inapplicability of many of our traditional grading practices, uh, and in fact, how they harm children, and in fact, how they have always harmed um, our historically underserved students. And yet, it can be very isolating to do this work. So, uh, we've got a Facebook group and Twitter feed and all kinds of ways that teachers can connect with each other because even as a district it can sometimes feel like you're pushing a very steep boulder, uh, sorry, a very heavy boulder up a steep hill. Um, but it's really um, important work and so many folks are getting engaged with that now. So I thought it'd be important to just say what this isn't. Um, this is not going to be a complete and comprehensive instruction about what equitable grading is. Uh, it's far too complex for that. Um, and this is not going to answer all of your questions. In fact, if I do my job, you'll have more questions now than you do, or you'll have more questions later than you do right now. But what this is going to be is an introduction to the what, why, and how of equitable grading. Um, it's going to be an introduction of some vocabulary and language um, to use to think about it and to look at some of the practices that you may have experienced, even as a grown up, um, or that your children may be experiencing. Um, and adjust a little bit of space to imagine um, what this could do for the district. So a bit into the why. So there are so many aspects of teaching and learning in schools. Um, as a district administrator, grading was not the top thing on my list. Um, it's often thought of that grading is this final sort of coda, the last couple of notes in a long symphony of teaching and learning. Um, and you know, it's just adding up number of points a student earned over points possible and you get a percentage and that's it. Um, but in fact, it's much more than that. Um, because teachers have to make lots of decisions related to that, like what category weights do I have? How much does homework count? What happens if the work doesn't come in the way it's supposed to come in? Um, and even in every pedagogical decision that a teacher makes, Whenever they ask a student to do anything, they have to decide, am I going to grade this or not? 
And so even though we may think that grading is this final little thing and you're just kind of calling balls and strikes as a teacher, um, it's actually interwoven into every pedagogical decision that a teacher makes. Um, and one of the ironies is that when teachers are deciding how to grade, they're basing it on their own experiences. How was I graded? What is the culture, right? So what did my department chair tell me? Or you know, what, what is the software doing? Um, but teachers get no formal training in how to grade. It's not included in graduate school work. It's not part of onboarding in most places. When you get a new curriculum, they don't tell you how to grade it. It's never mentioned. And so most teachers have no choice but to replicate how they were graded. Um, and another irony is that despite the fact that it's woven into every pedagogical decision and teachers get no training in it, unfortunately, it has huge implications for our students. As we know, this, the grade is, dis, is the determining factor in do you graduate? What academic track are you in? Do you get to participate in the after school activities? And even non-academic things like what is your insurance rate? And do you get a job? In California, you have to have a minimum GPA to get a work permit. So it's not just do I get to play in the soccer game, but it's, it's family income that is actually implicated, to say nothing for scholarships and things like that, which can implicate family wealth and debt, intergenerational debt. So it has huge implications. Um, and yet, if, a t if an administrator comes up to a teacher and says, hey, I'd like to talk to you about your grading for a minute, the teacher's not like, oh, goody, I can't wait to talk about it. For most teachers, it's a very protected space because it, I write about how it's one of the last islands of autonomy for teachers with all the mandates placed on us and all the expectations. The grading exists as this last place where we can bring our full professional judgment and expertise, and so we protect it. And so this work is about normalizing that conversation and providing some constructive support around it. And I want to talk also about why in the context of equity. Um, and you should know how, we, how I sit in this conversation. And that's with a recognition that we work within a legacy of schools that historically have not served groups of students well and have even harmed groups. Um, and that's over multiple generations. And when I say groups of students, it's specifically black students, Latinx, indigenous students, students whose families are of lower income, who have special needs, and whose first language is in English. We, as a legacy of schools and educators, have not served those groups and have even harmed them. And what that has looked like is where we have denied access to elements of our educational system, like the same high quality teaching and learning that other groups have had, or even non-academic aspects of schools, like the dignity and voice that those communities have had. And so the result of this is that we can predict the outcomes of academic outcomes of students based on their race, parents' education background, family income, special needs status, all these things that are outside of kids' control. And none of us went into schools so you could predict the outcomes of kids by things that they can't control. And this uh, quote is really helpful in thinking about this work, which is that organizations are perfectly designed to get the results they get. Right? We would argue that the systems we've inherited particularly the grading system, or as one example I should say, as the grading system, is actually creating and perpetuating disparities without us even recognizing it. And it's doing it in two ways. The first is that our traditional grading systems reward students with resources and punish those who don't. And it actually makes it harder for students who have fewer resources from becoming successful. And so I like to show this quote from Professor Bettina Love, who talks about how we have to take a much more active role. We cannot look to the system to solve the problems of grading that is actually built into the system. All right, so that was some of the why. I'm gonna give a little bit more why, which is like, where did this come from? Why of all possible universes of grading systems do we have this one? And what's its impact on the work we do? You know, we've. Uh, had tectonic changes to our schools. We've unbolted the desks, which was actually very radical at the time, if you can believe it. Um, they thought kids would just run around crazy if you didn't bolt down where they sat. Um, the way students access information is totally different. The way students interact with information is different. Where the teacher is, what they do is different. And yet report cards are almost identical. So on the left, you see, is from 1918. From the right is a century later. Subject, 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 letter, letter, letter. So. 
I'm not going to go deep into the history, but it really started in the Industrial Revolution, this system of grading. Um, we had the one-room schoolhouses before this with narrative grading. A teacher would have the same group of kids multiple years, and they'd describe verbally or in written way how kids were doing. When we had the Industrial Revolution, people uh, congregating in the cities, we built big schools. You couldn't do that anymore. You had to totally change how you did things. And so I want to talk about how some aspects of this inherited system actually constrain our work and hurt our most vulnerable students without us even recognizing it. So the first way is that our traditional grading actually constrains our language and our communication and uh, actually gives misleading information about students. So when you know, a teacher is about to press submit on their grade book or they're going to have a uh, caregiver child or caregiver um, teacher conference. They have a whole lot of information about students, where they grew, what they struggled with, how they get motivated, how they work in groups, what they learned, what they didn't learn, all kinds of stuff. And they get to give a letter. And that is straight from the Industrial Revolution. Rather than narrative grading, we had to be efficient and we wanted to sort students. Um, it became very important for us to figure out who was going to be the bosses of the factories, who was going to college, and we also believed that you had a specific intelligence and you were born with it, and that's what you died with, uh, which led to all kinds of diabolical applications like the eugenics movement and all kinds of other stuff. But we were sorting kids in our schools. That was the whole point. We need to figure out who's who, and we're going to put them into different academic tracks, and we're going to give more resources to the kids at the upper tracks. This idea of collapsing so much information into a single letter leads to the following problem, right? If I have a student who um, is great at certain things and weak in others, right, I'm putting so much information together that it actually becomes impossible to know what the single letter represents. Right? If, for example, I have a student who is an angel of a kid and doesn't know the content very well, that kid could get the same grade as a kid who knows the content very, very well, but comes late every day, right? Those are two very different students, and yet they could receive identical grades. And when I'm a parent or caregiver, or I'm a principal, or I'm a teacher, and I see a grade, I don't know in what alchemical relationship all the different criteria are, because teachers are including how the student did on tests, how they did on homework, did they come late, did they do extra credit, did they bring all the materials, did they, do, um, did they erase the whiteboard, all kinds of stuff. So it's impossible for us to make decisions about what a grade means. And that's, the teachers are doing the best they can. Every teacher is making tweaks to this dysfunctional system. And they're all doing it differently based on their own beliefs with subjectivity and biases, but they're always bringing their best professional judgment. No teacher is saying, I don't care what the grades are. Every teacher is trying to invest our grades with meaning and value and messages about what the learning community requires and what the professional world demands, and yet they're all doing it differently. Some are dropping the lowest score. Some are taking off five points if it's late. Some are taking off 10 points. Some are giving extra if you turn it in early. Some have 10 work assignments, some have two. All kinds of things are happening. And ironically, one more irony, is that when we ask teachers, they know something's up. So um, we do surveys as part of partnerships with schools. And one of the pairs of questions we ask is the first one, how much do you agree with this statement that my grades are accurate reflections uh, of uh, the preparation for this student in the next year, right? How accurate are my grades? And as you might expect, oops, I'm so sorry. The animation not happening? The animation isn't happening. All right, well, I'll tell you what happens. That um, what happens is, is that teachers are relatively confident that their grades are accurate. The second question we ask is, how accurate are your colleagues' grades? The grades of the incoming students, how accurate are they? And teachers aren't very confident about their colleagues' grades, right? I'm doing it right, but I don't know what they're doing, right? And that's what we would expect to happen with no training and us all doing the best we can. So then what happens is that you have this variability, right? You could have identical performance 
for two different teachers' classes, and the teachers have different grading systems, and you get a different grade, even though the performance might be the same, right? And that's exactly what we would expect to happen. Oops, come back. And so what happens as a result is that we have this inaccurate information about where students are in their learning and what they need. And so then we as a district or as a school start using resources relying on information that becomes unreliable, right? We have students who are playing on the athletic field who maybe shouldn't and people who shouldn't who, or who aren't who should should be, right? And particularly when we think about the disproportionate placement of students of color into special education, part of the criteria is the grades that they've received. The last uh, element I want to talk about from this historical system is the harm to students. So if I asked you to reflect on a powerful experience you had receiving a grade when you were a kid, right? You could probably, with a little bit of thinking, think about it, an experience you had that was powerful when you received a grade, right? And when we do this work, everybody's got one. And many of them are very negative. And in fact, they start to change how kids think about themselves. Because in middle school, some elementary, but middle school and particularly in high school, it's about identity development, right? Who am I? And grades are a very formalized way that students get messages about who they are. And so students don't say, I struggle in math. They say, I'm a D student. They describe themselves by the grades they received. And it can add a tremendous amount of stress in the current system, right? This is a quote from a kid. In my life, the thing that causes me the most stress is the amount that teaching revolves around points and grades. And a lot of teachers would say the same thing. All right. So I'm going to get past this. All right. So now I've kind of really bummed you all out. And now I'm going to talk about what is equitable grading and what makes it better. So the framework for equitable grading is where it has three pillars. The first is that grades accurately reflect a student's academic performance, that grades are bias resistant, so they counteract institutional biases and prevent implicit biases from infecting the grade. And that grades are motivational. They build students' intrinsic motivation and sense of advocacy. And there's a whole lot in this, and I'm not going to talk about all this, but I'm going to talk about one example. The common grading practice, and it's actually built into the software that um, most teachers use, is where we average performance over time. So let me give you an example, right? I'm teaching the Pythagorean theorem. It's an eighth grade math class. I don't know if, eighth, if it's an eighth grade math standard, but Trust me, uh, just go with me. Um, and I uh, have a quiz, quiz, and then another quiz, all right? So I have one student, and they got an A, 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 and another student got a D, C, A, OK, over the three quizzes. And traditionally, what we do is we average performance over time. We average those three quiz scores. So the first kid who got A, A, A has an A, obviously, and the other kid who had D, C, A has like B minus, C plus, something like that. So we have an accuracy problem. The first problem is that when we say for that kid, the DCA gives that kid an average of a C plus, that C plus is inaccurate on its face. That kid never had C plus knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem. They had D, C, and A. C plus is a new A that we came up to describe that kid's understanding of the Pythagorean theorem. So that's problem number one. Second problem is if I, looked at those two kids and said, okay, what level of understanding, or excuse me, does, this, does each student have an A-level understanding of the Pythagorean theorem? The answer is yes. Like, one took longer, but they both have identical understanding of the Pythagorean theorem. So by having that first kid have a C, or excuse me, second kid have a C plus, that is an inaccurate description of that kid's level of understanding. So that's the accuracy problem with that. And if we want to be more accurate, right, we want the grade to accurately describe a student's understanding, then we need to look at the most recent performance, right? That kid has an A-level understanding. Let's describe it as that. Now, I also want to talk about what in that, um, the looking at um, averaging and looking at most recent performance is around bias resistance. So I want to talk about the institutional biases. Um, in this case. So institutional biases are when the structures that we have 
um, reward certain groups and favor them and disadvantage or punish other groups. Right? So this is not the individual actors, this is when it's built into a system or a process. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped that. So this is an example, right? So racism is not this independent event, it's built into structures. So you may say, well, okay, maybe, Joe, but what does that have to do with averaging? Averaging is just this calculation, right? So let's take the example of the two kids, right? Pythagorean theorem. Let's say the first kid, they got an A on that first quiz. Well, they weren't born knowing how to, write, how to do the, the Pythagorean theorem, right? Let's say that kid, the summer before, went to a great math camp, right? Parents could afford it, caregivers could afford it, could get the kid there, didn't have other responsibilities, walks in the class the first day, does great, Pythagorean theorem, AAA. Other kid didn't go to that math camp, who knows why? Maybe parents, caregivers didn't know about it, couldn't afford it, couldn't get the kid there. Uh, had other responsibilities, take care of younger siblings, whatever. That kid, of course, they don't know how to do it when they, when they start. And that kid then learned how to do it, right? In traditional grading, when we average performance over time, we're saying all the disparities in resources that are happening outside the class, come on in. We'll bring all those in and we'll make it easier for the students who have more resources and we'll make it harder for the kids who don't. And when we are bias resistant, we counteract that. We counteract those things that are happening outside the school over which we don't have any control as educators. Oops, let me come back here. Sorry about that. And we're more bias resistant when we look at the most recent performance only, right? That's how we counteract those disparities happening outside. And now I'll talk about the motivation part, right? Um, we want to build student sense of efficacy and intrinsic motivation. So in that example I gave of that kid who got the D, C, A, Right? That's a, actually a good story. We, that kid had that D, had that C, and then did great. But that often is not the story, right? Kid does a D, gets a D on the first quiz, and is like, yep, I knew it. I'm not good at math. I've never been very good at math. I didn't think I was very good when I took the quiz. That's good enough. And that kid just sort of checks out. Um, because that kid knows the math, right? That kid knows they're gonna have to dig themselves out of this hole if they're going to be successful, and it's going to be impossible to salvage that. The kid is dragging the anchor around for the rest of the time. And that reinforces everything we know about learning and motivation. Um, the first quote is by Geneva Gay, who's just a titan in uh, culturally sustaining and responsive pedagogy, um, who talks about each failure confirms what a student already knows, um, but they can't do it. Um, and instead of prompting greater effort, low grades cause students to withdraw from learning. Right? And now, when we include only the most recent performance, kids are constantly inspired to keep working because they're always redeemable. They can always be successful no matter if they make mistakes. Um, which leads to yet another irony, which is that we in, in education have gotten very good at using the language of mistake making and normalizing that and drawing from Carol Dweck and many others. And in fact, our grading contradicts this. We say to the kid who got a DCA, make mistakes, that's perfect, do more, that's exactly what's supposed to happen, I'm so proud of you, and I'm gonna punish you for making those mistakes because I'm gonna include those mistakes in your grade. And this, counter, this uh, overcomes that and aligns the way we talk about growth mindset with the way that we grade. Oops. Uh, oh, just a couple of quotes from teachers. One kid started late in the class, was scoring low, was playing catch up. For the first time, I was giving him hope that he could still pass. And it makes a huge difference when you have kids who have hope. They don't give up and it changes the dynamic of the classroom. All right, so that was the why and some of the what, and I wanna talk a little bit more of the what and then get into the how. So we've done this um, in lots of places, as you saw across the country, and we've collected a lot of data. And one of the things that we, well, we see a number of things happen over and over regardless of context, whether it's college, middle school, high school, elementary, independent school, large, small, whatever. Oops. So what happens when teachers start using these practices? We see a reduction in grade inflation and a reduction in grade deflation at the same time, very interestingly and a reduction in achievement disparities by those um, different groups I mentioned earlier. And interestingly, um, although I'm not a huge lover of standardized exams, 
um, what we find is that the grade that the teacher assigned gets more closely correlated with the results of the exam. And again, I don't love everything about standardized exam, but I would rather have the grades be closer than farther away than what the teacher assigns, uh, excuse me, than what the um, test results are. Also, students say they're a lot more motivated and they're not as stressed and they're not as focused on points. Um, and they talk about their growth in language of the discipline and their relationships get better. And this is hard for teachers. It's very difficult um, because it challenges so many things of what they've come to believe, um, but they are hungry for the work. Um, and they end up being a lot more confident in the grades they assign and their classrooms feel less stressful in lots of really important ways. And so when people want to know like, well, great, how do we do this? Right? We are very clear that what you do not do is where, no offense, a board of trustees says, great, we are going to do all these things. We're going to make a policy tomorrow and that'll fix everything. Like, nope. Um, the way that when, when districts do that, what happens is, is teachers are like, what are you doing? Like, this is my protected space. It's my last island of autonomy. And instead, what this requires is to invest in teachers and build their understanding and capacity and experiences with trying out the different practices. And the role of um, staff and, and board members is to think about how to create that space and those opportunities and protect that space and those opportunities so they can better understand the benefits of the practices and then that informs policy development because now you're basing it on the evidence in the district by the, your teachers. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, so I have a book. There's lots of people who have written other articles. I'm not the only person who knows about this stuff. Um, but I think having this kind of a presentation and having sort of a public viewing and, and uh, access to this is a huge part of getting this conversation normalized and raising the value of it for everybody and seeing how regardless of who, where your kid has performed in the past, you have every uh, investment and um, uh, benefit of getting more accuracy and more bias resistance and more motivation and less stress. A um, Couple last things. Um, this is from a history teacher. This has pushed me and all the teachers to be more equitable and transparent. Students at the same school should be able to have the same grading system, be able to understand that grading system and know exactly how it supports learning. And we have just scratched the surface. I know you all have questions. I'm looking forward to addressing them when the time comes. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, sir. What an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Allaby, for uh, working with Mr. Feldman to bring him here after I know you met him at a conference and, and heard his uh, uh, comments. Uh, is, do we have any public speakers or are you yes. continuing? We have, we have one. I'm sorry, Doctor. Did I interrupt you? Or are you? No, that's okay. I was just Go going to talk briefly about next steps and then yes, move to the questions, if that's okay. So uh, I don't think we need to bring back the presentation mm -hmm. up. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe, for your presentation. And yes, we'll have some time for questions. But I wanted to just briefly go over some next steps, which uh, was to uh, our first thing is we want to reconvene our grading advisory committee, uh, bring them back to talk about the work and where we left off and our next steps with that. The team will also work on getting smaller teams to work on the RUSD grading philosophy as a recommendation and then convene the team to update elementary report cards as some current next steps. And so this will also come back to academic oversight committee and where we're at with the progress. And of course, we would like to continue our work and partnership with Joe Feldman moving forward. And so those are just some of the next steps moving forward. And then now I'd like to open it up for some questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Angulo. Very much appreciated, Dr. Lewis. We have one speaker card right now, Ms. Sandy R. on Grady. Ms. R., you have two minutes. So on September 16th, I came to the board meeting and I talked about a Riverside County Office of Education presentation that I had seen. And they were discussing this similar topic. And at the time, I met with Dr. Lewis and Mr. Hunt also confirmed, this is not our USD, that's Riverside County, we're not doing that. This is exactly what they were doing, equitable grading. Basically, um, 
ensuring equal outcomes and math was what the presentation was about and that's very similar to what you're doing here there are only two ways to accomplish equity equity and that's to give everyone the same grade or not grade at all there's no other way that you're going to give equity unless you're going to make it teacher discretion what grade she wants to give you so if she likes your kids you'll get a better grade if she doesn't like your kid you won't because there's no other way to verify the grades if you're not going by the actual work the students are doing um, so fast forward a month and here we are talking about the subject that you guys assured me we were not talking about. Same concept. Please give us specific examples on how this will work. Let me give you an example. The Pythagorean theorem that he just mentioned. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. What is the ambiguity? How are you going to change their grade? Are you going to say, oh, well, you know, the first semester they didn't know it, but second semester they did? That's grade validation. We've already been there, done that. You guys did grade validation um, before. You guys have already tried doing the pass-fail. Um, if you don't want to have a metrics for you guys to be accountable that you're actually doing the job educating our students, and maybe that's why we're 48th in the country, then, because th that's what this seems like to parents, is that you don't want to have a metric. Um, so surely these factors will not be based on protected classes because that would open you up to liability. So we will focus then on language and socioeconomic because you don't want to say race or sex or gender because then that would obviously open you up to liability with this kind of policy. Um, so how will this translate into college admissions outside of California? How will they um, feel about this um, grading system that you're going? Thank you. public speaker, do I, I will now go to our board and ask if, if they have uh, questions and comments for our staff and Mr. Feldman. Uh, Dr. Farouk, I'm, it's only coming up here at the bottom, but thank you, Dr. Farouk, please. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President Hunt. Uh, thank you so much uh, f for this presentation, uh, and uh, Mr. Feldman, your uh, background is very... Uh, imp there you go. Oh. You're there. Go okay. Can you hear me better now? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It's a very uh, important discussion, and uh, I really appreciate just the way that you set up the context so you can help us all understand the, the value of this. So I just have a few questions. One is, uh, uh, you know, I think the one thing that's important that I want to just illuminate from what you said, and I want to get your affirmation on this, is that what we're not talking about is having less rigor. This is, this is, not about, this is a matter of the structure and the process and, the, uh, and the, the fairness associated with these things, but it's not about it's lowering standards, it's not about having that the rigor. Can you just speak to that a little bit? No, no, turn it on. So um, when we um, work with teachers, one of the things we ask them at the end is, um, tell us what people might um, incorrectly assume um, from what you're doing now. And they always say they think we've made it easier. And in fact, we've made it harder because what we've done is make it so you can't just bring in cupcakes for extra credit and you can't just um, erase the whiteboard and you can't just do your homework every day. You actually have to understand the material, which has never been something that has been what the grade entirely represents. It's represented lots of things, including that. And so this actually ramps up the level of um, sort of expectations for students and what they're supposed to understand of the academic content. Thank you for confirming that. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear uh, uh, to, to, to everybody. My n next comment is, so the, the examples you outlined, and I, I totally understand that this was a very narrow discussion, you know, that this requires a much broader process and, and, and input and so forth. But uh, you're really, the, from the examples you gave regarding equity-based grading, you're talking about competency-based education. So the focus is on, are you, are you understanding the material as opposed to you maybe started off slowly, but at the end, you actually have a full mastery of the course, and should you be graded as an average or, you know, based on the, so, but my question regarding that is, what, how does this apply to courses where there's not an accumulation of knowledge, where you're learning one thing in the beginning, and then you're not building on that knowledge later, you're learning something else later in the semester, how do you, how does, how does that, that type of content apply in your... 
Yeah. In your so this comes up all the time. So more so in like science and sure. sometimes social studies and other subjects. Sure. Um, so there's a couple of responses. One is the example I gave is for a unit, right? So it's for a particular standard potentially, right? So you could, within a standard, if you do quiz, quiz, test, or you know, that oversimplifies assessment, but you could only look at how students did at the end of the unit. You could also, if there's some cumulative nature to it, think about how overriding earlier performance, right? If I do something, um, if I do quiz, quiz, test in October, but there's actually aspects of that that get um, integrated into future content in November, I may need, have needed more time, and so I could then override it. Also, I don't want to get too in the weeds with you, but um, if you think about it, um, even in science class, um, there are um, NGSS practices that cut across, across content areas. So understanding primary, uh, understanding data, right? That applies whether I'm learning about kinetic energy or momentum, or uh, sorry, that's what's And NGSS, you're like saying next generation yes, science next generation just science for the sake of the public. Yes, right? absolutely. So whether or not you have those or not, there are um, cross content skills um, which do build over time, right? I want a student to better understand how to analyze data in May than I do in October, and it may take kids longer. So sometimes teachers will actually assign two grades to something. One grade on the content, do they understand kinetic energy? And the other on, do they understand primary, or excuse me, do they understand data? And as I change content, now I'm doing electricity, but they still gotta understand data, I'm actually gonna overwrite the earlier grade around understanding data, because they're building up their proficiency over time. So there's lots of ways that teachers do this. There is no, like, this ain't a toolkit. No, no, no. Forgive my, I'm just be, seeking like, examples just to have a yeah. better understanding, because I think one thing that's very intriguing to me also is that the generation for myself and those that came before me, we really fo learned based on just memorizing information. That's right. Uh, and obviously, with the advent of the internet and things, it's just that's not a, this is not a smart way, you know, to prepare um, people, especially when the jobs that they're going to be graduating to don't even exist. So it's more about like you know, critical thinking and having uh, different qualities and information to have the tools to be able to be successful. In, in, in life and workforce and so forth. So, so what you're saying is based on that kind of concept, especially for not just memorizing information, that the grading could be based on the progress of those skills that they're doing that could be applied to different that's modalities right. of, of, of what they're learning. That's right, yes. Okay, okay that, that's, that's interesting. But it, and again, I'm, I'm just seeking examples. I know that this is much yeah. more, but like, even when, it, when you were giving those examples, you kept using the word grade. What would be an example of an actual grade that you that's, that a teacher would ascribe in these exa in these instances? It, would it be purely qualitative, and, and oh. how is that able to be uh, measured and, and you know defined for? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So there's all kinds of ways to do this, and I'm not so prescriptive to say like it must look like this. Just but examples. it would be sure. Yeah. So some use A B C D F, and now it's just a lot clearer of what the A B C D F represents. Other districts decide to use more qualitative descriptors, or maybe even teachers will. So A might be uh, mastery of the, of the skill. B might be like um, competent understanding of the skill. C might be has gaps in, in understanding the skill. Right? It's very much describing what the, the letter represents. So, so this is really important. So the, the, it, theoretically, again, we're not trying to be prescriptive, but theoretically, the letter grades could still apply in this process. Of course. The, the, but the point is, is that there, it's very transparent on how you get there. That's the key. And that it's also, uh, it's, 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 there's an opportunity for the student over the course of the time to be able to reach the level of mastery of what was being discussed and then be evaluated at that point as opposed to just being written off right from the beginning. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, and then I guess my last uh, question uh, is going back to the process, uh, it, 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 to, and maybe this is a Dr. Angulo question. Th thank you so much, Mr. Sure. Feldman. This is very helpful. So uh, I, I think this helps, I think, illuminate and frame you know, what this is and what, what people's perceptions might be of this. Uh, what, what could the board, besides us being informed and educated about this and the value of it, what, what role can the board play to help support this process? Uh, we obviously know it's important for our, our teachers and our administrators to, to have uh, a variety of input and collaborate throughout this process, but what can we be doing to help support this process? So thank you for that question. Um, 
Part of it is the first step was to really make sure you're informed of part of the work. As you mentioned, it takes um, grading practices are very important to all stakeholders, uh, you know, the parents, the teachers, the students, and so it's really uh, explaining that and bringing Joe Feldman to kind of talk about that. And then our next steps as we start moving down. Uh, so, for example, the RUSD grading philosophy, once we get a team and we start looking at that, that becomes before the board and you can see where, how we arrive there and just keeping everybody along as we move down this path. So it's staying informed and um, us communicating the process with you. And just two last sub-questions. What is the time frame that you're anticipating that, uh, that we'll have something actionable of, about this? Uh, what are you anticipating with that? We will be reconvening uh, the grading advisory team in January and starting the discussion of the time frame of what, what that occurs. The first thing would be the philosophy statement, or the, the board philosophy statement, and once we have that, then we'll look at convening a team for uh, the elementary report cards, because we want to have the philosophy statement as a guiding thing to look at that, and we'll convene with uh, elementary principals, parents, and uh, all stakeholders for that to review and update the elementary report card. And so the grading committee will convene in January. Thank you so much for all your efforts. Mm -hmm. Dr. Baruch, always. Thank you. Excellent question. Trustee Kathy Allaby. Mr. Feldman, I have a question for you. Some of the parents that I talked to, in fact, quite a few over the years, the things that really get them all worked up are homework and late work and the points that are awarded thereof. Um, and I wondered how, how people, how have you handled those kinds of things? Because those can be pretty, uh, that, that can make a difference in a class. A cl one class that has a lot of points for homework, you could get a much better grade than another class where the teacher didn't award those points. So how do, how do you manage that uh, maze? Yeah. Y'all keep pulling me back into the weeds around all this. Um, so, um, well, I think there's actually two things in your question. It's one is just how do you communicate this? Um, and I think part of it is just helping um, people understand about what it is and what it isn't and um, how the system and the, the ways that we've graded actually were harmful to them um, and that the practices when shown in a little different light, show how just antiquated and, and um, how sort of almost they don't really make any um, sense in some ways, even f uh, certainly pedagogically. So an example is um, homework, right? So we assign homework because students need practice, of course, right? They, that's what it's for. And you ask teachers and they say, I want students to practice the things they learned in class. Okay. So if I'm on a sports team, and I'm supposed to go practice my free throws, I go out to the driveway and I shoot a bunch of free throws, nobody is adding up my points for making that and then bringing it into the game and saying, here, add these in the game, right? But we, in education, say, yep, do the homework, get five points. Do that homework, do five points. Do that homework, do five points. And by the way, students copy a lot of homework and the reason they copy is because they gotta get the points. So it adds an incredible amount of stress around this. And it pulls students away from what homework is for, which is to practice. Like, here's where you're supposed to make mistakes. Here's where you're supposed to do the best you can. Maybe you don't finish, maybe you get stuck. That's okay. And helping teachers like reconnect themselves to what they think homework is for and what they think all the points are for. No teacher likes just being a, you know, adding, putting in five participation points every day and bringing home stacks of homework that they're grading every day, five points for everything missing. It just, it reframes what's what learning is supposed to be. And when um, parents and caregivers start to engage in the same conversation, they're like, yeah, I am tired of having my kids stressed out after a three hour, four hour soccer game, they get home at 10 o'clock, they can't do that homework and I don't want them to do that homework. That's not healthy for anybody. And I guarantee my kid's not learning from that, right? And it just helps dislodge people from some of these ways that they didn't even recognize and didn't actually have the chance to better um, examine ways of making this uh, a much more um, sort of humane experience for learners and teachers and refocusing the students as well as the teachers on what we know from all the research about how learning happens and what different parts of that learning mean. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any, anyone else? My colleagues. Mr. Feldman, thank you so much. I, I know, Dr. Angula, we look forward to hearing more about this. Uh, 
I'm answering some of the questions that were asked. And, sorry. Uh, sorry, Mr. Hunt. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kinney. I hit I the wrong it. button. <laughs> yeah. Push the wrong button. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Not uh, so fast, yeah. Joe. Uh, uh, former principal, Trustee Dale Kinney. Yeah, so just to prepare. A you. word that I didn't hear you use was consistency. Oh, and yes. one of the difficult things that, uh, that students have and parents have, mm -hmm. and even teachers themselves have, is that uh, grading practices are so inconsistent sometimes even within a school and even within a department and even within a course and uh, and that that causes angst with with uh, with, with lots of folks uh, one of the, one of the things that i'd like to see different in terms of our, our recommendation for next steps is uh, is a focus on uh, on secondary teachers conversations about grades uh, certainly we need the advisory committee and we need grading philosophy statement uh, but we need to we need to begin the conversation with, uh, with secondary teachers uh, ab about what all this means to, uh, to them. And I, I didn't hear you say this, but my experience is this takes time. You know, th this doesn't happen. Uh, we can't get this done by June. Well, this is sort of an ongoing process. So if we don't start that conversation with secondary teachers uh, sooner uh, than later, then we're, we're never going to... We're never going to get there. So I'd like to see a bullet item for recommendations that says we're going to have a plan for secondary teachers. I think that's good input to you, Dr. Anguilla. And uh, thank you, sir. We really appreciate you being here. I know we put you off once, and <laughs> th things have been a little busy, as you might know. All right, do you, thank let me you. just ask you, do you think, you know, we've been letting the kids out to help pick the crops for 140 years, and we know there's a summer slide and all of that. COVID has been turned public education upside down and, and you know shattered it to rebuild it. Is this the time to begin to make, you talked about it earlier that we need to save education. It can't save us. So is this an opportune time to begin to do some of these that you're talking about and giving more opportunity for children to learn and less having to, I, mean, I never had a teacher that didn't think I had any other teacher giving me homework. So. Uh, but it's just my basic question is how's the timing on this and what is a, the American uh, edu college education for teacher credentialing? How are they looking at this? Um, all right, so to your first, yes. Um, okay. I mean, I, I think there's, these, there's so many things that, that are teachers and educators and parents are just kind of hold, trying to hold in their head around all the pandemic stuff, including what's happening with their kids in school. Um, and I think for a lot of folks, we got a much clearer understanding there's a whole lot that we could do better in education. Um, we sort of accidentally found out about a lot of ways. And I think this is, um, is a great opportunity to start reimagining and, and kind of revisiting some of the things that we thought to be true. Um, second question was, sorry, I got so into the first one. I'm asking about the, uh, the education machine the society of, of colleges and oh yes, credentialing yes. And, uh, so there's and sacramento a, yeah there's a tremendous number of colleges and universities that are starting to pursue this because their um instructors and faculty get none they get no training in teaching much less how to grade um, which also has major implications and there's even there's just as much variability and lack of consistency at the college level as well um, and when we talk to admissions folks they're very interested in having the grade be something that they know what it represents. Because right now, they know that there is so much variability of teachers' grades, it becomes very difficult to know what it even represents, and they really appreciate the clarity. Yeah, and you know, when we were looking at the teacher shortage and how to make sure we attract the best and the brightest and retain them and all, all of that, what we found out is the younger teachers want more of what you're talking about. And they do want more, the ones that are coming into the profession. So I'm, I'm encouraged to hear you. Lastly, though, what does Sacramento say, and will they give an individual district the ability to do this outside of the CDE? Yeah, I'd, I actually don't know um, what their um, sort of explicit per, um, disposition is around the work. Um, but there are, I mean, th there are so many districts in California that are moving in this direction um, that you would be, you would not be the outlier. Um, particularly as LAUSD is starting to significantly move in this direction as San Diego um, and other nearby districts. Right. So um, you would have great company and colleagues in work. Thank you, sir. We look forward to working with you. Thank you, everyone.
we're off the wrong turn. Um, Renee, I'm, uh, Dr. Farouk, you and I spoke earlier about moving an item up uh, alongside uh, G1 to move the other up. Would you prepared to yeah, make that I'll, motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, move N like Nancy, one after G. After G1, like Jerry, all right. Uh, we have a motion to move in one to follow G1. And please uh, vote. Second. Do thank you, Mrs. Allaby. So thank you, Mrs. Allaby. Is there a way to vote? Do you have to come up? Ah, oh, there it is. Thank you. Very good. That covers. All right. So we'll move forward now with the district superintendent's comments. Su district Superintendent Renee Hill. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Before I speak about the day's events, I want to thank our student board member, Luna Nam. This will be Luna's last meeting in her term of service. Although we might see her sitting in for one of the other student board members anytime later during the year. Trustee Nam, I appreciate your sincerity and I really appreciate that it's always paired with a happy disposition. Uh, when I watch you, <laughs> In one example of watching you work, when I watched you introduce topics to the student advisory, I was really taken by a feeling of gratitude and pride. So continue to do well, Trustee Nam. Now, I would like to take a few moments to address a situation that has shocked our community. As you know, a recording of a teacher has been widely circulated on social media. Her words, her actions, done during class time were highly insulting and marginalizing to Native American, indigenous cultures, and others. Please be assured that this has our full attention as our full governance board has discussed it and it will be addressed expeditiously. After learning about the situation, district administration promptly put the employee on administrative leave and initiated an investigation, which will be handled by our personnel department. We are taking this matter seriously, and once our investigation is completed, we'll take appropriate action that is in line with policy and the law and our commitment to create learning environments that are respectful. As an education organization, we have the opportunity, I say we have the obligation, to look squarely and honestly at this incident and address it appropriately. It's my desire that we are all persistent and steadfast in our work to exemplify respect and inclusion for all. We understand that pu the public interest and the desire for immediate action, but we have to follow our processes, due process that is set in law, including California Education Code, and our ultimate action, so that our ultimate action is on solid ground and will not further complicate an already unfortunate situation. The investigation will address what was done and who knew what when and whether this was an isolated event or a continuing event. While the investigation is taking place, our team of counselors and administrators are focusing on our students. We have met with them and will continue to meet with students in the class and community and take actions to heal. As superintendent, however, I do not want this incident to diminish the work that everyone connected with North High has done over a long period of time to welcome everyone who enters their school community. As an organization, we have to stick with this work and address incidents such as these and we have to understand and look deeper and institutionally into why and how these incidents occur. We are committed to implementing inclusive practices and policies that honor the diversity of our district and the greater region. We will be working with our students, our families, our staff and community because we all know that by our actions, we regain the trust in our team. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hill. I appreciate it. Before we go to public comment, have, have you filled out cards? We're going to, so we're not having back and forth and everything. Put them in sections. So we, have we gathered the cards yet? No oh, good. Yes. So we're just going to take about a five minute break. Just take a breather. We'll be right here. Dr. Farouk and I are going to go over these cards.
Can we, re can we resume? Can you have a moment, take your seat, please. All right. Now, I want to be sure that this first part, item G, is not about the items under N, which would be anything COVID-related, the mass mandates, um, the, uh, the yet unmandated vaccines and those sort of things. So, and if, and if there's something different when you come up, uh, just let me know. So, Ms. Shirley Tribble, you asked, uh, Ms. Tribble? Ms. Tribble. Tribble, you wanted to talk about North High School's plans. This is not about the incident, is it? it's about the plans. Good to see you, Ms. Tribble. Let's pull the mic down. You have two minutes. I always go behind somebody talk. Yes, okay, thank you, board. Um, I want to thank you for the 50 million that was given to North. However, based on your community evaluation of repairs and upgrades for North, it was estimated to take about what, 157 million mm -hmm. to bring North up to the, um, re, you know, to their standards. Um, I know that now with the 50 million they'll have to come up with different plans than they had before. And um, I wanted to know, is there any way that the community groups can be involved with those plans? Um, because I'm concerned, like looking at the plans that were done before, I'm concerned that some of the issues that were brought out, like the rats and roaches in the class science classrooms, that they won't be any classrooms because those classrooms have got to be repaired. The bathrooms have got to be repaired. And I understand just looking at the four options that we had earlier, it wasn't even going to, it didn't mention those areas. And so with the little money that has been added to that, are they going to be able to get those things done? And my biggest concern is that I want the community, the East Side uh, community and LULAC, I want us to be involved with that. Sure. I think the principal of North should be involved with that because she's going to be getting the backlash because I'm sure all her teachers are there like saying, we need this done, we need this done because nothing has been done to that school since I started there in 1965. So something needs to really be done. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trevor. We'll... Thank you. It's always good to see you. Mr. San Martin, will you be sure to touch base with Ms. Trevor and make sure she's on and, and her input. I think LULAC is involved at this time, aren't they, in the planning? And I do agree with Ms. Trevor. I did talk to our principal, and there were some items she wanted, such as to look at the stage and uh, the lighting and the soundboard that weren't addressed. So. I don't think we, we, I think the board didn't pick one of the Chinese menu that were, were, were just different things to be picked from it. So, uh, appreciate that. All right. Uh, measure O, Mr. Rich Davis, he'll be followed by Gail Matthews, Benefits of High School, uh, Neighborhood Schools. Mr. Mr. Davis, followed by Miss Matthews, followed by Christy. Mr. Davis. When I spoke at the last board meeting, I was very critical of the board's presentation on the updated Measure O. With my two minutes remarks already scripted and timed, I had only seconds to respond to the oral presentation given. I want to publicly apologize to Assistant Superintendent Sergio Sam Martin for my remarks that appear to be critical of him as the presenter. My many interactions with Mrs. Sam Martin has always been very positive and professional. The fact is my critical remarks in the presentation were directed to this board. Days before a board meeting, you receive a packet of information for the upcoming board, including presentations. For you to allow the presentation to move forward that lacked full disclosure, measure of funding and spending was a complete disservice to the Riverside taxpayer. <clears throat> President Hunt said I would be getting this information, but as of tonight, I have not heard from the district. Again, I stress this information needs to be disseminated to all taxpayers in Riverside in a very thorough presentation. Undoubtedly, you'd be seeking support for another bond measure in the very near future. As our educational leaders, I give you credit for the pa since the passage of Measure O, you have truly enlightened and educated the public to pay closer attention to bond language, to make sure the board is following Prop 39, 
to review the required project list, to watch closely how schools are ranked so the needed schools are addressed first instead of political maneuvering and favoritism, and to demand a truly independent oversight committee to oversee taxpayers' money. I commend the board for taking action in increasing Norris measure allocation, something though that should have been addressed from the very beginning. I and a host of others am very dismayed that like the political and radical, I'm sorry, racial drama that unfolded with North and Measure B years ago, history had to repeat itself under Measure O with political backlash to get the attention of this board. With the North community now unified, East Side, North Side organization and its leaders, I'm sure we will be addressing other Thank, thank you, Rich, and appreciate your, your service on that. Ms. Matthews, followed by Christy. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews, you're speaking to benefits of neighborhood schools. Thank you, ma'am. The benefits of neighborhood schools. Schools build communities. In other words, common unity. They serve as anchors in a community and allow the community to prosper and flourish. The benefits are, number one, strong schools attract families and businesses, boosting the local economy and driving population. Number two, Families build more and better relationships with other families in the community, building neighborhood cohesion and trust. Number three, when students attend a school near their home, families can more easily connect with their teachers and contribute to the school as volunteers and leaders. They connect with each other. They build a co cohesive structure. Number four, more and more schools, and especially high schools, are functioning like community centers, offering opportunities that build health and well-being to all of its residents. They come, they flourish, they see their school as, as being the hub of their community. Neighborhood public schools have the potentials to be the center of their community. They can be the driving force of a prosperous community. We need to pay attention to our schools in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matthews. I always appreciate it. Christy, um, and Christy, hi. OK, it, that, we'll just hold it right here. We charge an extra five cents, but we order right there. Uh, then that is, Miss Florio, you don't have what you wanted to speak about, but I'm going to call Beth Florio. You don't have to put it down, but I'm, what's that? And yes, thank you. Followed by Diana, Diane Quasman. I understand. Miss Florio? That, that's okay, Miss. I, I just didn't want to put you with other, so just turn your that. that okay, just me, me, that's all. So I was doing some research on what the board is supposed to be doing for us parents and for our children, and I came across California Legislative Information Education Code, Title II, Division IV, Part 28, Chapter 1.5, Article 1, 51100. The legislature finds and declares all of the following. It is an essential to our democratic form of government that parents and guardians of school-aged children attend public schools and other citizens participate, improving public education institutions, specifically involving parents and guardians of pupils in the education process is fundamental to a healthy system of public education. Research has shown conclusively that early and sustained family involvement at home and at school in the education of children results both in approved pupil achievement and in schools that are successful at educating all children while enabling them to achieve high levels of performance. All participants in education process benefit when schools generally welcome, encourage, and guide families into establishing equal partnerships with schools to support pupil learning. Family and school collaborative efforts are most effective when they involve parents and guardians in a variety of roles at all grade levels from preschool through high school. Why do you not govern as California legislator states you should? You don't work with us, you work against us. Thank you, Ms. Gloria. Ms. Crossman. Ms. Crossman on the STEM School, followed by Stacy R. Ms. 
Klaus, maybe just pick that up a little bit and you'll be fine. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Hill, Board of, Su Board of Trustees. I'm the parent of a high school senior at Riverside STEM Academy. I'm also the PTSA president, and I'm honored to. Ms. Quasman, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, go ahead. How much Measure time? O Oversight Committee. At STEM, we have we have a deferred. Um, situation with our high school at UCR. So I'm directing attention to our existing campus and I'm hoping that you'll consider some improvements. Our high school and middle school students are going to school on an elementary school campus built in 1962, Hyatt Elementary. And as somebody was just explaining about North, very little, if any, improvements have been made. We don't have a gym. We do not have a cafeteria. We do not have a theater. We have one NPR that we use for everything. And it's being used mostly for band practice with a wonderful band teacher, but we just can't use it. And when it rains, we have no place for the kids to eat or um, do physical education inside. The toilets are on the ground, elementary school style. And I'm talking middle and high school students. We have multiple portables. And the locker rooms are in cramped portables. So I'm just asking you, please, I'm not trying to take away from any other school. I'm not saying that we deserve this more than anybody, but we do deserve some consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Quasman. Appreciate it. Good point. <laughs> and thank you for your service on the Oversight Committee. Ms. Stacy R. Ms. R. Good evening. I'm uh, talking about a letter or an email that actually went out from Laura Bowling, the head of the RCTA, uh, to the teachers this past weekend. Um, I'm going to read it. It has come to my attention there is statewide protest planned for Monday, October 18th in response to the latest vaccine mandates. I've received several questions about the consequences of employees participating in such protests. Our CTA leadership has remained neutral in this debate because we recognize this is a very personal decision and we support all our members. Not really. We also believe that staying focused on the safety protocols and procedures is the most important, so that, it, so that is what we've done. We are also continuing to advocate for the district make, make required... Oh, sorry. We are also continuing to advocate that the district make required testing more convenient and private. I do feel compelled to inform you regarding possible consequences of participation in this protest and the effect it could have on your employment. CTA legal advisors have been consulted in this matter and have let us know that walking out of your classroom or not reporting to work for this event could legally considered abandonment of duties. And she had incorrect grammar there, or punctuation. This could result in disciplinary action from the district. I'd like to know what the district would do. I, this is. This is terrible that this is going out to teachers that they're supposed to be, you know, behind, and they're they're threatening the teachers with this, and that you guys are going to do some kind of action. I think that's deplorable. Um, the teachers are all over the place. You guys know they don't. There's tons of them that don't want to get the jab, and yet they're getting. They want to do a, just a sit out, and they're going to be coerced to go to school. I just think that it's terrible. And, you know, speaking of the teacher at King, um, and she did whatever comment. I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. R, your time is up. But yeah. to, Just say thank you. yes, thank you. Thank you. I put, I put Christy at the back of the. Okay. To, and to, just in a way, don't, the board don't get on me, but to answer Ms. R's question, I should have said that during public comment, because it's not agendized, we aren't really allowed to respond. I don't mean to not respond to you, ma'am, but, but
but we aren't allowed to respond in that way. That's a clarifying question. But so I have uh, now I have Miss Jen T. Followed by. Followed by. Thank you, ma'am. Beth Ann Williams, my favorite email person. <laughs> Miss Jen T. Good evening. I just want to start by saying I think it's very interesting that you start these meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance because I don't believe that you all are standing up for what that pledge is all about, which is standing up for our freedoms and for our justice for all of us, including our children, mainly our children. Um, but I do want to say thank you for moving up the other item. I look forward to hearing your plan on how we're going to handle this mandate, so item N, and that you're not making us wait until 1 o'clock in the morning um, to hear what your plan is or your thoughts regarding the mandate. Um, I do have to say that you know there was a big response to the teacher at North today. You had a you know a nice message for everyone. You all sent some an email out, um, and I understand addressing racial issues immediately is important. But at the last meeting, a racial slur was made, um, calling us daughters of the South, and I think you meant daughters of the Confederacy. No, I didn't. And. Um, Okay, so, well, you didn't explain that very well, and that's what the assumption was by everyone who heard it, and you said it was related to a gender identity comment that was made. So, um, that might, you might want to send an equal level email explaining something like that to the parents as you did for the teacher at North, because that came across as a racial um, slur to us parents who are here week after week um, fighting for our children. So that was really it. I know you're going to cover the uh, mandate and you know how we feel about it. More and more schools are coming out, districts are coming out with their plans to stand up against the mandate to protect our children from a, um, you know, unnecessary and experimental vaccine that's being forced on them. And I will say the grading thing is going to get a lot easier when you lose 30% of your students. Um, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to figure out the equity there um, because you're going to lose, I would say, at least 30. Thank you. I will say specifically, it was not, it was, it was about my, my life as a, as a person in Louisiana. That's what I connected it with. So it's not the Confederacy, which was a horrible group. But, uh, thank you for your comments. And uh, Beth Ann Williams. Followed by Mr. Eric Green, Ms. Williams on parental rights, Mr. Green, after that. Ms. Williams. Good. Good evening. I'm here tonight representing Stand Up Riverside. I'm so proud of Riverside tonight for showing up in large numbers to reject unconstitutional mandates and support body autonomy and right to choose. We have been showing up meeting after meeting to express our rebuke of these harmful mandates. And the amount of people locking arms with us in this fight is growing exponentially. This week, Lucerne Unified School District took a stand against vaccine mandates and wrote a resolution to the state. They unanimously voted in favor of this resolution. This is exactly what we are asking of you to do now, now board. We are asking for you to be true leaders and protectors of our children. For many months now, we have been bringing you data showing that vaccines do not protect a person from infection. We've also provided information showing the massive harm, injury, and death that the vaccines are causing. We will not stand for our children to be subjected to these harms, and we will not allow them to be mandated to be experimental lab rats. This board has not shown leadership in the face of this communistic, of these communistic mandates. It seems crystal clear that you as a board are much more concerned with your jobs and your funding than you are of our children. If you cannot be the leaders Riverside needs, then don't be surprised how many students you'll lose. Everyone I know is talking about leaving public school and homeschooling. To protect our children, we need to take a stand from these harms. I am so proud of Riverside, but I am not proud of you. In the Bible, it says, God, God says, if you are not for me, you are against me. Thank you very much, Mr. Green. Mr. Green, Mr. Green is, it will be followed by Paul Interate, right? Mr. Green. 
Did we did get the young lady that wasn't here? She's at the Okay, all right. And that'll be followed by Christy. Is Christy back? Yes. Okay. Oh, hi, Christy. Uh -huh. Mr. Green? Yeah. All right, so we'll move on to um, Mr. Paul, and I hope I say this right, sir. Interate? Mr. Interate? Is, are they, do we have people in the other room? Do we know? Okay, so we'll, Mr. Green or Mr. Interate? Let's take Christy and then I'll give them time to come in. Oh, there's a delay. Th thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to take Christy then. Good evening, board. Good evening. Each uh, time we come in front of you, I know we, we feel a little bit like... Um, we need to educate, I at least feel that, because if you understand what, why we need to protect our children, I think you'll be more motivated to help us protect the children. Why does the inventor of mRNA technology say, do not vaccinate the children? Robert Malone invented mRNA technology that is currently in these shots. He is shocked that mRNA is being used as so-called vaccines. He said, this is not the best use for this technology. These types of vaccines are too leaky. Leaky vaccines spread infection. As of now, the efficacy of these vaccines is down under 20%. These shots do not protect anyone from getting or transmitting COVID. CDC Director Rochelle Walensky stated that kids have an extremely low rate of getting COVID-19, almost non-existent. So why would we mandate a vaccine that is causing so much harm to children when COVID did not even harm them? Why would we parents, educators, doctors, legislatures, why would we allow this harm to our children? We, 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 don't, we don't want to see these mandates go into effect. We want to push back. We want you to push back. We know you're in leadership for such a time as this. Many are complicit in what's happening. You always have wonderful insights. Thank you. Mr. Green is here now. I see it. Paul, Paul Interate? Thank you. Yeah, sorry. And followed by Eric Green. Mr. Interate on Freeman. Good to see you, sir. Turn, turn that on, sir. There you go, sir. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, so uh, this is in regards to freedom and the freedom that uh, parents have to raise their children in the way that they see fit. And so, uh, you know, the things that are coming down from the top, as far as the government, uh, a lot of times they're not right. And so, you know, we need to be able to stand up and do what is right for our own kids and grandkids and not be stopped by the government. Now, uh, I know that a lot of times, like the critical race theory, for instance, uh, and a lot of this uh, masking for, vac for COVID and so forth, uh, a lot of that is, well, we can't really do anything about it. It's because the state's telling us to do this or the, the federal government's telling us to do this. But you know what? The power is in the local government. And this is where we're at. This is where uh, the difference is to be made. And like some people have already said, you know, if you have to stand up against some of the things that are not right and is against the freedoms that that we share as United as Americans, then we have to be able to have the guts to do that. So these mandates that they're talking about with the vaccines, I'm expecting you guys to stand up, just like many of us are. Stand up against it and, uh, and follow the science. And so anyway, I just want to say that. Thank you so much for allowing me the time to speak today. Thank you, sir, for coming down tonight. <laughs> Mr. Eric Green. Eric, it's been too long. Yeah, he didn't 
This, this gentleman has a ministry where he goes to Africa and digs whales. For, yeah. for, for, it, by the way, it was a 50% chance that I would die on my first trip over to Sudan. Well, it was I'm glad in the you didn't. I'm glad you're here Civil tonight. War, so. and I've been 14 times. So. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I just wanted to encourage all you guys. Eric, turn your mic back. Turn your, just hit the little button there. Hit, hit your button, yeah. Thank you, Frank. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to encourage you guys to obviously stand up, stand strong. Um, we are in the last days, as um, it is very, very clear, all this crazy stuff that's going on. And, um, and there's a verse in the Bible in Job 14.5 that says, You have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live, and we are not given a minute longer. We have a, God has a calendar up there, and literally each one of us is, has our days right there. And it, it's precise when we're going to die. There's nothing that can alter that. We can go out a little bit more messed up maybe, but literally there's nothing that can alter our death time. So these little kids running around here, there's, I think there was like 4,000 that have died from COVID. And, um, and all of them had a lot of more comorbidities and stuff. You know, you know all that. Anyway, so stand strong. It says the cowardly will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that actually verse spoke to me going to Africa. And I was like, you know what? I got to do this. God has called me to go to Africa. And, and a lot of great stuff came out of it. But so stand strong. Um, Esther literally would have please. faced. Sir, sir, please. Now, sir. What's that? Sir, at, I brought that up. The gentleman volunteers his time and his own treasure to, to go to Africa yeah, and dig wells. Whatever. Now, but that's all right. Okay, sorry. Um, anyway, but um, uh, lost my train of thought. Anyway, stand strong. Esther obviously risked losing her life to stand against, you know, her husband basically. But he was the, you know, the king. And um, but she did it because she knew that her people. And Riverside's been essentially an island. We were the only ones that voted the recall. Big, you know, big county. To recall Gavin Newsom, and um, so I, I, I'm, I'm praying for you guys. I'm hoping that you guys stand strong, and we get away from all this uh, this tyranny that's being pushed on us right now. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. All right. So these are. Okay. So how many? Pardon me, just a moment, folks. This is on the diversity, equity, and inclusion, Ms. Sandy R. And followed by Ms. Patricia E. Followed by Ms. Patricia E. Riverside Unified School District values equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and does not condone behavior against these values. This came from your statement regarding the viral incident at North. However, this statement is blatantly false with regards to RUSD. These are condoned. Diversity is strived for in a weighted STEM lottery. This was voted on last meeting and the presentation was changed from the committee meeting presentation. A slide was removed that clearly showed that students with language barriers, social economically disadvantaged and less educated parents were given additional lottery tickets. The district knows they can't legally give tickets for race or sex or they will be sued because for Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Equal Educational Opportunity Act of 1974, which are still the law of the land. This was the best the district could do to increase Hispanic enrollment, but they didn't want you to see it. Equity by definition is fairness, and it's an admirable goal to attain. The lottery now gives all five high schools an equal number of slots for STEM. This is equality, not equity. Fairness would be to give them slots based on their population, the way it was before, when King and Polly had more slots, even if it doesn't give you the desired ethnicity that you seek. The STEM lottery is opening the district up to liability because of discrimination. Now inclusion. Inclusion basically means making sure everyone has a seat at the table, or should I say dais. This board is not inclusive and your redistricting plan tonight is designed to ensure that it stays that way. You have an opportunity to create a second minority majority district and based on what I heard at the committee meeting, this isn't the goal. The most growth happened in the minority area and Yet, the, yet there's not one Hispanic name on the dais to represent us. 
Mr. Lee, I heard your June meeting where you spoke of doing more with your privilege. I don't think you understand that true privilege is having the opportunity to create. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Uh, Ms. R. Ms. Patricia E. You're, you're finished, ma'am. Followed by Aram Ira. Aram Ira. Good Thank evening. You. My first time speaking, but not first time attending or watching and listening. I'm a parent of two RUSD students who are probably mortified right now that I'm speaking, plus one that I pulled this year in sixth grade and put in private school. What compelled me to speak tonight, besides not being comfortable speaking in public and exposing my Brooklyn, New York accent? Well, the undermining and rude treatment of my friend receives each time she reaches this podium, and sometimes even before she does, as the comment, oh, here we go, was caught in a hot mic moment by President Hunt. He consistently interrupts her and admonishes her when her time is up. She knows her stuff, yet time after time she is questioned before she speaks if she will in fact be speaking about the agenda item in discussion. This treatment is not done to anyone else but Ms. R. She was even asked if she was vaccinated before speaking and told where to look while addressing the board at the last meeting. You may ask, why do I care? I care because Ms. R represents so many of us who are uncomfortable speaking and addressing this board in fear of retaliation. Every time, Mr. Hunt, that you steal seconds from her, you are stealing from us as well. You may not like what she has to say, but she has a right to say it in two short minutes without distraction and interruption. With all due respect, it needs to stop. Thank you, Ms. R, for inspiring me. Thank you, ma'am. I am Ira, and I would, I would do injustice if, if I said followed by, because this wonderful Native American name, Masate, Masate to, well, I'm going to let her say Masate. Hi, Ira. How are you, sir? Please speak. Good evening, Mr. Hunt, members of the board. I'm here tonight to speak on the appalling video of North High School teacher Candace Reed that has been circulating. At a time like this, I believe it's important. I, yes, ma'am, thank you. I'm going to put the two up. Mr. Irma, I would ask you just out of consideration that we don't say the lady's name. But I'm sorry? Just like, yes, never mind. Yeah. Put two minutes, please. Keep, please put two minutes. Please, never yeah. mind. Go ahead. Thank I'm, you, sir. I'm here tonight to speak on the appalling video of North High School teacher Candace Reed that has been circulating. At a time like this, I believe it is important to center Native American and Indigenous voices, and as such, I will be using the majority of my speaker's time to share a statement from my friend and colleague who couldn't be here tonight, Josh Thunder Little. Josh is a doctoral candidate at UC Riverside in Native American history, and what follows is a direct comment from him. As a member of the Oglala Lakota Nation, a Native American tribe from the state of South Dakota, I find the behavior of Candace Reed egregious. She is an educator and must do better. The harm that she has caused towards the representation of indigenous people continues the racist issues that native people have to face in America's education system. I hope that she will learn from her actions and there will be an appropriate response from the Riverside Unified School District Board to correct the injustice she has done to the students in her class, the student body of John W. North, and all indigenous people in the United States whom she mocked. With my remaining time, I will add only this from my end. This is not the first time an incident like this has happened under your oversight, and I fear it won't be the last. There's an old saying, don't piss down my back and tell me it's raining. You can act shocked that Miss Reed did what she did, but the fact is she has been doing this since 2012 with no re repercussions. So you can issue performative statements about diversity and equity, but this incident will remain as a symptom of a much more serious issue that affects this district. When you underfund and under-resource our local schools, when you continue to neglect inequities that exist within our school system, and when you don't take redistricting seriously enough, you show us where you truly stand, board members. Thank you, sir. Matate? Matate? Thank you. Followed by Daniel Calderon. Welcome, sir. Just quick push the button and uh, go from there. Kuali tutaki, nahani es masat, nahani es tepiloti, ni tokan, chico yo selo, ni naha mexica, ni kawahitali, uh, isha chilanka, taso kamatik miak no chime, uh, siguatiwantlaka, siguantios, siguantias, siguantatas, siguananas. I said good afternoon. 
My name is Masad. I heard my name earlier. Um, that's one of my clans, and I'm here from Orange County on the other side of uh, Turtle Island, Tongwa, and I just was asked to be here, and I just uh, want to say that what that um, young spirit female did to us is unite us, but unite us to speak the truth and bring the silence. And I think it's important that don't just, uh, you know, just what you guys need to do is fire her. She needs to be fired because, like the brother has said earlier, this, is going on, this, this has been going on too long. And when I heard the lady say Hispanics, we're not Hispanics. That's a false label. Hispanics, I think uh, that's the people from Spain, the colonists. They came and raped our women and molested our children with their missions in California. When you say Mexican, Mexica. Mexica is the original people of Mexico City that came from the Hopis, the Tohono Otams, the Yaquis, the Tonguas, the Ahachimen, and the Cahuillas, which are here in Riverside County. It is important that we change the labels as well. This is an opportunity for us to share that knowledge. We just came back from Hopi Indian Reservation, and a lot of their words in Nahuatl are, are, are similar to Nahuatl Aztec. We're under the Yuto Azteca Nahuatl Linguistic Family. And, um, but thank you all for listening to all my white brothers, black brothers, Asian brothers, and yellow brothers. We're all standing at one, and uh, just do what's right. And this is an example, and we're not going to be silent no more. And um, we're also pushing to uh, change the name of the colonist high school and the mascot. So changes are coming. And this lady, there's a reason why creator Yohoyani used her for a reason. But we need to, to fire her. And she, um, she we just got to pray for her too. But she. Thank you, sir. Very, very. Uh, Mr. Daniel Calderon, followed by Amitra. Um, Amitra. Amitra. Amitra, thank you. Mr. Calderon? He will, we'll wait for Mr. Cat. He's, maybe he's over there. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. There you are, Mr. Catron. Followed by Denise Mulpin. Mr. Catron? No. Is it good? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. So uh, the situation with Candace Reed is a clear display of the ongoing racism and lack of cultural sensitivity that exists within RUSD. We as indigenous people and minority people have experienced so much neglect and so many situations like this have been swept under the rug. It's become such a common thing that students don't even flinch because they've normalized these things. Hmm. Your employee, Candace Reed, who is still an employee pending the investigation, which there's no need for, she needs to be fired immediately. There's nothing to investigate. It was a blatant racist act that does not belong in the classrooms. This is a clear indication that RUSD needs to change. I myself am a product of RUSD. Your curriculums meant to dumb up and keep us ignorant only radicalized me and many others. <clears throat> I remember how they swept racist and violent situations under the rug situations involving staff, this needs to end. Candace Reed needs to be fired and RUSD needs to do better at providing adequate teachers and adequate curriculums so that our students receive adequate education. The issue with also this, with school funding for remodeling in community schools ties into this heavily. Children get bused out to schools outside of their communities or go to school in their communities that are run down only to be mocked and attacked by racist teachers. We stand with community asking for more funding for North High School and the community asking for an East Side School. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Amitra, I think. I think I have this right. Amitra? Amitra? Is there a, is that the, is that the translation going on? Is that what it is? No, okay. it's a people out Oh, okay. Amitra? Thank you. Wait, wait. I'm sorry, would you turn your mic on and help me understand how to pronounce it correctly? It's pronounced Amanet Ra. Amanet Ra. Amanet yes. Ra. Thank you, ma'am. So I'm yeah. with the Black Panther Party Southern California chapter. I'm also here with the Brown Berets. I'm also here with the Native American organizations as well. And what we have a problem with is the fact that this teacher, um, Candace Reed, is very disrespectful to the Native American culture. And that is totally unacceptable. So our demands is for her to be completely fired from being a teacher in all school districts. 
to not work at all because we do not need our children to witness or even to be involved or be around anyone who's, who's mocking culture, our culture, because this is our land and it was colonized and it was stolen and so on and so forth. So we can go through all that. But the reality of it is our children do not need to see disrespect like that. Our children need to be educated with math, reading, things like that, not being disrespected at all. So what we're calling for is for her to be completely fired from any school district, not to come back at all because she's very disrespectful. Okay, so I'm going to leave it right there and... I'm going to say it to my people, all power to the people. All power to the people. Because we are the people. We are the people, and these are our children. So we speak for our children. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Denise Malpin. Aliyah. Followed by Aliyah Muhammad. Ms. Malpin? Yes, ma'am, just turn that and pull it up so we can make sure we don't, there you go. My name is Denise Maupin, I'm with the Black Panther Party of Southern California. Um, everyone has already said what this is, and it's blatant racism. And as long as we continue to allow racism in our educational system, we're gonna continue to have meetings like this. This is not just an isolated incident for her, for Mrs. Reed. This is across the nation, and I guarantee you she's probably not the only teacher in this school. The fact that she's been doing the same behavior for the last 10 years is insane, that you guys have continued to allow her to be here. I agree with the brother before me who talked about what is the investigation for? What else do you need to investigate if the, if the video was real? All the evidence has been laid before you. She needs to be fired immediately. And according to everyone else, the other school conditions need to be improved immediately. These kids need to be educated by true educators, not pretendicators. Right? I call for her to be fired immediately. I will continue to support my brothers and sisters. And um, all power to the people. Thank you. Ms. Muhammad, thank you, ma'am. Next is Ms. Muhammad, followed by, oh, oh, Dr. Snell. Thank you. Ms. Muhammad, welcome. Namitsli Palo, Nona Tokalia. Hello, my name is Aliyah, and I am a Riverside community member. I'd like to address the incident at North High School involving the racist teacher. We really need our teachers' lessons plans to be reviewed, especially because Reed was able to get away with teaching in this manner for over 10 years. The lack of indigenous education and ethnic studies to both staff and students continues to fuel the misrepresentation of Native people. Reed's actions have fueled, at minimum, a decade's worth of demeaning and incorrect reductionist attitudes towards indigenous people. Behavior like this continues to harm the mental and emotional well-being of our indigenous youth. Do you not care? Our indigenous youth are already a vulnerable group. Teachers are entrusted to grow and foster our children in a responsible and respectful way. How has she gotten away with this for so long? What is the school district's restorative justice action plan? How will the school district move forward to ensure that all faculty are not just not racist, but anti-racist? How will you guys do that? I am complete. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Dr. Regina patton -Stell. Followed by Sammy Luna, who will be followed by Jesse Ramirez. Good evening. Wait, wait. Madam, just turn your mic on, madam. Thank you. Good evening. I am Dr. Regina patton -Stell, and I serve as the Riverside County NAACP, also one of the founders, um, Anti-Racist Riverside. But tonight, I'm here to talk, not in those roles, but as a grandparent. I have 12 of them. <laughs> I have four kids coming up in our USD. I came tonight really to talk to the child who watched that video in that classroom. I feel like 
I had to come out to say, we, the people, we cannot give up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. And fortunately, I worked years in the school, so I know the processes, I know the dis disciplinary, this lady's got to go, right? But I'm saying to all of us, look how passionate we are. Let's stand together for our kids. They're marrying each other. You notice that. <laughs> Let's stand together. Thank you for allowing me to speak. We are united as parents. We know you have a tough job. Get it done. But we need to unite. I'm done. No, you're always good, Dr. Snow. Thank you so much. Miss Luna. Miss Luna will be followed by Mr. Jesse Ramirez, followed by Didi Yabara. Ms. Luna. Good evening, uh, President Hunt, Superintendent Hill, board. Um, I first want to start off by saying um, uh, you have a hard job, and, and today's been a hard day, and um, I've had a heavy heart as well. Um, I'm the president of the John W. North Alumni Association. I'm a proud Husky, and um, it's been a difficult day for all of us, and I'm sure much less easy on all of you. So just know that I'm, I'm thinking of you today. Um, one thing we know is that North High School, as shown by the legacy of Dr. Horace Jackson, who is one of the first principals to champion cultural diversity and mutual respect on North's campus, as well as Dale Kinnear, who fought to implement the Multicultural Council at North, which I was fortunate enough to be a part of my freshman year and went through it my whole four years, changed my life, which is probably why I'm here. Um, it, the diversity um, has always been North's greatest attribute and treasure. We expect that the campus and school district will ensure that all students feel welcome and can attend classes without fear or disrespect. Um, our number one priority is to ensure North High School continues to provide inspiration, camaraderie, and motivation for all students. This incident is a perfect example of why Assembly Bill 101 Ethnic Studies, was, which was introduced by Assembly Member Jose Medina, not only is good for our students, but also for teachers. This may be something that you may need to take into consideration. Ms. Luna, thank you always for coming. You're always insightful. We appreciate it. Jesse Ramirez, followed by Didi Yabara. Mr. Ramirez. Mr. Ramirez, just turn your little mic. Just hit the button, sir. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to take up too much time. Just really want to reiterate what you guys are hearing from these uh, latest speakers, what you're probably hearing in phone calls and what you're hearing in emails and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I think that the uh, teacher, uh, Candace Reed, should be uh, terminated. I think that um, it's no question about it. I think that there's uh, this uh, kind of phrasing of it being uh, an investigation. It's kind of weird to me because um, it's pretty evident to the folks here that this has been done, and more so it's even published in their yearbook, right? So we have evidence of this. It's, there's, there's a track record of this. Um, all I also want to just add is just, you know, whatever you guys uh, uh, come up with in your response to these community members, um, I just hope it is not um, void of some type of structural and systemic change, uh, meaning that um, there's, no, uh, there's no mention of some type of uh, change within curriculum. There's no type of implementation or try, trying to be proactive about this ethnic studies bill, critical race theory. This is why we need this. All of these things, they're not separated. You know what I mean? We're having... Uh, these, uh, these uh, findings of these native children, uh, these bodies being found, and this is just the legacy that we have as a nation. And I know that those are boarding schools, but this is the legacy that we have in the education of, of native students and uh, trying to uh, assimilate them into our system. Um, so, you know, um, I think that it's just a structural racism, and I, I wouldn't, I would, my recommendation is that Please don't respond to this community without structural and systemic change. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Very good. Ms. Yabara, Bibi Yabara. Followed by? Thank you, Followed by Mel Kumash. Ms. Yabara. Good evening. My name is Didi Monsonata Sibara, and I'm the director of the American Indian Movement, SoCal. Um, for those of you that don't know, the American Indian Movement was founded 53 years ago as a spiritual movement defending the rights of indigenous people. Uh, when this video was released, our chapter was tagged many times over by indigenous natives from around the country and around the world asking us, what are you going to do about this? When we saw the post that was put out about meeting today at noon, we said, yes, we're going to be there. So we came out, we drafted a letter uh, for the principal asking, we didn't ask, we demanded that the teacher be fired. We demanded an apology, not only to the brave student who finally, after this teacher has done this for so many years, was brave enough to report it, to turn that video on, record it, and pass it on. We want an apology for that student. We want an apology for the student's family and for all Native Americans or anyone who was affected by that video. These things go on too many times in Indian country. We've been hurt too many years. You know, these warriors are woke. You hurt these mama bears. These mama bears are out. And we want that apology. We want something done. We heard what your statement said. You're going to look into it. We've heard over and over, we're looking into it. No, we want it looked into. We want it looked into now. We're not going to wait. We asked for an answer within a week. We expect that answer. Something needs to be done. All the evidence is there. Like someone said earlier, what else do you need to look into? We will be waiting for a response because we have hundreds of thousands of people around the world waiting for your answer. Thank you, Mr. Barra. Thank you, Mr. Mo. Thank you for your work around the nation. Mel Kamash? I hope I pronounced that right, sir. And Yolanda Esquivel. Go ahead, sir, you, and help me with that name again. Kamsa, that's like the great uh, right, Kamsa, you're right. Shawnee Chief Kamsa. Yeah. Two, two Kamsa, actually. In, in. Uh, I would like to say, you know, as a Native American indigenous peoples, uh, the natives do get restless once in a while. <laughs> and we do go on the war path, not physically maybe anymore, but politically, uh, socially, you know, to cover these uh, negative events that are going on. Now, uh, uh, this incident uh, the other day, I say, I don't know about in these high schools that have any Native Studies curriculum, but if they need to, this teacher should have taken a course in that, educate the educator. You know, you have different resources around town. You have Sherman Indian High School down here, which they could ask the students or the teachers to come and educate them, have, bring dancers to really know what reality about the Native American is, the cultures. Um, you know, uh, this is, uh, these incidents are still going on all over, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, we only fight, we can only fight this way, you know, that we don't fight with bullets and arrows anymore. Some might, uh, but, uh, you know, as, uh, member of my Coyote Band of Pomo Indians in Northern California as an elder uh, council. And I do represent a little illegal tribal law when they ask me to. But uh, we have events up there too that are going on. Not exactly like this, but it still happens. There's going to be a little bit of prejudice, racism. That's going to go on, you know. But we have to fight it in a sensible way. And, you know, I say to my people, that uh, we never give up, or we won't give up. We're still here since day one. Uh, Go ahead. No, I'm there, I'm there. Ms. Esquivel, Yolanda Esquivel. Thank you. Followed by Lorenzo Roscoe. Lorenzo Roscoe, I'm sorry. Ms. Esquivel. Always good to see you. Turn to just hit your button there, ma'am. Good evening, our USD board members and staff. 
My name is Yolanda Esquivel, LULAC of Riverside board member. I am here today to express great concern over the, be the horrible and inappropriate behavior of the North High math teacher. We don't know the entire context of her statements and actions, but nevertheless, what we saw was completely unacceptable behavior. And since we now know that the state is implementing ethnic studies, we would like to recommend that these ethnic studies be required not only for the students, but also for every teacher and every administrator, every administrator, and especially most of the members of this board. We hope there will be no consequences for the student who filmed her outrageous behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Esquivel, always. Thank you. Lorenzo Orozco? Or Lorzen Orozco, I'm sorry. And followed by Junior Vilquis? And Vanessa Marquez after that. Do we have? Lorzen Orozco. Yeah, you do better than I. Mr. Orozco, thank you. Just pick the mic up a little bit. You're tall. There you go. Hi. I'm not planning to be nice today or be your friend either. So, our culture is not your costume to wear and to make fun of us and to mock us. First, you guys came to steal our land, murder us, force your religion towards my people, and now mocking us. We are tired of this. Since 1492, I'll say it again. Since the year 1492, we've been facing racism and genocide. Now, if this brave young indigenous student, what if this student never recorded? What? It will be, again, ignored for the next upcoming 10 years again? I'm not surprised. And also, for you, Mr. Tom, I believe when one of my comrades was speaking, you were on your phone. I was. I was sending a message. Numerous times. I'm now, that speaks a lot from you, from your white privilege. Mm. Okay? Because us, as young indigenous youth, we will not be quiet. We will continue to fight for the next upcoming seven generations. And best believe, each one of you guys, we are looking. <laughs> Trust me. When we, when we say we have an army, we have an army of indigenous warriors. Okay? We have the American Indian Movement. We have a lot of, of young, radical, indigenous organizations. You just keep that in mind. And hey, I'm talking to you. And all power to the people. Thank you, Rusko. Appreciate it. Junior Vickis. He's absent? OK. Then we have Vanessa Marquez. Followed by Metzli. Okay, hi, Ms. Marquez. Okay, okay. My name is Vanessa Marquez. I'm a member of the American Indian Movement. I am disappointed at what I saw. I came up here because I wanted to remind you guys of something that just happened a few months ago. We just uncovered some graves of children who attended schools locally. We are explaining this to our children in the community. And while we're explaining this, our children are still processing this. And we're still uncovering more children's graves. We are not a joke. For her to do this while children are still processing that this is happening and trying to prove that they're still alive. And, and also, something happened while we were in the middle of, of protesting at the school today. Students were getting bullied by other students, saying students that there are no natives. Hmm. So obviously some children believe that there are no natives alive. We are here. We still have, we, we just celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day last week and the week before. This teacher should have known, should have known better. She should have known to, to find some information on us, attend an event. She should know. It's all over the news. It's everywhere. I just want to remind you that. Thank Power you for to your the people. Words. Thank you very much. Met 
Metzley. 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 Okay, we'll wait for Metzley. America Najara. Nahara. Nahara. I'm sorry. <laughs> Got to get America. Hello, my name is America. My name is America. I am here as a resident and as a mother of two daughters that have just graduated from the Banning Unified School District. I'm here to talk about Candace Reed and her entitlement and the protection that she had in order to feel that she was able to act in the way she did in class without any repercussions because she's been doing it for 10 years. I mean, she has no fear. And that's the problem, that there is nothing that keeps teachers from doing these type of things and thinking it's okay and they will get away with it because a whole system, a whole system supports them. I know you guys were talking about the Pythagorean theorem. It came out earlier about an example of how we educate children. Well, that was the exact lesson she was teaching at the moment she used us to, to ridicule us to teach this. We talk about e e equity for students and academic success. When our, when our students don't have access to math camps and all of the resources, the way that they are taught is to be made fun of their identity. I was there today since 12 o'clock, and I got to hear that this isn't the first time that it's happened. This isn't the only teacher that does this. This is not just a one-day type of problem. It's not a problem that you're facing now because someone took the courage to post it up online, and now you have to deal with this here. This has happened for decades. I would also like to acknowledge the original peoples of these lands because apparently we do not exist. The Cahuillas, the Gravilleños, the Serranos, the Luceños, the Chehueve, and the Mojave that come all through Riverside County. So please educate yourselves and educate your teachers and make sure that racism comes out of the classrooms. We're done with it. Thank you, ma'am. Very good. Michelle? Followed by Evan. Ichel? I may be pronouncing it wrong. I X C H E L? All right, we'll wait. Evan? Okay. Laura Martin? Followed by. I can't really read that. Miss Martin, are you here? A D E E Y. I have a. It's my eyes, not your handwriting. A D E Y K? Is that correct? This one I know, Jason Hunter. Hey, Jason Hunter, I'm a business owner, a resident here in Riverside. I was, I was home uh, watching um, that 2006 movie, Idiocracy. Uh, actually, no, I was watching the school board meeting <laughs> online. Uh, and, and, and it, but, but it did bring back sort of uh, memories of that movie and, and how we wanted basically do away with uh, or change our grading system to lower the bar as opposed to encourage uh, higher achievement through a little bit of competition. Now competition can cut both ways. There can be friendly competition, there can be damaging competition, I understand that. And I'm not to say that the grading system we have currently is perfect. I don't believe that either, right? But I heard almost an acceptance to go from what we have now to a completely different uh, way of grading. Uh, it was already almost a fait accompli. Uh, that's what it sounded like to me. And I think that's, uh, I don't think this, you've, you've convinced the parents here to buy into that. I think you better slow that process down. You better slow that roll. I think you're going to have problems. So uh, that's number one. Number two is I saw that video and uh, I agree that uh, I would, you know, I, I would tell people don't start drinking at breakfast. Okay. And so, but you no, know, it's more serious than that. And, and there should be serious ramifications and consequences for that kind of behavior. The, uh, and this isn't 1970 or 1980 when I grew up, right? Uh, but at the same time, I think to myself, well, this board did approve a structurally racist um, lottery process, which actually discriminates against Native Americans for the Riverside STEM Academy. It discriminates against everybody but uh, recent immigrants, uh, Hispanics. And so, Where's the accountability for that? Why aren't we pulling somebody out who designed that lottery, which can get this district easily sued? I'll find you a lawyer. Anybody whose kid didn't get into STEM who's non Hispanic, I'll find you a lawyer. It's a class action to sue the district. 
Thank you, Jason. Hunter. I want to make sure we have this. Uh, Mary Valdenar. Valdenar, thank you. Ms. Valdenar. And we'll, and we'll call the other ones that we missed. Ms. Valdenar, welcome. Just, uh, hit, hit the little button there, Ms. Baldwin. It turns red. There, there you go. go. Hi, you. my name is Mary uh, Valdemar. I am a resident here in Riverside and also a longtime community advocate, educator, organizer here in the inland region, San Bernardino, on occupied Yahavi Atam Serrano land. Um, this meeting, instead of starting with the pledge, should have started with a land acknowledgement. I've been working in education for over 20 years. I work at San Bernardino Valley College. At there, we used to have an Indian's mascot. And when I was a student 20 years ago, we changed that. We changed that because the youth and the community demanded cultural competency and that there is no education, there is no justice, there is no social justice, there is no healing, there is no amends making without acknowledging this is stolen land. I'm upset because as I walked up here, I asked for a public comment card and was told no. And then a white person walked up, the one who spoke just before me, and was told yes. And I had to go back and demand my rightful time to speak on this mic. We're tired of demanding what is rightfully ours, to be acknowledged, to be recognized, to stop the erasure and invisibility and misinformation of educators that is touted as history. You need to correct this and make amends today. And that's not about this individual teacher. That's about a system that has failed to tell the truth in the name of education. Do better. Thank you, ma'am. OK, we're going to go back and just see if these folks, we, they might have been next door or whatever. First is Miss Laura Martin. Miss Martin? All right. Uh, Adley? Have that right? Miss Martin? Or Adley, all right. Well, very good. Thank you, Ms. Adley. Um, no, wait, wait, would you turn your, just hit your button. That, that was just, just. I, I understand, ma'am. That's I, why I, I want you here now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Asley Rivero. I'm actually here. On, I'm going to recognize the land that we're on is Coahuila. We're occupying their land. And this building is probably standing were somewhere sacred or beautiful that our peoples was stolen. <sighs> Unfortunately, you guys hired this woman, right? So no matter where it goes, you guys are at fault. And I'm talking about Candace Reed, if you haven't already figured it out. I'm an indigenous woman. I come from Mexica, Puerepecha. I'm also mistaken. I will not leave my culture behind as you guys have forced us to leave it behind. You guys don't even teach the genocide, but you can teach trigonometry with Sakatoa? Are you kidding me? Do better. This is, I'm not the only student that learned like that. I know it. It was so disrespectful to learn that. Now that, that goes way beyond you guys, and you know it. With that, I don't know what the hell you're looking at, but it's not me. But, I, I need you guys to understand that your divided attention is critical to the next step. What you guys do affects everyone in this room and all these children that have yet to even be born because we're still talking about building the east side an elementary school for 40, 40 years, come on. That's ridiculous. None of our students can get a proper education because you won't give it to them. It's a colonial system, and we have to use it, and we still get backlash because of it. We get the end of everything. You're right about that mix about the STEM program. Good, because there's a lot of students out here that need to see it. And if you want... Thank you, ma'am. 
Thank you, young lady. Appreciate it. Evan? Evan? Okay. Etchel. Etchel? I X C H E L? All right. Metsy? M E Z T I L I. All right. We had Lorraine. We had Jesse. Oh, hi. Sorry. Thank you. Can we can we lower the, the just one second, young lady? Nice to have you here. I take it you're Metsy. Candid Reed, I'm mad at her. She, when I saw that video of her, I just felt like I was just gonna, gonna explode. And she's been doing this for so long. So, I, I don't know, maybe it's just a video that came the other day, yes, but someone could have reported long ago that she was doing this for so long. She's racist and it, that just makes me so mad. Me and my people, we don't have our rights still. We've been fighting for it. I always feel so sad. I don't like how you, people are treating us. They treat us bad, they bully us. And nothing has to happen for so long. Me in my mind, I just say, it's we've been treated so badly for so, so long. You can change things. You have the power to change it, and we still you still haven't changed us to get rights as other people can have it. People have bigger privileges, and my native people and me don't have it. It just makes me so sad. I just want me and my people to have rights. We've, we've been pro protesting, going to meetings, talking out loud, and nothing has happened. And I want, and we should all have masks in here too. <laughs> Wait, wait, Mets. What, 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 what did she say at the end? We should all have masks. <laughs> that just one and call it. Not sure. Please? All right. Thank you, young lady. That was very. That, that's the future. That's the future. Jason Martinez. Mr. Martinez. Honestly, I don't know how to start. I'm pissed, I'm upset, I'm dumbfounded, but I'm not surprised. I'm bitter and a lot of us are. We're angry, full of rage, that's oh so justified, fueled by generations and generations of trauma that have continued to surge through our veins. This isn't some metaphorical ideal of, you know, of, of, of just history passing by us. This is like legit science. Things that, are, that, that scientists, genealogies are starting to understand in, as we more and more study DNA. It's also institutional. It continues on and has festered into what it is today. Years ago, in the Norte Vista High School, there was an issue around mascots because as, as we know, and that, uh, the, the mascot is the Braves. And to see other, you know, brown, indigenous, Chicano, black and, you know, people that were like so supportive of it, I was just like dumbfounded, but 
I understand, you know, that's just part of the, our cultural history that we dealt with both as indigenous people in north of this border and south of that border. So I'm only here to just, you know, to convey the rage that we hold on and to for folks to actually sit down and listen. Because while people are screaming and shouting, others are dying. Whether through mental health issues, whether it's issues in the community or what we struggle in the streets every day as indigenous people. Thank you, Mr. Antinous, very well. Okay. Thank you, that concludes uh, item G. Before we go to the uh, N1, we'll, t we'll just take about a 10 minute break, if you will. Thank you.
Mr. Hunt, Mr. Hunt, can we get the meeting started, please?
So now we're going to go to item N1, which is the, the COVID update. And I'll start with, uh, pardon me, I'll start with uh, Mr. Walker, who will talk to us about the updates on that. And also, Mr. Walker, I want to affirm, if you would, with the, the governor has, have they issued the mandate for vaccines yet? Are they still working on it? Go ahead. President Hunt, uh, Superintendent Hill, members of the board. This evening, we'll give you an update on COVID-19 health and safety. And um, to answer your question, there is, was a release by the governor that there would be a requirement for vaccinations for um, those who were eligible and in school age, um, that it would go into effect by July 1st of uh, 2022 or sooner if FDA approved. Uh, more information would be provided by the governor. In addition, at that time of the release, there were um, the ability to receive uh, waivers in the form of medical, religious, and personal choice. So we are monitoring. Uh, no new information has come out from the governor. There should be some new information on health and safety protocols by November 1st. That was uh, something that the governor and the California Department of Public Health had stated that they would provide, uh, but we have not received that uh, to date. So with that, we'll go back to the presentation. Thank you, sir. Maybe not. Uh, next slide. So uh, first to report is the employee vaccination requirement. An order was issued on August the 11th of 2021 by the California Department of Public Health. It requires all certificated and classified staff, walk-on coaches, substitutes, tutors, and volunteers who are on site at a school campus supporting school functions to either be fully vaccinated or be tested weekly. The effective date was October the 15th. As I shared last time I was before you, we were doing a trial run the week before. Uh, next slide, please. The weekly uh, testing uh, for our classifications and the percentage of required to test uh, were for certificated, including managers, 13% needed to be tested. For classified, including managers, 28% needed, needed to be tested. Uh, certificated substitutes, 3%. Classified substitutes, 34%. Walk-on coaches, 35%. Um, the total overall uh, was 19% of the total population of employed individuals. This was updated on 10 15 21. Next slide, please. We have testing sites uh, throughout the district open from 3.30 to 7 p.m. there before you. Um, if you look down on the far right bottom, uh, we also have maintenance and operations and transportation, which is open Monday and Tuesday only from 1 to 4. This is to accommodate some of the split shifts that are uh, for some of our classified staff to ensure that they have the ability to go um, during their own time to get uh, the test taken care of. Next slide, please. Vaccination clinics coming up that are being offered October 23rd, 11 to 7 at Frank Augustus Miller Middle School and November the 13th, 11 to 7 at Frank Augustus Miller Middle School. Uh, these are being provided to um, parents and um, community members who may choose to uh, get access the vaccines and otherwise would not be able to get somewhere to get them. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the COVID-19 data as of the 21st is that California is at 10.8 confirmed cases per 100,000 with Riverside County at 11.0. So we've really closed that gap. If you recall, at one point we were twice the state average. The positivity rate is 2.1% for California and we are at 4.3. We still are about twice as many uh, positive cases. This again updated on the 21st. Next slide. And we continue to have the health and safety precautions, layers of mitigation for our safety, including face coverings at school, physical distancing, maximizing as much as possible um, on campus, healthy hygiene practices, including sanitization, washing hands often, covering coughs, 
cleaning and disinfection, uh, current infecting uh, occurring during the day and then in the evening and any uh, place with a positive case, um, those would be cleaned uh, the evening with a special crew. And then we have maximized our ventilation for both airflow and the maximum filtration that's available. MERV 13s for the systems that can accommodate them. And if the, we don't have MERV 13s, then we also have air scrubbers in those facilities. Health screenings and contact tracing continues to be done um, by the tracing nurses and um, out of the health and safety uh, office that is at the Central Registration Center on Arlington Avenue. We're in constant contact with the Riverside County Department of Public Health, California Department of Public Health, and the California Department of Occupational Safety and Health, um, giving, giving guidance to the district. Uh, next slide. And with that, um, I'm completing my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Walker. We appreciate it. We have several speakers. You'll have two minutes, and we have about uh, 26 altogether. So first is uh, one of our teachers, Ms. Laura Lester. Ms. Lester. Followed by? Thank you. Followed by Nicole Junke. Followed by Nicole Junke. I hope I said that right. Ms. Lester. Good evening. I stood before the board two weeks ago outlining the concerns of myself and my colleagues with regards to, excuse me, my colleagues with regard to testing privacy, testing outside of contractual hours, and our fears surrounding the impending mandates and the lack of exemptions. I have since tested at one of our district sites. The testing site consisted of two folding tables, a handful of chairs, and an easy up. There was no privacy as I stood single file in line amongst my colleagues, my students, and their parents to await my turn to spit into a vial for all to view. On one occasion, I was forced to return to my site to test at 5.15 in the evening, despite my having a 3.30 appointment, as the testing site had yet to be set up by 3.40 and I was forced to leave as I had a prior engagement at 4. I should not have to test for all to see, nor should I have to do so so late in the evening when I should be home with my family. I suppose my greatest concern is the lack of communication or rather lack of compassion exhibited by our district. Instead of erring on the side of caution in favor of its employees, as surrounding districts have done with regard to testing in privacy and during contractual hours, our USD has opted to select the most stringent of standards regardless of the overseeing agency. When we as employees have asked questions of our district administrators, we have almost exclusively received curt, flippant, and derogatory responses. Rather than being spoken to, we have been spoken at. Rather than being given the opportunity to open dialogue, we have received an onslaught of communication that we perceive as both threatening and dehumanizing. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? The lack of compassion we have experienced as if we are second-class citizens rather than colleagues and friends has been disheartening. I believe there is room for open dialogue. I believe there is room for compromise where allowed it. I believe the district has an opportunity and an op- Thank you, Ms. Lester. Uh, Superintendent Hill, I just wanna, I know that, uh, I don't know if it was ready yet, but Dr. Farouk last, asked in her last meeting a study of what other districts are doing so we can, would that be, okay, good, thank you. Not the jump ahead. Nicole Jonke? Sorry, Nicole, I'm sorry. Followed by? Followed by Beth Ann Williams. Hi, my name is Nicole. I have been teaching for the past 20 years, and this is my fourth year with RUSD. I grew up in Riverside and attended Woodcrest, Gage, and graduated from Arlington. I then went to CBU. My whole life, I have lived in Riverside, and I love it here, and I am so grateful that I get to work for the district that I graduated from and give back to my community. With that said, I am in fear of losing my job. And this has been the most stressful season to teach, as I absolutely love what I do, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I spoke here two weeks ago and want to reiterate that I am not an activist or fond of public speaking, but feel compelled to stand before you and let you know that while I do not want to do this, I will not stop, and I believe we can work together and do better for our staff and students. While I'm grateful that RUSD has not taken a stand like LA or San Diego, I am discouraged, deflated, and just exhausted of the daily stress that I endure because there has been no assurance that I, an RUSD employee, will have a job. 
and to accommodate my medical choices and to give me a sense of security in my 20 year long career. I also recognize that a, as a, at a board meeting is not the place to solve this and do not want to talk at you but with you and help you relieve all the undue stress that is adding to our staff, students, and families. I was part of the task force that led the transition from online school back to the person in school last spring and would gladly be part of a task force that is devoted to fight for our students and staff freedoms of choice and help make us all feel valued and keep Riverside an extraordinary, extraordinary school district of choice, unity, and equality for all. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you are heard. Ms. Beth Ann Williams, followed by Rachel Sewell. Ms. Williams? Beth Ann? All right, we'll put that aside. Uh, Ms. Rachel Sewell? I'm sorry, Miss? Sure, sure, sure. Good evening. My name is Rachel Sewell, and I have four children that will go through this di district. For my husband and I and my teenage boys who are old enough to make an informed decision themselves, this is not about anti-vax and we are not an anti-vax family. This is not about left or right. This is about our right to choose. It is about our medical freedom. This is about protecting the Constitution of the United States, which you all took an oath to do so when you swore in, stating that you would protect that very Constitution. Have you all forgotten about that? President Hunt, I read your bio on the RUSD website, and I would like to remind you of a little snippet that you said. You stated that one of your priorities is student choice and parent and community involvement and collaboration. Well, we are here, your students, your parents, your community, we're all, all here and we're involved and we want to be heard. We want a choice and you have the ability to stand up for our children your students, our students, to represent us and to give us that choice. If you follow the governor's orders and demand that all students be vaccinated against COVID-19, what will happen if a child is vaccine injured? What happens if a child dies from this vaccine? What will happen if a perfectly healthy and strong 16-year-old, like these two standing before you, get myocarditis, which they are, more, they are four to six times more likely to get if they get this vaccine? Will you take responsibility? Will you take liability? Will you bear the pain that we as parents will bear? No, you will not. You won't take that responsibility. So as parents, as the person who is 100% responsible for my children financially, emotionally, medically, do not take this choice away from us. Do not take this choice away from our children. We need you to start standing up for our kids and stop using your position on this board as a ladder for your political gain. Thank you, Ms. Sewell. Thank you, young man. Nathan Clore. Heather, is it Nap? Nap. Nap, sorry. Nathan, yes, sir. Just pull it up there, sir. There you go. Thank you. Hello. Thanks, Thanks for letting me be here tonight. Mm. My name is Nathan Clore. I'm actually a doctor. I'm an ER doctor here locally. Um, I have worked this whole pandemic. Um, I have admitted one pediatric patient to the hospital for COVID-19. Pediatrics is 18 years and less. Um, mo majority of my ER colleagues would say they've had the similar experience. I would say a pediatric ICU doctor, a pediatric infectious disease doctor may have a different experience as they get cases filtered to them from the region. But overall, that's, that's the experience. <clears throat> um, I know tragedies happen. I know that they're rare, but they do happen. I'm an ER doctor. I've seen tragedies. That's not lost on me. I have seen it. Um, but overall, it has become apparent that this is a very low risk thing for kids. The mortality is several zeros to the right of the decimal point. Um, it's very low risk. And there is no doubt about that. I would say it's so low risk that even a normal vaccine that has gone through FDA approval and years of research, uh, that's a hypothetical I know that we can't have right now, but even that would be debatable. Um, this is a vaccine that was designed to help prevent people from getting sick and in the hospital and dying. It's a therapeutic. It was not designed to prevent people from getting sick. That, that's from the beginning. They said that from the beginning. This narrative that it's to prevent people from getting sick and not passing along is just not true. And that's playing out evidently in our ERs and everywhere. So the narrative of actually 
Vaccinating kids for this to protect the greater is just not what is scientific. So I implore you to be thinking about that and, and giving parents the option because they realize that these kids are taking all the risk and there's really no benefit to the kids. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clara. It's very informative and, and enlightening for us. We appreciate it. Heather Knapp, followed by Matt Bushman, followed by Ms. Riaz. Ms. Knapp, yeah, turn on your mic, Ms. Knapp. Oh, okay. Good evening, Tom Hunt and Board of Education. I am a registered nurse in Riverside County and a mother of four small children. I have been a nurse for 11 years and I can tell you with assurance that I have never seen anything like what we have witnessed since the pandemic started. Two weeks to slow the spread has turned into a new way of living as the government continues to push unscientific mandates, not laws on our citizens, and now our most vulnerable are children. To date, there have been approximately 630 pediatric deaths with COVID, according to the CDC. Let me highlight the word with COVID, not from COVID. Most of these kids have unfortunately had underlying health conditions like the majority of people that die of COVID. The amount of COVID deaths in the population is comparable to the flu, and we do not mandate the flu shot on children. COVID vaccine mandates to attend school are unscientific, considering the research on the fact that the death rate is zero to 0.03%. Mandating this vaccine is an egregious act on our children, and you do not have immunity from any injuries that happen to these kids if you mandate this. I have been working with a team of nurses and lawyers, and I am hereby putting you on notice that you personally and in your representative capacity, as well as the school, all involved administrators and faculty will be held responsible for any foreseeable, preventable, senseless energies on our kids injuries. If any child suffers from these inhumane, unjust policies, you will all be held liable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Knapp. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Knapp. Matt Bushman, followed by Leanna Ruiz. Louise. Mr. Bushman. There you go. Thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on the issue of medical mandates. Um, I'll start off my comments by reading from the homepage of the RUSD School Board website, your website, the following mission statement. Citizen oversight of local government is the cornerstone of democracy of the United States. School board members are locally elected public officials entrusted with governing the community's public schools. The role of the school board is to ensure that school districts are responsive to the values, beliefs, and priorities of their community. I want to encourage you in this mission statement, the only reason you're here, to ensure that our schools are responsive to the values and beliefs of this community. Everyone is here to tell you their values and their beliefs and their priorities, and it's your job to listen and to be responsive. Unfortunately, RUSD was not successful last year with respect to remote learning as our only option. RUSD surveyed the parents at the beginning of the pandemic who overwhelmingly supported in-person learning and rejected the failed practice of distance learning. It was one of the, I was one of the few parents who was allowed to participate last summer in the workshops um, and to work towards the reopening of schools only to watch that effort get thrown away. Instead of being able to deliver on the values of the priorities of the community, RUSD um, did not provide that choice. I hope that history won't repeat itself in this case. I hope that this board fights for these values, these beliefs, and these priorities. Please advocate on behalf of the students and the parents that, um, that are here to represent them. I know it's hard, and this is an uphill battle for each of you, but as um, you move forward, please advocate for, um, to give us a choice, not a mandate, uh, to advocate for us in your interactions with the state, in your interactions with the county, in your interactions with other school districts, and hopefully your collaboration with other school districts. Um, please advocate for us. Do the job outlined for you on your website, listen to your community, be responsive to our values, be responsive to our beliefs, and be responsive to our priorities. Advocate for our children. Thank you. Well said, Mr. Bushman. Well said, Mr. Bushman. That's the, that is the thing we need to do is advocate. Leanna, Lene Ruiz, Ruiz, excuse me, Renee. 
Good evening, I would like to begin by quoting one of Mr. Hunt's Instagram posts from October of 2020. He states, and I quote, every parent, teacher, and community member deserves to be heard and have their ideas, concerns, and aspirations respected. I believe this is my principal duty as your representative on your school board. The statement then leads me to ask the question why the board keeps putting the vaccine mandate at the end of each board meeting, when you know that is why most of the parents are here today. You all know based on the walkout on Monday that parents are very serious about this topic. So if you indeed meant what you said, Mr. Hunt, then you and the board meeting board need to refocus your priorities. Please stop making statements that you do not mean, or better yet, start caring about the concerns of the parents of the population that you chose to serve and work for. I am speaking to you tonight as both a concerned mother and as an 11-year veteran nurse who has been practicing in some of the most critically ill communities. Vaccine mandates do not provide for informed consent. Children whose parents would have opted out of a COVID vaccine would be forced to vaccinate their children against their will. I hope that each and every person present here today would understand how dangerous that is. The COVID death rate for children, according to the CDC, is 0% to 0.3%. The number of children who have died in the U.S. with COVID is around 630. They have reported 516 cases of pericarditis in children who have received the vaccine. Those numbers are the only ones that have actually been reported. Are you as the board going to be responsible for the serious side effects of the children whose parents would not have chosen to vac vaccinate their children otherwise? Please explain to us how based on those numbers that it is imperative to our children's health, they be mandatorily vaccinated. I would like to conclude by making the other parents and those online watching here tonight aware of some of the statements made by Mr. Mon Mr. Hunt in recent board meetings. After advocating for their children's health, some parents were called Daughters of the South and Mothers of the Coven. If you are not aware of what Daughters of the South refers to, I would encourage you to Google it. It is a racist and extremely misogynistic statement. Mr. Hunt never intended for anyone to hear. I know the board is aware he said it because they told him to be quiet right after he uttered those words. Please explain to me. Thank you, Ms. Brewer. <laughs> Natalie Brower. Followed by Samantha Sarosa. Ms. Brower. Good evening, Superintendent and Board Members. In regards to the recent COVID-19 mandate, the District has a choice and duty to respond and respect the constitutional rights of all people, including parents, students, and RUSD teachers and staff. As a teacher for the past 10 years for the District, I consider it an honor to serve the students and community of RUSD. I love what I do, but I live in fear that I will lose it all if I do not take the COVID-19 shot. I am hesitant due to my religious beliefs and medical concerns. I live with an autoimmune disease as well as suffer chronic pain with headaches and migraines. My faith in God has sustained me and I credit my progress to God, which is why being forced to take the COVID-19 shot will go against my religious beliefs. It was mentioned at the last board meeting that teachers are not at risk for losing their jobs. That is not true. I'm at risk right now for losing my job due to the weekly testing. I would like to trust the district and trust what I hear when board members have stated that religious and medical exemptions would not be off the table for students and teachers. However, I have not felt protected up to this point. Teachers are compelled to speak because we do not have support of our union. The union has not attempted to support unvaccinated employees. In communication with the union, I was quickly dismissed and told that submitting to weekly testing is no different than grading papers at home or completing TB tests that occur once every three years through a phone questionnaire. I do not feel that they are truly seeking for all, speaking for all employees when our concerns have not been heard until we have recently spoken out. All communication from the union to gather concerns have focused on the concerns of only vaccinated employees. So even though I am hesitant to speak, I have to speak for myself and for fellow teachers that are fearful of losing their jobs. If we are being threatened weekly in writing with losing our jobs for not submitting our test results, then I fear the district will not protect my constitutional rights with possible vaccine mandate. My job is in jeopardy, so I plead with the district to consider you do have a choice as to how you handle this matter and support all RUSD by respecting our medical privacy, religious, and personal beliefs. I ask that you please hear our concerns and work to meet with us so that we can find common ground and keep... Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you very much. Samantha Sobrazo. Samantha? Okay, well, we'll put that aside to try to shout outside. We can't hear you. Oh, Samantha I'm sorry. Samantha Sobrarso. We'll hold it. There is a delay out there, so perhaps. We'll, we'll go then to Mo S. M O E, last name S. Oh. Miss S. Is it? Okay. Um, hello, Superintendent Hill and the board. 
I'm here on behalf of my eight-year-old son. Sorry, I knew this was gonna happen. I'm a teacher and a mom, and I will not stand for this. I will pull my son. I'm risking being fired because this is important. You have uh, this, this major opportunity to fight for your community, and you have said out loud, we're just doing what, we wit, what is coming down from the CDPH, but you have the opportunity. Lucerne Valley, they said no, we will fight this. Capistrano, they have come out, we will sue. Districts are suing the state of California and you have that opportunity. You are one of the biggest districts in California. You have the opportunity and you, you guys, these people come here every, every two weeks. We are here. We were here until almost one o'clock in the morning last, last time because we feel so strongly, even though you put it as the last item, we feel strongly for being here. LAU, or, yeah, LAUSD, 12,000 students out on Monday. That sounds like a small number. Those parents will pull those students. That's $216 million annually they will lose. In two schools in RUSD, 1,000 students. Two schools. How many do we have in RUSD? Do the math. We are ready. We are looking into credentialed teachers teaching homeschool. This is what we're doing because we don't have confidence because you have said out loud that you, we're just doing what the CDPH is telling us what to do. And it's coming. The mandates are coming. They are meeting with the FDA on the 26th to make... Brian DeMint, followed by Joshua Clark. Brian DeMint, followed by Joshua Clark. Mr. Demet. Thank you. The state of California showed us uh, in past years that they will quickly remove vaccine exemptions. So we need to be prepared to stand up this. Uh, SB 276, 277, those exemptions were taken away. Um, I'm happy to have a, a nuanced conversation about uh, how to navigate the, this worldwide crisis that we're going on right now. I had a, my grandfather died with COVID. Um, I had a family member that had two strokes after getting the shot. I know both sides of this. Um, we can't have a one size fits all solution. We need to have a nuanced decision, uh, nuanced discussion. And if we're talking about mandates, that is that has nothing to do with nuance. That tramples on nuance. What what mandates do is they shove an unproven and one-sided fit down the throats of the unwilling and the vulnerable. We cannot do that. Let me read for you guys section 1.0 of the Nuremberg Code. It says the voluntary consent of the human being. The human subject is absolutely essential. I'm going to read that one more time. The voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be situated as to be able to exercise the free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form, form of constraint or coercion. I would say a mandate is certainly coercion, and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. We teach the atrocities of World War II in our schools in this district, and this body sits here on the eve of talking about enforcing mandates, and those, those exemptions, those aren't, those aren't gonna be tools that we're gonna have at our disposal, and so we need you to stand up. By voting in favor of mandates and pushing this, uh, this agenda forward, you're telling this district that you're willing to act in direct violation of section 1.0 of the Nuremberg Code. If you choose to proceed, I hope you're okay with that and lawsuits will be filed accordingly. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Joshua Clark, Joshua Clark, Mr. Clark. Yeah, my name is Joshua Clark. I rise today as a spokesman for the Riverside County Libertarian Party's 13,000 registered voters. I'm here to deliver a two-part declaration. First, the Riverside County Libertarian Party condemns RUSD Board President Tom Hunt's grotesque invocation of the Civil War Confederacy at the last board meeting after forcing a group of constituents to wait until midnight to offer public comment on the RUSD's medical mandate cowardice. Board President Hunt then treated those constituents 
with insulting contempt. Such, such misogyny is unbecoming any man, and especially one who claims to be a public servant and brags about his leadership. We say shame on Tom Hunt. We declare in one voice that Tom Hunt owes the parents and particularly the mothers of the RSU, RUSD an unqualified apology. Second the, second, the Riverside County Libertarian Party opposes and denounces ma medical mandates. We note this week's passing of Art Littleworth, the man responsible for integrating the schools of the RUSD, and salute his work. We then say shame on this board for their compl complicity in resegregating the RUSD schools, not based on people's races this time, but on their beliefs. People can make good faith decisions for themselves about their health, including vaccines. Segregating students and teachers based on their medical decisions is disgusting. Each and every one of us has the absolute right to decide what goes on in our individual bodies. Bodily autonomy is the most fundamental right. If it is lost, all other rights are up for grabs. We call on the RAUSD to respect and protect the most precious possession of the teachers on the payroll and the students in their care, their freedom. In the words of Dr. Thomas Sowell, the most basic question is not what is best, but who should decide what is best, and that should be left to individuals and families. We invite those who wish to know more about us to check us out at rclp.us. That's rclp.us. Stand with us against all forms of tyranny. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mary Beth Loyal, Miss Mary Beth Loyal, followed by Jason Asnoff. There you go. Thank you for your dedication to our students. This past year and a half has impacted us all, but perhaps the institution most impacted was public education. Across the nation, guidelines changed, schools opened, then shut down, but here in Riverside, largely due to our county health orders and state tier system, we were consistent. Though restrictions kept our students home for much of the year, your plans were carefully laid out for the students' safe return. As a parent of two RUSD students, I was delighted to see my children return to campus last year. First as hybrid, then a five-day schedule, which met the safety requirements as mandated by the state. Last December, I began to watch Board of Education meetings of our surrounding districts. Some had no plans to return for the year, while others voted to return in person to appease the crowd, only to report a week later they were unable to keep their word due to the state's restrictions in place. This is where RUSD shined. While upholding the orders in place, you made plans for all scenarios and were ready to execute those plans when the state and county gave us the green light. Was it perfect? No. But it was a big improvement for where we came from since March of 2020. Through this time, RUSD's outreach and communication efforts were extraordinary and continue to be. Thank you for prioritizing both our community needs, procedural safeguards, and clear guidelines during an unsettling time. That brings us to where we are now, and again, an imperfect set of safeguards for this unprecedented time. Safeguards that are such a source of contention, you are kept here till shocking hours of the night while listening to concerned citizens cross the line with public comments that turn to personal attacks. It's enraging for me to listen to from the comfort of my home, so I can only imagine how you must feel. I commend you for your composure and great service to our community. In the words of our past superintendent, Dr. David Hansen, we are all leaders and we all make a difference in the seat we sit in. Our USD leaders, please don't grow weary now. You are our great difference makers. Our 40,000 students and families depend on your leadership. I appreciate the extensive time and sound decision our district leaders have made to both uphold the order set by the state and give our families a sense of normalcy. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Loyal, appreciate it. Jason Asnoff. Lisa Rimp, it will be followed by Lisa Rimp. Lisa Rimp. Good evening, uh, members of the board and President Asnoff. Tom Hunt. My name is Jason Asnoff. Um, I want to open with a verse from the Bible, Galatians 6, 9. And let us not weary of doing good, for in due season we'll reap if we do not give up. We need to fight. We need to fight this tyrannical mandate. It's absolutely absurd. We need to uphold our constitutional freedoms. Um, while I understand the school board does not make laws pertaining to state health, I still want to state on record that there will be a drastic reduction of revenue if these mandates are put in place. Yes. In addition, um, I'm very concerned because of the vaccine mandates that would want to be placed on our children. We do not know the long-term effects. Who knows, it might make them sterile or who knows what other side effects that may cause. The vaccines have not been thoroughly tested. They were rushed through and many teens and young adults are already experiencing awful side effects, including up to death. 
The governor is not the parent of my children. Therefore, he has no right to mandate a vaccine that is not deemed safe. Parents that choose not to have their children vaccinated against COVID uh, is going to create extreme discrimination, meaning per Newsom's order, he says you can go to independent studies. We all saw what happened with independent studies, extreme learning loss. So if you wanna continue along that path that I thought the Civil Rights Act took care of in terms of ensuring freedom for all, do not listen to the governor. We have to stand up. We need to create a framework of all the school districts as a team and fight against the governor. This is absolutely absurd and we cannot. Thank you, Mr. Avenoff. Very well. Ms. Rimp. Ms. Rimp, followed by Sandy R. And Elizabeth Quigney. Ms. Rimp. Okay. Uh, parents who have been advocating for choice are frustrated um, regarding all of these educational mandates and governor overreach and the lack of pushback on them. This evening I would like to ask questions that I feel are necessarily necessary for you to carefully consider these mandates that continue to be pushed down on us. Do you believe the risk of COVID and the shots are one size fits all? What is the logic behind mandating these shots for kids when they're in an extremely low risk age group? Why is this being mandated and not legislated? Why is California the only state mandating these for K through 12 schools? Why isn't California following the color coded county tiers for the COVID response anymore? Why aren't parents surveyed for their voice? Why are the mandates stemming from the knowingly false PCR testing during the whole pandemic? Why is the incredibly alarming VAERS data being ignored? Why wasn't this shot pulled after 50 reported VAERS deaths, which is the CDC norm? Why is OSHA not requiring employers to report vaccine injuries? Why does the CDC count deaths as unvaccinated until two weeks post final COVID shot? If this is really about health, why isn't metabolic health being addressed? Why are masks still mandated indoors if they can't even block the COVID-19 micron transmission? Why did it take until two days ago for the AAP and others to declare a national emergency in adolescent mental health? Why is natural immunity still being ignored? Why are we following three letter agencies and politicians instead of our healthcare and frontline workers that would have plenty of information to give you? Is it for funding? Or Thank you, Ms. Rampett. All good questions, very much. Ms. Sandy R. followed by Ms. Elizabeth Quigney. Ms. R. So several districts have gone on record as opposing the governor's vaccine mandate. I have at least 12 that I will gladly email you. Please. Our USD has not um, gone on record as stating how um, they will decide on this mandate. So I would like to use some of my time because we've told you how we feel. You represent us and we want to know how you feel about this mandate. Do you support it or do you oppose it? Because we're electing you to represent us and we don't know how you feel about it. You might be supportive of it and we're opposed to it and yet we have to vote for you. So we'd like to know. So I'd like to poll the board, Ms. Well, Alvey. Ma'am, ma you cannot do that. It, Why not? It's, a, it's an it's agendized, in the Brown Act, Ms. R. It's an agendized item that you should respond no, to. You have we, no problem we, we, interrupting me. We can only me. ask you a clarifying question. Please read the Brown Act. I don't, you, people think I'm getting on you, but you try to go outside the lines. Okay. Save her minutes, put her minutes back so she can do it. But we cannot. You have some good questions, but we okay. can't Well, do when, it. when your board comments come up, we'd like to hear it. Good. Because we don't want to hear your pamphlets that we get in the mail that say how you feel about our students. We want to know how you feel about this. Because this is our line in the sand. This is our deciding factor whether our kids stay in your district. And if you're not going to advocate for us, I mean, we all heard last meeting, um, I was expecting to see a resolution from Mr. Walker when I saw the agenda um, saying that you were going to send a resolution to the governor with the video clips. I don't see that. I wasn't on the agenda. I looked I'll, I'll for that attachment. That. 
So um, that's what, kind of what we want to know. We're, we're done with telling you how we feel. I think we've made it pretty clear. You, we had our walkout. We've had kids leave. Um, we've shown up at these meetings in force. We've given you the blowback you wanted. Now we want to know how you feel. Are you going to support us? If you do agree with us or you don't. We're done telling you how we feel. We want to know, do you have our back? If not, other districts have gone to recalls. Other districts have gone to finding candidates to run against you. Two of you are up this you know, election, Mr. Lee and Ms. Alibi, and I know that we will definitely find candidates that believe in parental rights. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. R. Ms. Elizabeth Quigney, and followed by Mr. Grant Peters. Ms. Ms. Quig is it Quigney? Thank you, ma'am. Um, i just like to thank you for your time. Um, I did email all of you uh, last week. Uh, after the last meeting, I heard back from Dr. Farouk, thank you. Dr. Mr. Hunt, thank you. And uh, Mr. Barra, thank you. I heard back from you as well. Um, I am here as an employee of Riverside Unified School District for over 15 years. I'm a classified employee. I work really hard. Um, I work with special needs children, and they have my heart. I love my job. I don't want to lose my job. You have the power to make sure that I stay in my job. So I'm here to explain to you what it's like to get tested at an RUSD site. It's dehumanizing. It's demoralizing. It's sad. Privacy is a huge issue. I have a right to my own medical privacy. You're not my doctors. The governor is not my doctor. That's my business. It's my right. When you go to an RUSD site for testing, you go to an outdoor site with an easy up, with a person sitting behind a folding table who asks you your name, your phone number, and some more personal information. All the while, people standing in line behind you waiting for their test or standing off to the side spitting in their tube. It's disgusting. I suggested that you go yourself and get tested, Mr. Hunt. I don't know that you followed through with that. I'll do that. I appreciate that. There's a form you have to fill out in order to get tested with the school district site where you have to agree to um, you have to agree to sign away your constitutional rights. Ms. Queenie, thank you for what you've said, and thank you for your work with our children. And I will have some questions on that. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Grant Peters, followed by Sarah Brockhorse. Mr. Peters. Mr. Hunt. Members of the board, you probably remember me from the last board meeting. My name is Grant Peters. I'm a veteran father and husband to an RUSD award-winning educator. Our founders of this country declared in our Declaration of Independence that our rights are guaranteed by God, not the government. That includes our rights to our own decisions in our medical treatments. You're making decisions on whether to enforce a blatantly unconstitutional mandate. And you're making these decisions with incomplete data. Nursing home numbers, cases, and deaths in the county have zero bearing on what happens here at this school district. So using the total county numbers is disingenuous and should be stopped immediately. Not even your own administrators are reporting confirmed cases and deaths in kids and teachers within this district or the percentage of those that were vaccinated. Those are the numbers that actually matter here. And now it's your turn to play your part in this charade. If teachers don't get the jab, it's up to you to be the governor's hatchet men and women, his stooges. Don't be his stooges. It is not his or your right to make a decision on whether an individual should be vaccinated or not. And the threat of or decision to terminate an employee for standing up for their medical individual liberties is coercion and is illegal under international treaties known as the Nuremberg Code, which has been mentioned already today. If you're unaware, let me assist. At the end of World War II, this was to prevent this exact kind of medical experimentation. Why do I bring it up? Because Nazi Germany did the exact same thing. 
And those responsible from top to bottom were held accountable for their actions and their participation in this program. Now, I can't possibly tell you what the long-term side effects of these vaccines are, but neither can you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Very, very thought-provoking. Sarah Brockhorst, my name is Brockhorst, thank you. Followed by Rudy Kanab. Ms. Brockhorst. Good evening, my name is Sarah Bockhorst. I spoke at the last meeting where we waited over six hours to speak until after midnight. I mentioned previously my family, we've lived in Riverside County for years. We've served the community for over a century. Uh, family members of mine have been elected many times throughout the years, including city council positions, mayor pro tem, and trustee positions. My father and mother, John and Ann Mott, have served over 25 years on the Mount San Jacinto Board um, of Trustees, the college over there. And my mother is one of the few who is currently elected and voting no on all of these mandates. Something interesting that I recently found out from my mother, who's an elected trustee board member, is that according to the California Department of Public Health order to mandate this vaccine for our schools, is that all workers need to be fully vaccinated by October 15th. Does workers include board members? Well, let me read it directly from the California School Board Association. For purposes of this order, workers are defined as all paid and unpaid adults serving in the school setting. This includes bus drivers and other staff, but does not apply to board members. You heard that right. Each and every one of you sitting there in your chairs, pushing this vaccine mandate on us and our kids are completely 100% exempt from this vaccine order. We are only asking for the same in return, to have the option to take this vaccine or not take this vaccine. You cannot legally enforce something that you yourself are not even bound to. So please vote no on every single one of these mandates. I have copies here. Give them to Mr. Dr. Lewis, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mott. Rudy Kanab and then uh, Kim Alori. I hope I said that right, Kim? Edie. Edie, I'm sorry, I didn't, that's like a no, okay. Sorry, Rudy? Krause. Yes, sir, I thought I said Kanab. Good to see you, Mr. Krause. I'm good. Turn, turn your mic on there, Mr. Krause, and we'll start him. Fine. There we go. Rudy Krause. Hi. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, my book, um, Homo sapien vaccinicus, Origin of the Species, about uh, the human COVID virus symbiote. That's symbiotic biotechnology that's being used to create a parallel life form in your body. If you're vaccinated, you're done. All the kids at Cal State Long Beach and Cal State uh, Fullerton, they're all vaccinated, they're done. They're all symbiotes. Now this is what we're looking at. We're looking at the COVID virus parasite. All viruses are parasites. You're always just talking about the COVID virus uh, spike protein. The spike protein is the eggs of the COVID virus parasite. This is produced inside the body of the parasite. This parasite looks like a squid. It has uh, three tentacles or six tentacles. Dr. Zulewski says uh, three tentacles. You know, he's very, very shocked by this. He says it looks like these creatures in the matrix flying in the air. But uh, have you seen the Pandemia Babies in uh, La Quinta, Colombia? Have you seen what vax to vax sex produces? These are uh, babies, they, well, they look fairly human, but they've got big black eyes that look like black marbles with no whites around them. They definitely have Down syndrome. So you're making a bunch of vaccinated retards. I'm sorry, but that's what it is. So uh, the whole generation, look, we're talking about all the kids in the colleges. They're all going to be having 
vax to vax sex, making vax to vax children, making vax to vax retards that we're going to have to deal with for the rest of our lives. But that's not even counting when the Spiegel. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Cobb. Okay, Kim Eby, thank you. Followed by Alex Bonecki. How close am I? Thank you. Ms. Eby, hi. Thank you, Tom. Dear esteemed members of the board, I am here today to express my sincerest concerns for RUSD regarding governor's, the governor's latest vaccine mandates. I have been an RUSD teacher for 16 years. My husband has been an RUSD teacher for 17 years, and all four of our children have attended RUSD schools their entire lives. As soon as the vaccines were available, my husband and I were the first in line. We thought that the receiving the vaccine would protect our children and our parents from an almost imminent exposure once we both return to in-person instruction. Exposure to germs in a first grade classroom is undeniable. As more information has come out regarding not only potential side effects with my husband and I knowing four very close individuals severely affected by the vaccines that has been determined by their doctors, as well as the vaccine's lack of protection from number one, contracting the virus, as evident by the fact that my husband, a vaccinated RUSD teacher, contracted COVID only two weeks after returning to in-person instruction in the fall from his classroom. And number two, the lack of protection against spreading the virus, I have, after much thought, made the decision to not vaccinate my four children. I am not anti-vax. I'm not critical of anyone who decides to vaccinate. I am simply asking for the right to make the decision for my family as a mother who only wants the best for her children, period. I have dedicated my life to this profession and I have chosen RUSD as my home. I believe we have excellent schools and excellent staff in this district. I pride myself on being a public educator. Again, I simply ask for the right to make a decision for my family and what schools I send my children to and that their right to a public education not be hindered by a mandate sent down from a governor that I am fearful will cause detrimental Thank you, Ms. Eby. Is it, I'm gonna mess this up, Alex Bonecki? Am I even close? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, sir, and help me understand your name so I don't mess it up next time. Bohannon. Bohannon. Okay. Thank you, sir. King Newsom has declared war on our children and our teachers. You are just a pawn in his game. His quest for power. You have a very important decision to make. You kneel to him, the dictator, or you stand up for our children and freedom. Standing up for our, ch our children and our freedom sounds like a very easy choice, but most people are driven by fear. Fear of COVID, fear of the media, fear of losing your job, not being able to provide for your family, fear of the wrath of King Newsom. How about the fear of losing your freedom because you did nothing to defend it? King Newsom knows that fear will make lots of people give up their freedom especially if their jobs or their family's well-being is at risk. It's much easier to have people give up their freedom than to try and take it away from those who are willing to die for it. Divide the people, then go after the ones who will defend freedom with their life. In war, you must first identify your enemy. That's what's going on right now. Anyone who stands up for the right to choose for a vaccine, anyone who chooses not to get the vaccine or have their children not get the vaccine, anyone who stands up for freedom or anyone who stands up for the Constitution is the enemy. We have all been identified. My question to the board is which side are you on? I just heard that you won't respond, but how about this? Our children, which one are you gonna stick up for? Are you gonna stick up for our, our children and freedom or are you gonna stick up for the dictator, King Newsom? That's a choice that you have. The remainder of my time would be to let you guys respond to it, but you'll say that you can't. I'm sure that you won't. Maybe you could put it in. Well, I think if you'll, I think if you'll stick around for our comments and, and I'd be glad to address that. Just, I just want you to 
Under the Brown Act, we can only ask a clarifying question. So, so I apologize. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Patri Thank you. We have Patricia E. followed by Christina Z. and Mercedes De Leon. This is the person who's out. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Patricia E. Thank you, ma'am. Followed by Christina. Followed by. She may be outside. Missy. E. Hello, I'm back two times. Uh, I'm a com caring parent, not a domestic terrorist. <laughs> I'm also an RN, 25 years. And last month I resigned from my 13 year position in a Riverside hospital because I believe in medical freedom for all, including myself and my children. It wasn't easy, but teachers, hold the line. Hold true to your convictions. I will pull my two remaining US RUSC students if need be. I did get their transcripts on Parent Teacher Conference Day. At least my children will know that I walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Remember, Newsom wasn't recalled by the state, but Riverside overwhelmingly voted yes. <laughs> Fight this mandate, please. Unmask our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Christina, and then Ms. De Leon, uh, is, is she here? It says outside on the live stream delay. So, Ms. Christina, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, a lot of my comments have already been said this evening, but I think that it's important. I'm also not an anti-vaxxer. Oh, sorry, my time is. Oh, I'm sorry. It, uh, just hold it. Put that up. I apologize. Go ahead. Oh, that's please. okay. Um, I'm also not an anti-vaxxer, but I understand what Governor Newsom is doing. Um, he said that this mandate will be for public and private schools, and you all know that it will not hold for private schools. He has no purview there. They've already won a lot. They won the lawsuit to go back to school uh, when he was trying to keep those doors closed. His kids attend private school, and his daughter is unvaccinated. Isn't it strange? I think the reason why he said this mandate is because if he did just said it was for the public kids, um, you know, the unprivileged, uh, that it would be blowback and there would be, you know, mass pandemonium. So we tried to say, oh yeah, I'm going to mandate it for the private and the public schools, and we know that won't hold. Um, I think the other thing that's important to note, both my children had COVID, um, and I have heart disease on both sides of my family. So my otherwise healthy son, I don't want him to get this. And as I said earlier, if he does get myocarditis and dies, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. You're going to do nothing about it. That's right. So hold the line. And if I have to pull my kids, I will. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Ms. DeLeon? Ms. DeLeon? Oh, okay, there she is. Thank you, Ms. DeLeon. Christina, thank you for your comment. Uh, Pull your mic down. Just tell you. There you go, my friend. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening. Sit down. Good evening. Um, I'm just here in support of our parents that are speaking out against the COVID mandates, which are not law, which is actually unlawful against the Nuremberg Code. Yes, it is redundant, but it is important that you guys hear us as individuals. Um, it is against the Nuremberg Code, and we do have body autonomy. We are bodily sovereign, and we do have the capacity and will to make our own decisions. And I want to secure my rights 100%. And you cannot take this one size fits all approach when it comes to our constituents, um, to our US citizens, and to the American people. It, it is against our will. You do not have consent. And I want this part submitted into the written record. I call it rape. 
okay? A definition of rape is an outrageous violation, and I feel outrageously violated. I was pushed down aggressively by an over 230-pound um, Hispanic dude, um, security guard over at the at the Starbucks on Tyler and Magnolia for not wearing a mask and you know the cops saw it all and you know he caused like damage to my back you know falling on my tailbone and whatnot and what this this has to do with COVID it was over a mask and um, I was viciously attacked for not wearing a mask I've been viciously attacked at stores uh, for not wearing a mask and just to uh, just to think about what our kids have to deal with at schools by choosing to be free and choosing to, you know, and I was upset the last time, you know, I waited over six hours to speak, so I was like, oh my God. And, um, you know, the, the kids have a right to breathe because we need to breathe. I need oxygen. Now, you're, you're using some of his time now, so I got, that's it. But thank you. Thank you very much, miss. Thank you. Ms. De Leon. That's everyone, right? All right. I will now go to my uh, fellow colleagues uh, for comments that they may have on item N1. We just heard. And I'll start with, uh, oh, anyone that calls it. Brent Lee, please. Excuse me. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so I have a few questions. First, th thanks everybody for being here tonight. Uh, especially our teachers, appreciate them being here. I said, thank you, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you everyone for being here tonight, especially our teachers in our district. Uh, I know I've had some conversations with you outside uh, the board, reading, board meeting. I'm gonna appreciate uh, your insight. Um, we've heard, uh, this question is, I'm not sure for who on the staff, but we've heard the repeated um, description of some of these testing, testing facilities and testing sites um, about lack of privacy, Humanization, demoralizing, um, and just we have posted hours that allegedly are not not being adhered to. Um, have we addressed any of these issues? Have these issues been brought to our attention to, to take some action? Are we working with our vendor to, to try to solve some of these problems? Mr. Lee, um, the, the sites are offered as a convenience and they can go, anyone can go anywhere to get their um, test done and bring it to the district. They do not have to utilize the testing sites that are provided by the district. Um, we are making them available to, for the ease of uh, those who would like to utilize it. But they may go to any, any um, facility um, that provides for testing. And um, I'll defer to uh, Ms. Yabera, Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent Yabera, because we're looking into other alternatives for um, providing uh, tests at each school site rather than uh, going to a central clinic. Ms. Bear? Yes, we are working with Eric Jacklin, who oversees our benefits and risk management department to determine which um, options we have. Once those are determined, we'll be able to work with our associations to be able to then See what options and offers we have. Okay, so a couple of follow-up questions on that same item. Are we, for what you just said, Mr. Walker, are, are we letting our employees know that there are other options for them to get tested? Yes, that was put out at the, from the beginning. Okay, and then um, st still a question on this contract that we, I know we're trying to make it accessible for our, for our employees, which I think we should do, um, but if there are some simple items in which we can address some of these privacy concerns, well, I'm assuming they're simple, um, have we discussed that with the provider? And then again, if, if we're posting options for those to get tested and the contractor is not meeting those time frames, are we holding them accountable to that? It seems like we're trying to make it easy for them. If it's not easy for them, then why are we offering it in the first place? We can we can look into the concerns that were brought to uh, the attention of the board this evening. I I don't have an answer for you in regard okay. to that this, tonight. Okay, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Um, and then same thing. I know we heard we heard again. We're, we're hearing from some of the same speakers uh, regarding messaging and compassion for for some of our employees. Have we done anything to address some of the messaging that we're sending out um, to, to our employees regarding these uh, requirements for testing? 
So I can actually answer that, Mr. Walker, if you'd like. The messaging comes out from two different departments. The initial messaging that comes out to remind employees of their testing is a very generic message that is a reminder. As for the messages, if they are have not, those come from our office. If someone does not test, they're actually phone calls. And so uh, it, it dependent upon the message that they're referencing, we can address and reevaluate what those look like, but they're very generic reminders at this point. All right. Um, and then I have a question too. We, we're hearing about teachers that are concerned about uh, their jobs, should they not uh, comply with the mandates once they go once they go into effect? Uh, what what is going to happen, or do we know yet will happen with these with these mandates with their job? The mandate that has not been put in place yet is for potentials for students. The uh, requirement for employees to be tested or be vaccinated is already here. That's what we've been talking about by providing the no, testing I sites. I so I understand that, but there, um, there's obviously a concern from some employees that they'll be uh, let go from their job if they don't comply with the mandates. Because I think I understand that the mandate is not in place yet, and we don't have all the details, and that we're waiting for that. Um, but I know that in this document here that was re released by the governor and the CDPH, it says that the employees will have to comply with the same requirements that the students will have. So, I mean, assuming that there is a student mandate to get uh, vaccinated by July, then I would assume teachers would have to apply with I, I, Again, we're waiting for finalization of information from the state. And as I had shared when I started the presentation, we are supposed to be getting updates on health and safety issues uh, by the 1st of November from the state. Uh, we have not received anything at this point in time. All right. So, so at this point, we don't know. Um, we can't. We can't tell our teachers or our classified if their job is at stake because we don't have the information yet from from the state. That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I, all right. So my other question is: I see our attorneys here too. Maybe he can he can chime in. Um, so what options do boards have if they're opposing mandates? And likewise, what are the potential legal ramifications if we don't uh, impose, if we don't enforce the mandates or follow the guidelines, uh, what kind of consequences would happen uh, to, to the district or to the board? Actually, Mr. Keeler is here this evening. I'm sure he can give you some insight into that, that question. That. So it depends on the mandate and how it is ultimately structured by the state. Based on what we know so far about this student mandate, um, the indication is that there will be a personal belief exemption. So for parents who have a firmly held belief against the vaccination, they will just simply submit an exemption and the student will not have to be vaccinated. Similarly, for religious beliefs, um, or they can provide proof of vaccination. So at this point, those are the three expected um, options under the health and safety code. And that is something that was stated preliminarily by Governor Newsom, that that, that those would be the options. Um, we have yet to see whether this will be done legislatively, whether there will be a, a formal executive order to put it in place, or um, guidelines from CDPH. So we don't know all the details yet, but the indication at this point is that a personal belief exemption will be available for students through their parents. Yeah, I, I see that in this the same, this release here that I'm, I'm, we provided to us last meeting. It says that. So it says there'll be exemptions for medical reasons and personal beliefs. But that's the extent of the information we have at this point? That's right, that's right. We don't have a lot of information at this point. And as to employees, we don't have the full information either. But it's likely that districts will have discretion on, on how they approach employee issues. Um, there, well, don't cheer yet. Um, 
When I say discretion, I mean as to whether the district approaches it as a disciplinary matter where someone will actually lose their job or whether it will be considered an issue where they don't meet conditions of employment. So until they come into compliance, they'll be on unpaid leave, but they will not be disciplined and won't lose their job, as well as other issues. So at this point, it's, it, we don't know. There's more information that will come but there may be some discretion that the district has. Okay, all right. Th thank you, Mr. Keeler. Um, my, my other question is probably for staff, and I don't know if we have the numbers yet, but we, we, we heard about that walkout that happened on Monday. Do we have any preliminary numbers on attendance? Staff? Um, we, we do have numbers from the uh, Monday from our absence, we don't know the reason why anyone would be absent, <laughs> as that information was not provided. But uh, certainly, certainly, students get sick, and there was a planned uh, stay at home. Um, no information was provided. What we do know is from the Monday before, and the absences that would be on a normal Monday, and the Monday for the, um, the issue that was brought forth by members of the uh, public this evening, there was a 7.5% increase in absences on that Monday. All right. All right. Please. please. All right, thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Do you have any? Uh, please. All right, do we have any other? So I will, uh, I don't want to keep you here the entire time, because I know we, uh... you're gonna let me, you gonna let me talk, or what do you want to do? Okay. So, first of all, I want you to know the reason it was on the last last time is we had to have decide on 190 million dollars of your money, taxpayer money, on how we were going to be able to fund both north and the east side and other things that we had we have to do. Uh, I'm not, and so. We needed to make sure we made that right because skyrocketing uh, inflation that we're all seeing about now. So uh, that's part of it. But um, uh, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Arn asked me about the governor's thing, and I did commit, and I do commit. I had uh, some unexpected surgeries this week. I have another one tomorrow, and so I didn't get to it. But the good news about that is when I'm laying there in bed, uh, I'm thinking about your comments, the ones that all of in Believe that or not, but uh, my Mr. Grant is it um, who brought up? But and I so I went in and found out, and I don't I don't disbelieve anyone that says that other districts are doing this. And a mistake with the staff today. I was going to have copies for you, but believe it or not, if you'll email me, I'll send you this. And it was the August 23rd publication from uh, Dr. Uh, Aragon, who is the uh, director of the California Department of Public Health. It was sent to school leaders and their attorneys. And you're not gonna like it, because I don't like it much either. But King Newsom is, I'm not calling him that, but I'm just repeating. But it goes into, first of all, the science and, every, and everything is kosher. We, we've got it, it's good, they're all happy, right? The other thing is they're making sure that we, us, understand that Hold me a minute. Uh, to be clear, he's writing to school boards. Failure to enforce the mask requirement breaches not only a legal duty, but also the first and foremost duty of every school leader to protect students. Now, let's not debate about that, because I agree with that. But it goes on to say, and I'll just summarize for you on it, because he jumps around, but any school district, and I know the guy's in Lucerne, Tom's a friend of mine, but any school district, Local education agency is what we're called. Uh, there's 1,037 of us. And I, and I got on a phone with, and he helped me with this, the general counsel for the California School Board Association. And he, he puts it pretty straight. Any school district that does this, particularly because this is about health, and particularly because they, they believe in this, that COVID is just the worst thing ever. And I'm not debating it either way. But that they will... Um, become liable, first of all, and listen to me out, uh, that the officials, and that includes the board, 
will become personally liable for anything that happens. All right, we lose our, our uh, it's not immunity, but we, lo we lose, Chris, what's the word I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. we, we, we lose our coverage that is as elected officials have. Right. Okay, so that's, that's bad enough for Tom and Jerry Hunt. Wait, let me, come on, come on. That's bad. I'm trying to talk to you and tell you I do listen, and I'm trying to understand what's going on and have you understand it, all right? So I know that uh, not only what would happen, though, and there's precedent for this, is that California Department of Education can come in and put a district in receivership, just like bankruptcy. They usually, a lover, they usually fire the superintendent immediately. They would fire others that were involved. In, we, we say we're not going to enforce. We're not going to do these things. We're not, the heck with the mask, all right? They, because, and Mrs. Alibi and I went to a, a training session with California school boards a couple of years ago, and at lunchtime we sat with these two very nice ladies that were on the Compton school board. And they were taken over because of uh, more of uh, some malfeasance of, of money and everything. And they explained to us, they, because the voters put you in, they don't, they, they don't yank you out because there's a different difference there. But you basically, and you have to listen to this, they basically take over, they have a receiver sitting here, and whatever decision we make, they can, they can overrule it. And that means, one, they put back the mandates ASAP. Two, um, they, can, they can judge on curriculum. Now, let's give you an example. When the, when the state said uh, we have to give five choices, or you can write your own like LA Unified did, on the sex education, right? So this board and our staff, we chose the most conservative of those five. I am a little emotional because it, it's going to go into what happened to our rights as Americans. But um, they could say, you know what? We don't think you should have had the most conservative. We want you to have this one. We're, as you may know, over a year ago, we decided we're not going to wait for the state to come out with their ethnic studies. We're going to do our own because we want it, and it was just signed the other day with the governor, uh, because we want it to reflect the diversity of this great city where we had indigenous people. We have an amazing Asian uh, background here and contributions, and we want it to be that way and all of that. They could, they could, I'm not throwing the boogeyman out of critical race, but Sacramento could say, hey, we, we want you to do this. So we, we lose local control. You may be mad at me about things and made mistakes, and I get that, but we lose all local control. The gentleman who said we need to advocate, and that's, that really is uh, what we have to do. So going back to the governor, I'm going to work on it. There's some great comments tonight uh, for Dr. Perez and Superintendent Hill and I to look at to put them into that tape. I talked to our lobbyist today, who's uh, Kevin Gordon, probably the number one education lobbyist there is. Uh, his partner, Tom Turkelson, was the uh, superintendent of California schools. Good news, he was also the college roommate with the governor's chief of staff. If you've ever been inside a, if you write a letter to a congressman or something, trust me, it's some intern writing back to you. So we're going to be able to get in there and do that. And he likes, he said everything, God bless you, but everything has been negative that has been to the governor. We can all understand that. Our, our advocacy is, much like the mask was, but our advocacy will be Sir, you know, this is what we're hearing at our, our boards, our, our, our board meetings, and it's extremely frustrating. I can't help you. I can't stop the mandate. I don't even vote for the mandate. I don't, there's no vote here on the mandate. It gets mandated. Pardon me? Well, if I, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll debate. You and I will have that, that, that discussion you wanted to have. But my point being is that it is amazing how much control we this is our community, this is our district, don't have. So then I thought, well, I know that the Orange County Office of Education, which is extremely different than a school district, the Riverside County, you know, those things are very, those boards have zip power. They can hear cases of suspension and, and charters, that's it, all right? And to me, what they did is disingenuous because if they have a good lawyer like we do, he'll point to the case, and I went to it, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, 1905, where Massachusetts was, was mandating vaccines 
for, uh, uh, they, in, in Cambridge actually, because they had an outbreak of smallpox. Uh, Reverend Jacobson took them on. The Supreme Court ruled seven to two, let me finish, that no, the, that, the, that the individual rights given to us in the Constitution, and I'll send that to you as well if you email me, um, are, are overridden in times like, like these, and the state's quote unquote police powers take precedence. This is a lot deeper than a lot of y'all thought, all right? So we want to do something. We did with, you know, we're the, we sent a, uh, Dr. Farouk had a, uh, helped us do this. We have a resolution we sent to the, uh, the state and all, and we said, okay, if you're gonna come out with a new mass mandate before or by November 1, as they said, let's make it a sensible one, at least. Don't make it all one size fits all. You remember the tears we used to have? The governor did away with purple, red, and all that. So it, the problem is we don't have a way to go up and just hit him in the mouth. It's about working with them and trying to get them to see. What the letter to the governor, getting back, Tom, is going to say, sir, this is what we're hearing. And it is frustrating for all of us. And, and, you know, and sir, please, you need to explain, as your front man does, that, that school boards don't have the power. You need to explain that you're the one, the buck stops and starts with you. And that it, it now that's, that's a way to advocate. That's a way to begin to get the truth out there. I mean, it's a lot of hiding behind the trees. So it is something we need to do. It is alarming to me when I looked at and listened to some of y'all's comments and went back and went over them. When I saw this court case that has been upheld now for 116 years, recently was used to uphold Texas uh, extreme anti-abortion law. Recently, that was just the other day, recently used on mass COVID fighting, same things that y'all want to do. This particular case and one other, this in uh, 1922, I forgot the name of it now, absolutely strip these constitutional rights we all think we're born with and given to by God. It takes away, it's alarming, and don't kill the messenger, but we've got to find a way, as I've been saying for a long time, we're either going to work together or we're going to fall together, you know? And uh, so we've got to do this strategically, and, but we've got to talk to him, as Riverside often does, directly. And just say, can't hide anymore. Please come out and be up front. And then, you know, still it won't let us do much, but at least we'll have that out and we can understand and put him on the spot. So it's, because I don't believe when you're elected, when you're elected, you can either be popular or you can be a leader and try to get things done, and you're not always uh, liked by that. But there's a lot we need to do. If you want to talk to me afterwards, folks that are yelling out there, it's fine. I'll be around. But uh, that's the last on that. We'll go to the next item. Um, Ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Dr. Farouk, I didn't see you up here. Sorry. Dr. Farouk. Okay, thank you, uh, President Hunt. Uh, so my, my first uh, comment, uh, I just want to express my appreciation to Mr. Walker for providing us that update, and I'm glad that it's, uh, the COVID cases are trending downward in our community, and I hope that we continue to do uh, uh, strive for safety to keep pushing those numbers down. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, my question goes back to what the last board meeting uh, I know uh, Trustee Lee asked a lot of the same questions that I had also, uh, specifically regarding our employees and the testing policy. I understand what's being said that there needs to be, you know, that this is the nature of how we're just making this accessible uh, for our employees to be able to get tested. But the, the, the fundamental thing that I had requested last time, and I still haven't been told anything, uh, is, w what is what are other school districts doing? Because I, I'm hearing that other school districts are being more accommodative uh, for their employees to, for access to testing. I, I, I would like a, a very tangible understanding on what that is and what, in contrast to why we're taking the approaches that we are and what role the board can be doing to help address that. So uh, I don't know if anybody has any thought to share now, but I really hope that that can be provided sh soon. Um, Assistant Superintendent Ibar, I did gather the information and we can get it to you. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and you're not a board member, but I'm gonna throw a little bit in here. Um, 
to the teachers who were saying, you know, about the conversations, I do want you to know I did speak with principals about um, just the school environment and interact things that they do and interaction between our team members because this shouldn't be a thing that divides us between each other. Um, and then I don't know if you, because some talking was going on, you know, I don't know if you caught the tail end of what Mr. Walker said that we are looking into other ways to do the testing. When we looked at it at first, and I think we were a little earlier in the game. The cost was prohibitive, and since then there's some uh, funding that we can get that we found out about. So we're looking into that. We have the information, we'll send it to you. And I did talk to principals, and um, we'll continue to work well, on it. Well, let me just ask this, if, if, if you have the information, what, what are you seeing as staff, knowing that information, because obviously I haven't seen it yet, with what you think or, or how we could improve upon or address these things? What tangible things would you suggest? It varies what other districts are doing. So the, it, those two pieces had to be combined. What other districts are doing, what we're currently doing, what can be refunded and what we're doing with the dollars. Um, so it, it's not a, just a, okay. the chart is straightforward. This district is doing this thing. But how can we can respond to that? We have to put it together with what our benefits are and what our provider is doing right now. My last question relates this, and I appreciate all of your efforts on this. I know there's a, we, we have a lot on our plate, uh, obviously, and I appreciate that. Uh, what do you anticipate the time frame to be able to properly assess this and to be able to propose you know, actions again on how we can be more accommodative? Well, this week was unusual, as you know, um, but I think we should be able to get something done, done in uh, two weeks at the out, farthest out. Right. Thank you. I appreciate all, all of you guys' efforts uh, on, on trying to find a, a positive resolution to this matter. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not um, shy about sharing how I feel about uh, these things so that you can know. Um, my daughter and my husband are both in the medical field, a doctor and a nurse practitioner. They see COVID patients all the time, and I'm a very strong believer in vaccines. And I would, if I had children that age, get my children vaccinated. That being said, I don't want to force anybody to get a vaccine. So therefore, I don't believe in a mandate. I personally wouldn't want to be told by anybody that I had to or had not to have to do something like that. I don't like government telling me that they have to do those things. But I will go back to what Mr. Hunt was trying to tell you <laughs> in his own way, that, that we have a lot of, our hands are tied here as a public school district. We are tied with wire. We cannot undo this unless we could, you go above our heads uh, because it is too, it is too uh, dangerous for us to lose all of our legal standing, our 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 funding, our everything that would make a, a a proper school district. So it needs to be done above us, um, because we're not going to put our public school district in jeopardy, and that's where the problem lies. So I'm sorry that that I cannot stated any better, I, I wish I could. I don't want a mandate either. I don't think it's right. But um, I, we do have some, uh, our hands are somewhat tied. You know, probably the most accurate thing that was said tonight was by our attorney who said, we don't know. I mean, you have to understand, since the very beginning of this, March 2020, literally Mrs. Allaby was our president, and thankfully and she was there every day, and she and Dr. Hansen would, every other day we'd, we'd get said, oh, they did, they just pivoted. They're, they're, cha they're moving all the time. I mean, I, I think it's irresponsible for, for the governor, just me, to put out something that says, uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, mandated vaccines, we'll let you know three months from now. I mean, how, 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 do, how does it, how is a, is a public official elected by you to represent you? I, I don't have any more answers than you do. And it's, it's really disingenuous of what he does. But I won't be disingenuous like my friends at Lucerne, because when you look at their resolution, it's a lot of whereas's. Uh, all these things are whereas. 
there is no therefore let it be resolved that they're going to back out i do want to sandy i'd like to have those names of those districts and i know a lot of folks there dr for it's white right let's find out maybe that's why i spent that time in bed going well let's figure this out why can't we sue them and you when i came across this and please um email me on the district and i'll send you both of these things it was stunning to me as an american that i don't have constitutional rights they're taken by state's police power that ought to freeze us in our boots a little bit so again if we don't work together we're going to fall and he does have he, he just being the i don't care if it's newsome whoever they have us in a stranglehold they, they they say in here that we have the rights to do this and that tim and i were talking we don't have any rights to change anything the only right, in fact, I said, Tim, what, what right do we have to, he says, to adjust it to local levels? He says, well, if it gets worse, you can make everyone wear a mask and wear, wear them outside now. So we don't have any rights to dilute what's going on. And I know, you, well, I forgot the young lady back there. She's wearing the Marine shirt last time. If you don't want to do it, we'll get, we'll get you out and put five others up there. We can try that all night long. None of us would be able to dilute, reject anything that the, that the Department of California Department of Public Health is insisting on us through Governor Newsom because immediately it's over with. Immediately they put us in receivership. And we, you can't come up and yell at anybody anymore. You can't demand anymore. They don't care. All right? So we're, in, we're either going to stand together or they're going to crush us. So it is very unsettling. I feel for you all very much. My girls are out now. They're both vaccinated. But to have a, as Mrs. Alavi said, to have government tell you what to do on something like this, the doctor's point about it wasn't really, you know, germinated right, or you know, the cooking really, really wasn't done, so the guy didn't go to medical school, is, is, is worrisome. So we will take a, a short break, so you all who want to can get home to your children. And we do have some other important items. One of them will be, oh, I'm sorry, Dale. Yeah. I, I think the, the question was a legitimate question. Where do I stand in, in terms of, uh, of what happens if the, if the governor uh, gives a mandate about vaccinations? And I hate to disappoint you, uh, but I can't put this district in, in jeopardy uh, by, by saying I'm going to refuse the governor's mandate. Uh, I won't do that. And if that means that, uh, that, that you know, I'm not your person as a school board member, that, that's what that means. Uh, but I can't put this district in a position that uh, that, that jeopardizes uh, what uh, what we need to do for, uh, for for kids. Do I want a mandate? No, I don't want a mandate. I don't like mandates, just as everybody else said. Uh, but I have to listen to our legal advice, and if our legal advice says, Mr. Kinnear, you're putting the school district in jeopardy, uh, I can't do that. I well, we, we can't have, go ahead and ask, say what you said, sir, and then we'll stop. Go ahead. It, I think that's the thing. They, they, they well, because they, they, well, send this, write me an email, I'll, I'll send you this. And you read it, and don't tear it up halfway through, because you're going to get not like it. But, but uh, one of my favorite magazine covers when it was from the Rolling Stone, uh, when it, it was actually a magazine, and it's a picture of this dog on the cover, and he's got his eyes looking like this, and they got a gun to the dog's head, and it says, buy this magazine, and we shoot the dog. And uh, that's what's happening. We're, they're saying, you're going to do this, or we're going to take it away, and we'll do it. And when you read this, sir? Okay, well, I'm sorry. There. All right, so uh, we'll recess for just a little while, and uh, we'll come back to work on a few other items that are very important. Uh, and we thank you for the, those that have attended. Thank you for your comments. Here we go. Thanks, Brent.
Thank you, everyone, for staying around. We're going to go to the consent calendar. Consent calendar items are considered by the board and most governmental agencies to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There is no discussion on these items prior to the time the board on the motion, unless members of the board request to pull a specific item to remove from the consent calendar. Are, is, do I have any of my colleagues that would like to remove any item from the consent calendar to, to uh, separately discuss? Okay, hearing none, I, may I have a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented by the staff? Move I have a move. motion from do, uh, move Trustee move. Kinnear. Thank you, Dale. Move to approve. And I'll then uh, Mr. Farouk, uh, Dr. Farouk, please. Okay. And maybe. Okay, there it is. Okay, five. It's approved. Okay, so we're going to go now to item uh, study session. And uh, the Board of Education will provide a report on the certificated, uh, certified, excuse me, 2020 census data in the relation to the district's current trustee areas. Uh, we will provide direction to staff on a process and timeline for the next steps. Uh, pursuant to the provisions of Education Code 50195, school districts that elect by trustee areas must review those areas following each decennial uh, census to ensure that the areas remain proportional and population balanced. This must be accomplished prior to March 1, 2022. Due to the pandemic, the census data, will, which normally would have been available in March, I mean April, was delayed until September 2021. Consultants have reviewed the data and prepared an analysis of the new data of the current trustee areas, which must be balanced by total population. Consultants will discuss their analysis and recommend a timeline and process approach for completing, making changes, if any, by the statutory uh, uh, deadline. Our uh, Sergio San Martin is, is our lead on this. He'll introduce our consultants, which were the same consultants that helped us put this together prior. Mr. San Martin. Good evening, President, President Hunt, I have a, Superintendent Hill. I have a, I have a qu procedural question. We skipped the board member comments. Yeah, I, I move, I'm sorry. I, I thought procedurally I'm moving it to the end because we're going to talk about art and all that. And so people can, I don't think they want to hear, we want to say as much as they need to hear this. But I appreciate that, Dr. Bird. And you're right. Thank you, President Hunt. Tonight's presentation is a follow-up from the August 5th board meeting in relation to the district's statutory requirement to review current trustee areas pursuant to Education Code 5019. The Governance and Finance Committee was presented with an update on this, on this presentation on October 5th and recommended to bring forward this presentation to the Board of Trustees. Tonight, and at this time, Mr. David Saldani, who is with Atkinson, Andelson, Loya, and Rudin Romo, our legal counsel, and Mr. Justin Rich with, with Cooperative Strategies will be presenting us with the updated 2020 Census Data Report. Yes. Good evening, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, lost the reason. There we go. Like uh, Sergio mentioned, we're here to give you an update based on the 2020 census data, uh, and we've laid that in, out in our presentation here. Just by way of background, uh, the district transitioned to by area elections in 2012, uh, and shortly thereafter, the, the, the elections and the map were approved by the county committee on school district organization. And for districts that elect their board members by area, following the census every 10 years, uh, there's a couple of things that we have to do. We have to review the population data to uh, ensure that the areas are roughly in balance uh, and, and within the, uh, the allowable variance. Uh, and then if they are not, we need to make any necessary adjustments to bring them back into balance. Uh, it's important to note that the deadline for uh, completing this work is February 28th. Um, February 28th, 2022. And, and I wanted to add that it's important to remember really the purpose behind post-census redistricting and, and not conflate that with redistricting in the first instance. Uh, remember that post-census redistricting contemplates that you've already gone through a very vigorous public process to create areas in the first instance. And you have and you've used those for several election cycles. The purpose behind Education Code 5019.5 is to take what you've already created 
and make sure that it maintains its population balance. And in fact, that section goes on to say that if you do anything more than that, what you're really doing is a rearrangement of trustee areas. And that's a completely different process that has oversight from the county committee. There's an opportunity for a voter petition if they don't like the results of that. It, it's completely different process. And so I, I just want everybody to be clear on that point. And I know it can be somewhat you know, confusing because of the recent law that was enacted called the Fair Maps Act that requires cities and counties to use independent redistricting commissions, which is a, a much more uh, labor-intensive process. So that law doesn't apply to school districts. So all we need to do is make sure that our areas are balanced. And if they're not, we need to make just enough changes to bring that balance back. So just in, in terms of reflecting on the, the results of our assessment, uh, the 2020 data showed a couple of things. And one, it showed that there was overall population growth within the district of about 5%. Uh, it also showed that there were changes in the demographic comp composition, most notably that there was a proportional increase in the Hispanic Latino population. Um, and we have some, some additional slides that will go into further detail on that. On this table, we've prepared uh, just a breakdown of the current trustee areas, uh, and we have a comparison here of the 2010 census data and the 2020 census data. It shows the total population for each of those areas uh, based on those different data points. It also shows the variance, which is the difference uh, between each one of those areas and the ideal or the average size that each one of those areas should be. Uh, we've also included the overall change so that you can see how much uh, each one of these areas grew. Uh, you'll note that in trustee area three, grew the large, grew by the most amount, I should say 10.6%, but every single one of the trustee areas had at least some marginal growth. Uh, I'll also point out that based on 2020 census data, the largest area in terms of population now is trustee area five, um, and the smallest area is trustee area four. On this page, we've included a map that shows the jurisdictions, uh, most notably the city of Riverside, uh, but also a portion of the city of Harupa Valley. Uh, and so this just gives us the overall picture of, of the district's boundaries. We've also included the demographic breakdown, again, based on 2020 census for all of the various protected classes within the district. Uh, and it also breaks out the age 18 and over population. On this slide, we've included uh, what we call a graduated color map. And uh, what we've done in this case, based on citizen voting age population, uh, we've looked at the largest protected class, which is the Hispanic Latino population. Uh, and what the map does is it co colors in each one of the, the census blocks that are represented here. Uh, the darker the color represents the higher the concentration, the lighter the color, the, the lower the concentration. Um, again, th this is based on citizen voting age population. Uh, th this is different than total population and really used for two different measures. By way of orientation, here are the district's current trustee areas. Um, and what, starting down in trustee area one in the southeastern portion of the district and generally working counterclockwise uh, for trustee areas two through five uh, is how these are laid out. Uh, we've also overlaid the high school attendance boundaries, which when, when these boundaries were, when the uh, trustee area boundaries were originally enacted, this was a point of, um, of concern or a, you know, a point of emphasis. We have a couple of tables here, uh, again, doing a comparison of, of two different data points from when you originally uh, move to, to elect by area. Uh, so we have the 2010 census data and the 2020 census data for each of the trustee areas. Um, I will point out a couple of things. First of all, when, when you originally adopted this, this by area election method, the total variance was about 5.7%. That's the variance between the smallest and largest trustee areas. 
Uh, now, based on the 2020 census, that's grown a bit. It's now 9.1%. Uh, and so I'll, perhaps, David, you want to speak to that threshold? Yeah, and, and that's an important number uh, because basically anything 10% and below, there is a legal presumption that that's valid. And, and to the extent that you go north of that number, you need to be able to articulate some factual basis for why the deviation is so large. And so when we look at population balance, that concept, we're really focusing on total population. And so when we did the analysis of your boundaries, again, you went from five to nine, which still puts you within legal tolerable limits. There's a presumption of legality there. And in this table, we've included population, we've included, uh, we've uh, included all the protected classes and, and their proportional share uh, amongst the total population. But that second line um, in, in kind of gray there, the population variance, is what we're focused on. Again, the columns that are in are the darker gray or black color are the ones that represent 2020 data. We've also taken a look at the citizen voting age population of, of the district and broken this out by trustee area. Uh, we used the 2006 through 2010 citizen voting age population, which was what was used at the time the district moved to by area elections. Again, we have all of the various protected classes are, are represented here. Uh, I'll point out a couple of things. First of all, in trustee area three, based on citizen voting age population, we have a majority minority district for the Hispanic Latino group. Uh, we also have a near pluralities in, in trustee area four and five. On this slide, we've, we've included, uh, it's very hard to see, I'm sure. Um, on, we've, we've included a couple of different um, looks at the various schools that are within the district. In that, um, in the text that's on the left, it shows all of the schools that are physically located within each trustee area. Further to the right, it shows all of the school attendance boundaries that are located within those trustee areas. I wanna just point out a couple uh, of, of additions that were made. It's current on the slide here. However, what was posted earlier did not have Arlington High School in trustee area one or trustee area three. And we also added Martin Luther King High School to trustee area four. So just wanted to point those out. And, and just again, by way of, of reminder and review, and for those that weren't around in 2012 when we did this, this was done very intentionally and by design and at the direction of the board and based on community received or feedback from the community, it was really the desire of the board and moving from an at-large methodology to a district-based methodology to really avoid that siloing effect, which is, let's say, you know, you have just one attendance area in your trustee area. You would naturally feel more perhaps beholden to the voters of that area. And so when it comes time to make decisions on things like facilities, there would be maybe be an inclination to uh, kind of push forward that whatever repairs needed to happen at that middle school, for example, even if that weren't necessarily in the best interest of the district as a whole. And so I think this board very wisely uh, said, you know, as a local consideration, we want to make it clear that every area should be comprised of, of multiple attendance boundaries so that we'd be able to spread out that accountability a little more. And so I'll talk a little bit about the considerations that go into voting areas. Um, there's a couple of different ways that we would categorize these. I think uh, this really falls into the things that you must do in order to comply with the law. And then there's other things that you should do uh, that, that are suggested and they're important for keeping communities together uh, and also for, uh, to, to provide for good representation. Uh, so the first two, uh, each area shall contain nearly equal in inhabitants. That's the population balance. This is in line with the constitutional doctrine of one person, one vote. Uh, and then the second here, drawn to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act um, and making sure that we're not uh, dividing communities or impairing their ability to, to elect the candidate of their choice. 
Uh, we should also keep areas as compact and contiguous as possible so they're not oddly shaped. Um, and we should, and, and that's important to note that in, in many districts, that's, that's easier said than done when you have varying topography and geography, population densities, all, all of that sort of thing. But to the extent we can, we should strive for that. Also to respect communities of interest, which are uh, groups that have shared social and economic characteristics. Um, this next one, I think oftentimes, uh, geographic features, both man-made and natural, oftentimes are the boundary lines for those communities of interest. Um, to, to the extent we can respect incumbency, I think that's important. It shouldn't be our foremost consideration, um, but, but it, is a, uh, it, it is a consideration. And then other local considerations like the district has used before, whether those are attendance boundaries or the location of facilities. Okay, so to, to summarize, we have overall growth of 5.1%, still have a majority minority area, trustee area three, and importantly for this exercise, for the post-census redistricting, you're still proportional in terms of total population balance, you're at 9.1%, still presumptively legal. And given that that's the case, um, our recommendation to you would be to consider simply uh, maintaining those areas and adopting a resolution at a, your next meeting um, indicating the desire of the board to utilize that map for the next you know 10 years uh, and, and then you know after the next census if things have moved sufficiently you might have to move some boundary lines but for now there's no real legal mandate for you to make any changes but I, that's the conclusion of our presentation, but we're, of course, happy to answer any questions that you might have. We will. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Farouk, do we have a, a speaker card yes. on this item? Yes, four, uh, four requests. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, Ms. Shirley Tribble. Please, you have two minutes, Ms. Tribble. Followed by Ms. Ms. Matthews, then Mr. Esquivel. minutes like we had before <laughs> you know because you asked and you got to defend me with these other four okay, <laughs> okay. I know you I know you've been around a long time and you want to talk this is this is a very important item yeah much pull oh, the mic down, down a little bit now Ms. Tribble there you go. okay um, my questions about the district changes uh, there's some demographics that need to be looked at um, for instance, I was looking at uh, district uh, with, uh, trustee, the area three, and looking at all the schools in there. Now, North is in area three for both the attendance and the, uh, the physical location trustee. Yes, ma'am. And then it is in area two for the attendance, okay? But then I notice that Polly is in everybody's district, some way or another. They're either under the school attendance or, or something like that. And that concerns me is that when you look at everything that's been done for Polly, well, you got most of the trustees involved in it. And of course, they're going to support the area that they have. So now I see why North didn't have any support. Because if every, all the trustees are in together to update Polly and King, then North got put on the back burner because they have no one to support them to say, no, you know, this is what we need to look at first. Uh, and my other concern, and I heard the other two men here, is that why can't the community be involved in these district changes? Because I grew up in Riverside, and I just, in the last few years, they changed my street 
which was North High School for years, and now they go to Poly. And I was really concerned about that, but I knew because I didn't have any children going, but that's why I wasn't notified. But I was shocked to find out that my school, which had been North from the beginning of North, now goes to Poly. They changed the boundary. So that was my concern. And, and I just wish that the community could be more involved in what changes that are being done here. It's like we need a community to oversight everything. We would like to be involved. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Trevor, can I ask a clarifying question for you? Just, just so I, you, you said that the boundaries for North and Poly have, have switched since, now I've been on this board a while, we haven't changed any boundaries. Well, well it, it hasn't been done in the last 15 years, but let me say, we, we were also open, I, I, we, we were also, uh, you know, they went back and forth, so we, you were elected at large at everybody, but, but uh, Mrs. allaby has been on a few years longer than I have, have you? Uh, you don't, you don't do boundary changes easily, and they go, so. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think no. if, if it has been, it's been over 20 years since that change was made. Yes, ma'am. I, I, Thank you, Mr. Uh, but thank you, and we can we could check that with the county when those those were made. So th thank you very much, Mr. Always good to see you, Ms. Matthews. Followed by Mr. Esquivel. Part two: Keeping the existing 2014 trustee boundaries are unacceptable for the current 2021 Eastside community in the next 10 years. Leaders and members of the community request an opportunity to work with the district demographer to express our ideas and address our concerns with the existing boundaries. A change is needed to ensure all schools have equal voices at the table. While we know that all trustees represent all schools, but for the past 57 years, does, that does not appear to be the case. The East Side community has suffered from past and many current board decisions. This community was not allowed to benefit from the experience or experience the opportunities that a vibrant community life could get from a K neighborhood K-12 articulation. They didn't get that opportunity. It was taken away. Four schools left that community. Because the board decisions and at the expense of the east side community, other communities flourished. The current board boundaries have an inherent bias in the distribution of trustees. Polly has five, Arlington has three, King has three. North and Ramona have two. While existing boundaries may fall within the legal obligation of the board, these boundaries should not fall with, it, with the inherent ethical and moralistic obligation of this board. You know, and it has been documented, systemic neglect leads to systemic inequity. You have an obligation to make things correct, right. Yes, you are legal, and that's good, but you know that there is something wrong. 
You look at the way the boundaries are drawn now, and you can tell that they went all over the place to protect encumbrancy. But you know that there's still something wrong. You know your voices haven't been where they should be for all schools and all people. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the outcry that we've had in the last couple of months. Maybe you can exp look for a waiver so that we can do what we need to do as a community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gress, Robert, Mr. Gilberto Escobar, followed by Sandy R. Good evening. Ten years ago, I stood here before the board that was here on the subject of redistricting. They had already made up their mind, according to them and their demographer, that they had the right decision to keep the district lines as they were. They refused to listen to us because they thought that, had, that the demographer was the answer to everything. We came again. This time we came with an attorney. And our attorney explained to the board what re redistricting is and how the community needs to be involved. This district lines that we have now are part of that struggle that we had. Now I'm gonna tell every one of you here, rewriting or redrawing district lines does not guarantee anything. It only guarantees that there are new voters voting for some people that live in another area. As you can see, this is a result that we had at the end, and this is not a representative result for our community. It's very obvious. There's still not one Hispanic sitting there. And we're the largest student population. There is not one black face there. And again, this is a very important community in our area. We need for you to be honest. You have not been focused on the needs of the district. Most of you are focused on the needs of UCR. That does not help us. Most of you are concerned more about what's happening at UCR than what's happening with our children. And that is sad. Redrawing the districts doesn't mean you don't get reelected, but at least it gives the community a chance to say where the lines are going to be. And if you trust the community and you want the community to trust you, let the community participate in the drawing of the lines. And we need to have your demographer work with us. And at this time, do it right. And Ms. Sandy R. So I was able to attend the committee meeting regarding the redistricting. Um, and the concerns were that the board did not appear to want to redistrict. And I understand the number was um, 9.1 and the, the threshold I guess you guys were going by was 10. Um, so a 0.9 difference um, to me doesn't seem valid when you have other issues that need to be addressed. The most important issue that you need to address is the fact that you have the opportunity to create a second minority majority district. You only have one, and it happens to be the area of the only minority sitting on the dais. And it also is the area that had the most growth. So it makes sense that 
since you had more growth there, and if you shift that minority population to another um, district, that you would probably end up with the second minority majority district. And I think that that's something very important. Um, we do want to see representation. You know, you talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and there's no inclusion for our community up there. So th there's other reasons also, and the other reason that I would think that you would want to consider redistricting is to remove the fact that all trustees um, oversee poly. There should never be more than three for any school. Uh, it just makes sense that it be fair, and right now all five of you look good when poly looks good, and that's why poly is like the cream of the crop. I, I would even say over STEM, since we just heard what the campus looks like. Um, so if you want to remove the notion that Polly is the favorite child, that's something that you should consider. And I think that these considerations should be made, um, and the next election cycle, and the fact that trustees might not want to risk re-election by changing their districts should not be a deciding factor. And the fact that you guys get to decide the people that elect you is concerning to me, and I don't, I don't agree with the process, and so I do think that the community should have more input. It shouldn't just fall to, to you to make that decision when you are actually, it's kind of like when you take money from the school, from the teachers union. You're, you're overseeing stuff for them. It's the same thing, it's a conflict. So that's the point I'm trying to make. So you have the power to create equity and create opportunities for minorities on this board, and I hope that you use that. All right, now uh, uh, that ends the public. I uh, go to the board for their comments and and uh, questions to our demographer and staff. Starting with, all right, I'll, I'll go to myself. Um, demographer, please, and and attorneys. We did have uh, a, a committee meeting on this, and we talked about. And because when Mrs. Alivy and I were the only ones that were on this board when this was done, we worked with you, one of the things we challenged you all to do was to get a minority-majority district so we, we could have uh, the opportunity for typically Hispanic but other uh, minorities to, to be elected. So we did achieve that. Can we develop, and we talked about at the meeting, that you, what would challenge us to develop a, uh, uh, another one? There are some prohibitions just on race, I believe, wouldn't it? Well, but even setting that aside, I don't think that you have the numbers sufficient to create another. And I'll, I'll let uh, Justin address that specifically. It, the, the, just, the numbers aren't there. We have enough for one. Yeah. To, well, we can't put it up. A, can, can we, we do the split up? screen thing or yeah. not? What, what numbers are you looking at on the page? Split page than nine. Half, more than half. Yeah, we've got more than... Well, let's go, yeah, so, but I think we can't do it on race. It was on that, it was, that's against the Civil Rights Act. Well, that, well, that's right. I mean, race cannot be the predominating factor in drawing a map. Right. Uh, but it is something that we're conscientious of as we're right. developing the map, and we need to be careful that we're complying with Section 2 of the Federal Voting Rights Act, making sure that we're not um, taking all of the minority voting strength and just cramming it into one area or you know, sprinkling it, dispersing it in such a way that there's no influence anywhere. And, right. and that's not present in this map. That's simply not an issue. And there just isn't enough yet. But if you look, and I'll let Justin talk about the, the trends over time, my suspicion is that just by natural growth, by the time the next census comes out, you'll likely have perhaps another one or two minority, majority areas. And again, it's important to know that when we're talking about when we're talking about majority minority districts, we're focused on citizen voting age population because that's the best estimate that we have of who's eligible to vote. So based on citizen voting age population, trustee area three has 58.1% Hispanic Latino vote. If you look at trustee area four and five, they're both above 40%. However, they're not high enough above 40% that just by drawing in some, some other areas, uh, that we'd be able to get to that 50% threshold. Now, it's important to note the trend when, you know, based on when you uh, first drew these boundaries and adopted that map, trustee area four was 31.4% Hispanic Latino, and now it's 40.4%. Trustee area five was 33.2%, and it's 43% now. I do think that we'll, we'll see 
substantial changes over the next 10 years, and even as new citizen voting age population data comes available. Um, when we look at actually where those boundaries, if, if we were to go back to the, the graduated color map, um, it becomes, in, in my mind, it becomes challenging to be able to take some of those larger concentrations and boost those without, um, again, and I don't think it's mathematically possible, but to uh, be able to raise that such a level and maintain trustee area three as a majority minority district. All right. Next question I have is for uh, um, our two first speakers that talked about poly and uh, having five. I'm looking at it, it's just obvious. I mean, if you look at uh, is this going south down at the bottom? I, was, I guess that is that way. That's going south. Both. Uh, my area, which is four, and Mrs. Adleby's area, uh, which is one, um, have a lot of orange trees in them. But Polly sits in the middle, which is very populated, except for the Alessandra Hill. So I think that explains that. Um, Mr. Escoville, you and I have been talking about this for a long time. And one of us has some faulty memory, because I want you to remember, we did have community meetings. We ended up on Plan L. We started out with, and I fought the gentleman sitting at this one to my left because he didn't want the minority majority district. And in fact, the night we finally uh, did L, you criticized me heavily up here. I'm going up front with you, Roberto, because we've had this conversation before. The next day you called me and apologized that I actually, you had done the best you can. So we did have community meetings. Nobody did run in the minority majority district. Uh, that was Hispanic. And that, that, and I love Dr. Farouk, but no, sir, we're not having a conversation. It's my turn. It, it's done. I, you, you do criticize. It's easy to criticize, but that's not what happened, sir. And, and it happened that this was the first time, and I worked very hard. You know that. I met with the attorney that was going to sue us otherwise, and I promised him we'd get there. There was reluctance by some of the board members to do this. I promised him he'd get there. Don't sue us for six weeks. And he asked me, he said, if you can, Tom, see if you can get a minority-majority district. And we did it. So when you criticize like that, sir, it's, it's disingenuous. You and I have had this conversation for a few years now, Gilberto. So I'm, I'm still talking. And uh, so we did have A through L. So it wasn't like we just gathered something. We did have community meetings. And we, the one we had on the east side, hardly anybody came. Now, I, I, well, thank you. We, we've already talked about that. And uh, it, the boundaries, too, were not in existence before the last time we did this. So the boundaries weren't adhered to. It was at large, and we, uh, we did say we didn't want a bureaucratic process to take out an elected process. And it was tough, because we had, we had one body living on the second, and another on ninth. But we wanted a minority-majority district. Love to have another, but it sounds like we can't. But it seems to be trending that way. And of course, if measure, uh, uh, if SB 10 is, if our city council agrees to get rid of the green belt, then we're going to have a lot more population in those areas, a lot more. Um, so those are my comments to Mr. Kinnear. Thank, thanks, President Hunt. I'm the least experienced with this. I've never been through this process. I'm a new board member. Um, I don't have a background in this. I was around, by the way, when the uh, poly attendance area changed. Uh, that was when we built King High School back in 2000. So uh, I'm familiar with the attendance areas and, and uh, what went into the building those, but I'm not familiar with, uh, with trustee areas. Uh, when I read my materials and looked at it, again, being uh, a novice here, I was surprised when I looked at the considerations for voting areas because when I looked at compact and contigu contig contig contiguous, I, you know, I see that I don't see that in in uh, in trustee area. What is that? One trustee area one goes across the whole city o o almost. Trustee area one is is uh, is, is very very different from uh, all the other trustee areas. Uh, follow man-made and natural geographic features. You know. Uh, trustee area two, my area, uh, Alessandro is, 
you know, one of the biggest uh, uh, streets and uh, divisions in in the city, and and uh, and my my area crosses uh, crosses Alice Center, so I was surprised at that. And then when it says respect incumbency if possible, you know, it, it looked to me like much of this uh, might have been drawn at least in part uh, because of incumbency, uh, because that's how we got trusty area uh, one to, to look the way it, it looks. Uh, I value community input in this. I don't have enough experience to say what I think is most important and how to change things. Uh, if we could establish a, a committee that, that had uh, community interested community members uh, working with uh, the demographer, uh, that would that would be huge for me. That would that would be important information uh, for uh, for me to use to uh, to, to make a, a good decision as to how to proceed. So uh, I like that suggestion. Um, I hope that we could uh, we could set up some kind of a of a, of a meeting that uh, that involves community members and with and have community members and and a demographer look at this and. Maybe they'll come to the same conclusion that uh, uh, that that we have in front of us that no changes made. Maybe they'll have something that's 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 better. I I I don't know, but I think that would be helpful. So essentially, though, <clears throat> what that is proposing is a rearrangement of trustee areas. That's not the process that we're talking about tonight, which is the post census redistricting. But certainly, this board has the discretion as do registered voters. If enough of them sign signatures, they can require a rearrangement of boundaries. But that, that would be left to the discretion of the majority of the board, whether they want to go that direction. But I want to be clear, that's a very different exercise with a different purpose. That's taking everything and, and essentially taking a fresh look at it and redoing it. That's not the point of post-census redistricting. Remember, we've already gone through a lengthy public process to develop those areas. We're just now making adjustments to those areas. Now, you can go through that process if that's the will of the board, but I want to be clear, that's a different process. And that doesn't end with you. It then goes to the county committee. And so I just wanted to make sure that that uh, distinction was understood. And I'll just add this other point, having done this for a while. It's probably no secret, but uh, there is no such thing as a map that every single person is going to agree with 100%. And there's no such thing as a map that fully complies 100% with all of the must-dos and all of the little may-dos. It really is a balancing. There are certain things that have to happen. We have to have population balance. We have to comply with Section 2. Federal Voting Rights Act, and the rest of it, we do the best we can. Geographically, you see where Polly is located. Well, it's that way because we're trying to population balance. And so of necessity, it's going to touch a number of areas because we're trying to accomplish the mandatory things. So, Very good input. Thank you. Dr. Farouk, I saw your name up here, and then it wasn't there. I'm sorry. Did I miss you? Hi. Oh, yes, please. That's uh, Sorry. Thank you. I appreciate this presentation. So um, one comment I just want to make, just respectfully, uh, that I, I don't appreciate the term that's being thrown around of majority, minority. By definition, if, if, uh, if people of color are the majority of the of population, then they shouldn't be referred to as minorities. I, I just would appreciate if we were don't use that vernacular. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, this process, so I, I just want to understand the term. So you're saying this process is, uh, what was the term you're using that this is called? You're not is it, are you using the term redistricting or using a different term? Post census redistricting. Po post -census, so we're, yeah. essentially, we're looking at one thing only population balance. And the right. law says that if you do anything beyond that, you're re what you're really doing is a rearrangement. Rearrangement, And that okay. needs to be done under the different 
right. provision of law. So, so this process is redistricting, uh, and it's based on population variance, and, and there's a legal basis of staying within the 10 percent and so we, forth. We that's, have to do that every 10 years. Right. So, so that's understood. I, I want to inquire about the other process, the rearrangement. Okay. I want to drill down on that. So just because there's a legal basis of doing the redistricting, right, again, the, the variance and so forth, it doesn't mean that there's an illegal basis of doing the rearrangement, right? It doesn't mean that, that you can't do it. No, it, not at all. It's just another process. Right, right. But I, I'm, I want to, I'm saying that to make a point, though. Yeah. So, so it is something that, that is possible to do. Uh, then the question becomes, because uh, you said that it can be challenged, right? Uh, if, if we do the rearrangement route, whereas uh, if we did the redistricting route and it's within the variance, there's a legal basis for it. But if you do the rearrangement route, th that's, that's, being, that's more susceptible to challenges. Is that correct? Yeah. It, that, that is correct? I'm, I'm sorry. I was getting pinged from another board meeting I need okay. to attend. Could you repeat that, please? OK, so what I'm saying is that from a legal basis, the redistricting, if it's within the 10% variance, there's a legal basis to move forward with that. That's legally would be essentially protected, right? That, we right, that. there would be a basis to basically you've met the intent right. of the law, which is to maintain that population balance. And if we did the rearrangement route, mm -hmm it's more susceptible to being challenged because, because the, the, the threshold and bar of, of, of meeting all of the, the must versus the may. The may. I, I wouldn't characterize it that way. What, okay. what, I, what I'm trying to caution us uh, against doing is trying to disguise a rearrangement as a post-census redistricting. And if we don't follow the rearrangement process, if what you're doing is rearrangement, that's a problem. So we need to just be clear what we're, what we're doing. And you right. have the discretion to do either one. Right, but this presentation has been basically exclusively focused on one of those tracks. That's, that's correct. And because by nature, if we choose one track, we're, we're not pursuing the other. I'm, the, my inquiries are related to having a deeper understanding about the other track. Uh, so that we're we're making an informed decision. So in this uh, in this uh, uh, that's why I want to focus on the rearrangement scenario. What what are the the potential basis from a legal standpoint to justify a rearrangement? For for example, it, it's been cited through some of the community input about saying that uh, the the allocation of no, school representation, for yeah, example. Yeah, I understand the question. Okay. You actually don't need a basis. You have very broad discretion in that area. If you want to change your areas, you want to rearrange them, there's no minimum standard that you have to meet if you want to engage in that exercise. And in fact, even if you didn't want to, if your constituents wanted you to, they could, and if enough of them signed a petition, they could require that to happen. The county committee could actually do that on your behalf as well. They typically don't. But there is no minimum bar that would trigger a requirement to do that. Okay, and then for the purposes, because this is not as uh, this is uh, not agendized as an action item. This is agendized as a study session. It, it, so, this is that's so correct. For the purposes of this specific discussion, what what are you seeking from us, uh, like tangibly? What, what are we supposed to provide you in this meeting? So it was our hope that we would get direction from the board. We've made a recommendation, which you are free to accept or reject. And if the recommendation, recommendation. again, the recommendation would be to uh, come back and again adopt a resolution that would continue your areas as they currently are. That's the recommendation. Um, and so you can either vote in favor of that or you can give us alternative direction. You can direct us, for example, to start a rearrangement process if that's the will of the board. Again, it's all within your discretion. But it's not a formal vote. We just informally each give you our direction. That's what you're saying? Well, we, you know, you act by majority of, of the board. So sure. it's if the majority of the board wants to do something, you would, you know, make a motion, take a vote. Okay. And if we were to, to completely start from scratch, right, can you just give us some idea of the, the time frame, the likely time frame, and the, the key milestones and process associated with that, please? 
Yes. So a and the cost. So a rearrangement. Well, I'll, I'll defer to well, cost wise. Twenty twenty five. For rearrangement on the demography side, probably 10, 15 on the legal side. Um, probably wouldn't be able to start that this calendar year, um, just because of all the post-census redistricting that we're doing now. Uh, but you could still have it done in time, uh, that you could have that adjusted areas in place for the November 2022 election. It's a it's not as lengthy a process as the initial creation process. You're just doing some rearranging. Um, but again, it, it doesn't stop with you. Once you make a recommendation, that then goes to the county committee on school district organization. They have to come here and conduct a public hearing and they, and they get to decide whether or not to accept the, the, the rearranged boundaries. So, so the final authority on a rearranged boundary would be the, the, the county Yes. Okay. And I would also add, importantly, that if enough folks wrote signatures that they didn't like the areas, that, the way that you rearrange them, they actually could force it onto a ballot, mm -hmm. which could further complicate mm -hmm. things. Okay. I said if enough registered voters submitted a petition in opposition to the way that you rearrange the boundaries, they could force the item onto an election. But, they would have the added time, cost, and expense of an election. But if, hypothetically, if, if they were, the board was to accept the, the, within the variance of the redistricting as opposed to the rearrangement, mm -hmm. there's not a basis for, for the, the county or the, uh, the, the people to, to challenge the basis of the way it's organized? No. Okay. And, and also, importantly, you always have the ability to rearrange the trustee areas. If you, you know, a year from now, two years from now, get a big development somewhere and you go, wow, we're kind of, we're thinking we may be getting out of balance here or you have an influx of people. You always have that right. You don't have to wait for the census. You can do that at any time. Okay, uh, thank you. This, this is very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. I, that's, that's always insightful with you. You know, um, that's, that's, I didn't realize that. So we're looking at this SB 10 that if the supermajority of the council were to approve, then they can get rid of the green belt. Developers are going to be all over that. And then, Mrs. Allen, I think you were saying the other day that uh, uh, in Councilwoman Aaron Edwards' area that there, because we're very concerned about this for our schools, 8,800 new dwelling units plan to go there, which is an affordable area. So uh, that is very interesting that we can make those changes. We do meet the legal requirements right now. Yes, sir. I believe that our... Uh, so, I... Do we have a motion to do one or the other? To take, to take their input and their recommendation and agendize it next meeting or not? Can I ask one more question, Mr. Allen? Oh, okay. No, it's a, it would be an excellent time for the next meeting. It would be correct? to agendize at the next meeting, is what their recommendation is. To, and the staff works on a resolution. Mr. Well, Lee and Mrs. Allaby, I didn't see you come up until right now. So yeah, well, I was going to ask a question. Um, Go ahead. Mr. Farouk, or Dr. Farouk, I think answered a lot of the questions that I had in my head about the option. So just to clarify, should the board decide to proceed with the recommendation to approve the post-census redistricting? No, post-census redistricting, we could do that. And then independently, next year, year after, next week, you could also look into the process of, uh, what's the term? Rearrangement. Rearrangement. You could do yeah. so. You could do both. One That's doesn't correct. exclude the other. That's okay. correct. Um, then my other uh, my other question is, I know we brought up at the um, subcommittee meeting the the uh, question about trying to create another uh, boundary. Um, sorry, Dr. Fruk, I don't know what the correct terminology is, but to w to where it's another uh, majority non-white district. Um, Not based on race. So. And so I know we asked that question, and you were going to do a little bit of research. So between that meeting and this meeting, were there any efforts to look at the, the data to see if that was was possible? Because it does appear um, that we're, we're really, it's trending a certain way, and there is is pretty close. Um, 5,000 people or 4,000 people, I'm not sure the number exactly is, at least in my district. Right. And, and it's important to note that um, number is 
it's, it's roughly 3,000, and that would be if it was completely Latino uh, population taken in. And what we know is that in the census blocks that surround those areas, it's not, it's not a monolith. There is, there is diversity that's there. Um, and so while there are more densely populated areas with, with Latino voters there, there's also other groups as well, so. Okay, and then um, also as part of, you have the, the, the kind of the criteria of must do and may do. Um, so if the board didn't want to go through the uh, restructuring process, but wanted to um, potentially adjust through the post-census redistricting process, can one of the criteria be um, attendance and t attendance area or voting population area um, as suggested by a couple of the speakers? Again, the sole criteria is population balance. And if you're able to accomplish that as a, at the same time, perhaps. But again, it's anything you do beyond just population balance pushes you into that rearrangement rubric. So, if it was the will of the community or the board to um, go through that process, the only way to accomplish those two particular goals would be through a rearrangement. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Appreciate it. Mrs. Alavi, I, did I lose you or you? I was just going to make a motion that we move this to the next action agenda for the census uh, data. Uh, for their recommendation. Thank you. Mrs. Alvey's made a motion that, that reflects the consultant and staff's uh, recommendation. Do we have a second? The procedural question. Because it, 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 it's a study session, is it, does it need to be a formal vote or just kind of the will yeah, of the that's board? That's a good question. I don't know. I th well, I think we have to, do, well, yeah, it would go to our agenda committee, but I think it'd be good to do it in public because uh, rearrangement in some states and where I used to be sometimes is called gerrymandering so I'd rather have it be out in front. Yes, we're, we're seeking board direction mm -hmm. for next board meeting if the board accepts the recommendation from from legal counsel and our demographer which is status quo we will bring at the next board meeting a resolution of no action accepting the the our trustee as, as is. Okay well it's a little hard to without, without voting and it's a great question Mr. Lee but uh, we can't exactly, you know, poll up here, so we have to have something that, in the minutes that directs it, but I'm willing to not do that if need be. He's fine with moving I'm it forward to the next meeting. To the next meeting. Okay, so then, then you are seconding the motion uh, to move it forward to the next meeting to have it agendized, has presented, no change, and uh, we'll continue to keep an eye on it. So just That's for only two board members, though. We have no, to. No, I, did, I just said we. It was a. I'm sorry, it's oh. late. One of us isn't. Uh, it was a motion, and a, I was just restating what the motion is. All right. So, President, Hunt, just for clarification, yeah. there's no action needed. What we can do at the next board meeting, we'll, we'll bring it, agendize it, with the action, of, with the resolution of no action. At that, at that time, the board can then take a vote of either okay. moving that forward or not, and giving us further direction for a, for a different uh, action if the board pleases. But at this time, there's no action needed required. Right. Okay. That's good. I think we, I then let, let, let's do so. Withdraw your motion and we'll move it forward. We'll agendize it for the next meeting. Wait, and, it's, 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 President, so are we saying that we're, we're gonna completely leave it arbitrary about what the board's direction on this is until the next meeting then? No, we're moving it. We're taking yes. the recommendation to move it to the next meeting to vote on whether we go this way or another way. But that's, that's what I'm saying. So we're not going to give any direction to the public about where each of us is to stand. No, all, all you would be, if we were voting, and it seems to be we don't need to vote, you would just be saying, yeah, let's put on the next agenda and we can dig into it more. But it does give the public the opportunity to comment because yeah. that's when we'd be Otherwise, we wouldn't have the public opportunity yeah. to comment. Do you have a different idea? Well, I just want to make sure, so I, I want to make sure I understand this. If theoretically we were to go the other route, the rearrangement route, would we still have the option to do that with what you're proposing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because you would, we're proposing that it go, he's saying let's make it an apple, 
We're gonna we're gonna agendize for apples if if they we get there and they want to go oranges. That's what we're doing. Well, that's why I made my, that's why I asked my question because it doesn't exclude you from going through that no. process should we decide to do that. Correct. You could still even the at the next step. meeting we could accept this and then we could still authorize the rearrangement process. Okay. I, after I, that. The, the only th I'll just say one last comment on no. this. I, I know it seems like we're ready to move on. In my opinion, I understand that theoretically we could accept this and then still go through the process later at another time. To me, this is this is coming up in 10 years. In, in my opinion, we should move forward with the rearrangement process and just 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 take the, take that on. But well, then you'll have a chance to say that at the next meeting. We're going to yeah, move it forward. So, all right. So we, it will be on the next agenda item. Uh, excuse me, the November 18th, right? November. Yeah. Okay. Just to, to piggyback what uh, what Dr. Farouk is saying, if uh, if uh, we put this as an action item for the uh, next agenda, and we decide at that particular time that we want to reorganize. Is there sufficient time to do that? My comment was also a, and a mechanism to actually do that. Yeah. Because yeah. thank you. Because there's a there's a deadline by February. It has to be uh, adopted. Yeah. And because of the census data getting. Because of COVID, it was supposed to be April and it was September, which is a whole world. This is know? this is why I thought that give, having some kind of clarity and giving some direction at this meeting would be helpful from a planning standpoint, because that's fundamentally two very desperate s scenarios. And I, I thought that they had alluded to the fact that there's some bandwidth issues of timing and so forth. With the uh, so th that's just um, that's just the impression I have. I mean. I, you know. Could I clarify the the timing issue is only if you want to have it on the 2022 um, election cycle. If you wanted to move it to the 2024 election cycle, there wouldn't be any but, problem. But but this is what I'm saying is, that, again, I, I'm one board member, but I I am recommending that we 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 do this now and so that it's a that it's a, a, applicable for the 22 cycle. Okay. Uh, and and, and, and the, you're doing it with all of our board positions. Intact. In other words, if some one of us changes our mind and doesn't want to run, you have to fi still figure us as the incumbent when you draw those lines. Yeah. In the future, that might change, and you might prefer to draw them differently. Well, I, look, I, I'm one board member. I mean, all I'm saying is that that's. Um, I just wanted to make sure that if we're if we're saying that it's going to be truly open ended, that we're going to make this decision at the next meeting, that it truly is feasible to pursue both options. And that's all I'm saying, and that there's an actual mechanism to pursue both options, because th this presentation was purely laid out for redistricting, right? And then if we're, we're saying that we're going to move this to the next meeting as a, a resolution, what is that resolution? You said it's going to be resolution to reaffirm this measure. So. And, and if the if the will isn't there to go the other scenario, then I, I think that clarity needs to be provided now to avoid that kind of a situation. Otherwise, we have to be uh, genuine to the community and have real two viable options, two mechanisms of, of actions that can actually concretely be played out uh, within the time frames that are required by law. But I, I think you would have a... You have to have something on the agenda, Dr. Farouk. I don't agree with the rearrangement. I think it's, I think it's very perilous, particularly now that I find out that we can, as Alvi was saying, that particularly when we find out how the dwelling units are going to happen and all of that, you can change it for the 24, the 26. But we have to have something to agendize next week. So, or, and so, so I'm, I agree with that we agendize it the way the demographer and the, our attorneys have have recommended and our staff, and we can do, if. If it doesn't happen, it's two weeks from now, is it two? Uh, that we can go the other way. We'll, we'll find that will be the official. We don't have an official vote tonight. No, no, I, I know we don't have an official. I, I think we're not. <laughs> well, I can, I, can it, is there any kind of limitations? What are the limitations? Should we decide to go to the rearrangement? What would be our deadline to make? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. So maybe this this would help. So there's two processes. The process that we want to bring closure to is the post census redistricting which has a due date by February 2022, correct? So that, that will come to the board next, next board meeting to bring closure to meet that deadline. The second 
uh, process will be the redistricting. That can happen at any time. That has no deadline. That can start at any time next week, next month, next year, as the attorney uh, mentioned. But if you wanted to theoretically, and Dr. Farouk's uh, sounds like will, if you wanted to meet the election of 2022, when would that arrangement have to start and finish? So in, in the elections code, it requires that all of that is sorted out 125 days before the election. That puts you at roughly the beginning of July. That has to have gone through the county committee and it has to have been submitted and approved by the registrar of voters. Generally, what we tell our clients that are going through that process is they need to be wrapped up March, maybe April. So it would be pretty tight, Didn't even if you started tomorrow. I think my only concern is that we haven't heard any, I don't, well, at least if, I wasn't part of this process originally. I mean, arguably I got elected because of it, because of the districts and uh, no longer being an at-large process since I did take, take an account, a challenge in incumbent. Um, but I mean, I'm open to, to the discussion. I just haven't heard that, that, that there's really a big difference between redistricting versus rearranging um, and that the timing of this particular issue on our agenda has to do with the post-census data and the requirement to make a decision on that data prior to that February deadline. And then while we have heard from some community members um, that have been vocal about this particular issue, I don't know that as a board we really have much of a discussion on the whole rearrangement issues. It seems to me that we don't want to rush that process either, that you would want to make sure you have plenty of community input, plenty of community so that you don't rush to create potentially another uh, boundary issue for the, for the next board. So I, I don't understand, Dr. Farouk, again, because this is the first I've heard, heard, heard this option, what the rationale for wanting to do that so quickly. It's, I'm open to listening. I just don't understand. Well, to what me, the, it's not a matter of doing it quickly. It's a matter of that it's so I wasn't on the board when these maps were drawn. You weren't on, Dale. I mean, majority of our board was not on when these maps were originally drawn. But what, what I'm saying is like that this, this process of the census, it's, it's been 10 years, right, since the, since the last one. What is the, people are redrawing boundaries. I mean, this, this is what people are doing. I mean, this, this is the time frame that people do it. To me, if, if, we, if, if we think that there's a value, let's do it then. And, and the value to me, again, is the community involvement. And, uh, and if, if we are allowed to take into account schools and all that stuff, why, why put it off for an, an, an undetermined point in the future uh, when this is a natural time that these types of discussions and processes happen? Uh, I, I agree that it's not ideal, but part of it also from a practical matter so that's, that's my personal position on it. But from a practical matter also, to, to be uh, transparent to the community, if majority of the board has already made up its mind on this, then, 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 it needs to, then it's gonna be clear what, like to your point, Mr. Hunt, about this is what the resolution, the action item would be mm -hmm. at the next meeting. I, I just don't think that we should be, you know, putting some kind of an illusion that we're actually seriously exploring both options if, if the board, majority of the board is not. That's all I'm saying. Okay, thank you. I would just, I would just say, like, I, I don't see them that you have to necessarily tie them together. It seems to me that the timing is appropriate to make a decision on redistricting, and that the legal requirement for redistricting mm -hmm. has been met based upon the recommendation. That is completely, in my mind, is completely sep separate to the question of uh, restructuring the districts, and that you can still pursue both paths at the same time if you want. But I think that because of the timing. Uh, required before February, that we should at least have a discussion at our next meeting about whether or not we're going to redistrict or not, um, and then pursue a, a larger a larger discussion with the community about restructuring. May I, may I add on that? I know I'm going to then quickly turn to our superintendent, but what bothers me about this is that uh, if we be, I think we ought to approve it post census, and but then. But because if we do the other process, because of the lengthy time the census took to get to us, you've got to, uh, we're going to finish by July, June, July, if we did the other process, if we did the rearrangement process. Yeah, just to be clear, it's, it's not finish up by, it's, it's meaning that you've gone to the county committee, right. you've submitted it to the registrar voters, 
you need There's time no for just that process. Yeah, and, and my problem with, with that is that then you've got five, that really looks like, ger it may not be, but it looks like gerrymandering that we, we drew, so, so incumbents would, would, uh, would benefit. We redrew the lines because you're only gonna have from about three months until the election. And that is, that not doesn't look time. good. Now the fact that we can, uh, uh, and particularly we'll know a lot more about the housing plan, and we'll know a lot more about uh, uh, growth in high growth, some of those. It gives us time to, in the resolution, I'm fine with saying the resolution, and we will look at this again and do another census for the, in 23. So but let me go to, before, uh, uh, I apologize, M Ms. Hill, then, and then Ms. Allaby, then you. No, no, Mr. Kinnear, excuse me. Uh, I think you are already on the track. I, it could be a two-stage process, like I think Mr. Lee was alluding to, that you have a resolution next time to meet the deadline for redistricting with the census data and give direction to have the timeline and research done for a rearrangement process to be concluded. I think... Uh, Finishing our business by March is pushing it. March or April is is pushing it, especially because the demographer said that they have this, you know, they have a workload issue, or it could be done later. So I was just going to recommend it could be a two. It doesn't have yeah. to be one or the other. It can be a two stage process, but you got to stick to both pieces. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Alvey, then Mr. Kinnear. Well, I just I was here when we redrew district, and it took a full year of community meetings for us just to come up with this plan. Uh, that's not something you can rush. As they said, there'd want to be community input mm -hmm. uh, with the demographers. It, it, we have to allow a full year if you want to, re to re completely redraw the lines. I don't think we can rush that. Doctor, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Trustee Kinnear, excuse me. My only point is that community involvement will allow me to make a better decision. Uh, and so I want to see sure. community involved. Uh, and on what? On, e on, uh, on reconfiguring. Uh, so rearranging. Rearranging. What? Do we need to do that or do we not need to do that? We won't know until we have uh, community people sitting on a committee to, to, to look at it. Uh, so that, that would allow me to make a better decision. That's, that's all I'm saying. Well, Dale, I do want to, I mean, Mr. Trustee, can you excuse me? We, we had uh, A through L. It did take six community meetings. It took a year. And we need to get this one approved, and then we can move forward on, and because we are, I mean, I, I was amazed that mine hasn't changed hardly at all, 390-something people, but, but I got a lot of orange groves. And uh, so, but it would give us a chance to do it properly. But if we try to rush it, this is just my opinion, it's going to look disingenuous that, and it, 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 there's a there's a damned if you do, damned if you don't, but let's do it properly and get this, what I would want is to have this approved and then we can move forward on the, uh, looking at the new, at the, uh, at the whole process and, and having the meetings and all of that. So, so we're going to have this agendized well, can, can, next meet. Uh, can ahead, I just Dr. say one last thing about this? Please. I, I, I just think the comment about rushing it, there's tons of, there's federal, state, county processes with public input happening at the same time. I, I don't know why it would only apply to us that we would be rushing it and uh, all these other jurisdictions are doing it. Uh, I, I, that's, I, I just, and, and to say that it's gonna take a year, I, you know, I, it, I, we could theoretically make it take a year. I'm not saying it, it needs to be a certain, but I'm just saying if other jurisdictions are doing this, they're having the community input and doing it, then. I just don't see why we're suddenly feeling that it would be rushed and we, we can't do it. Because, because we've gone through that. But, okay. Mrs. Well, at the, next, at the next board, oh, sorry, Ms. Alley. No, Mrs. Alley, then Mr. Lee. The reason why is because uh, they have to draw maps, they come back, the public has input, we meet more, they go back, they draw more maps, we change things. It just took a year. Now, I just don't think you can do that in three months, and I don't think we can do that before 2022. But can we say, can we start the process? For the next election, yes, we can. Uh, I, I, you just, it just takes that long to have that many community meetings to, re, to evaluate all those maps. We had 12 different maps to finally get to 
and I finally get to L that was approvable. And that was the one that was given us, I don't, just using the term it was, minority majority district, which was very important, which Mrs. Alvey and I supported, others weren't quite as enthusiastic about it. But you know, you have 12 different, if, if, if each one took three weeks, that's, that's a very long time. It's gonna take a lot more than that. So I, I believe we should uh, move it forward and then we can talk about what's the second step. Let's get this thing approved. We don't have, we don't have, to, we don't have to go to the county committee to just have it renewed, right? Or what, what is the process? Somebody. I'm, I'm saying if it's just the, I'm, I'm losing the term, but the confirmation of a, of a census because we're under 10% or 11%. Redistrict. So the redistrict, we're not, we're not rearranging. Right. So that process, if I recall, doesn't go to the county committee. That's correct. Doesn't have to go to the registrar. It's just, we're, we're just refiling for an as is. But at that time, we can also say, if we want, let's take a look at the, at this again, and, you know, begin the process if we want. And, and uh, this is 21, 22, 23. You have that discretion, but let me just add Please. that you have a deadline to finish your post census redistricting. Yes. That's the last day of February, That's 2022. So that, that has to be done. That's mandatory. We should have had you speak up a lot earlier. Because that's, that's the point. We have to get this done. We only have one meeting in, in uh, November, one meeting in December. The meeting in December is very short. And now, you know, so we're not going to be able to do the other between now that we got to get this done so we're, we're certified. And you can, can do the back. rearrangement starting hmm? in, in March, April. Yeah, if right. that's the direction of the board, to look at the yeah, you'll be right. compliant oh, by February, and then you can make whatever changes you want to make. You have that discretion, right. and, and and again, there's no trigger for it. It's just if you want to do that, you have that discretion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what I would also ask, I mean, because it's you know, eleven o'clock at night, and honestly, this is the first time we've anybody on the board has ever brought up rearranging. Yes. Um, and so I don't know that it's the best time to try to have this conversation. But since it sounds like the board is at least open to the discussion of rearranging, uh, and in my mind, they're independent redistricting and rearranging, two independent ideas that you can do yeah. both without exclude. You can choose one without excluding the other. Then why not at the next meeting, if we're going to discuss, if we're going to do that, also have you all come back and share that process of what rearrangement looks like and some recommendations to see what. Uh, responsible timeline looks like. And if that can be done in three months, then we can have that discussion. If it's gonna take longer, then we can have that discussion too. Um, and then that gives the opportunity for it to be on the agenda and for more than just the four speakers that spoke tonight to give us some input on the arrangement process. And those have to be publicly noticed. So the meetings yeah. would two weeks plus. So I think that's wisdom. And uh, unless there's any more Objections or anything, that's, that's what will be on the next agenda. Is that all right? Okay, we can talk about that. All right. I'm going to now recess the public session of the regular Board of Education and convene the Board of Directors of the Riverside Unified School District Financing Authority. It is recommended the Board of Directors of the Riverside School District Financing Authority. I'm, re, I'm recessing the agenda, the, uh, the regular meeting. Uh, adopt resolution FA-2. 021 backslash 22 dash 01, a resolution authorizing the issuance of bond of free funding revenue bonds for the purpose of refunding outstanding 2012 series A bonds and 2012 series B bonds. This is a good one. I'm sorry, no, no, that's fine. And uh, so, we this is Miss Aaron Power, our assistant superintendent for business services. And uh, thank you, Miss Power, for this presentation and your work on it. The Finance Committee saw this and it was very interesting. Thank you, President Hunt, and good evening, Superintendent Hill and board members. We have Adam Bauer, uh, the CEO and President of Fieldman Rollup and Associates, and also Murnal Shaw from Best Best and Creeker. Uh, Mr. Bauer will come up and give us a presentation on the refunding of the revenue bonds, which will generate a tax savings for the certain taxpayers in certain CFDs, community facilities districts. And after that presentation, I will ask for your approval of the resolution to um, authorize the issuance of the bonds. 
Good evening and thank you. And so I'll move very quickly, a lot like I did our last meeting. If we go to, if we go to our next slide, um, there's four graphs here. I'm not going to talk about any of them. What I'm going to tell you is when we met with the Finance Committee, we had the 10-year Treasury at 1.36. Ten-year Treasury today, before when I left to come here, was 1.68. Interest rates have gone up. So we're still at or near historic lows, but we're not at the point where we initially kicked this off at. So the savings have declined since we started, but they're still at a very positive level. So I think we can skip now, and we can get to page three, please. Page three just talks generally about what we're doing here. And I'll, once again, be very uh, simple. Go down to that last bullet point. We're grouping all those CFDs into one financing. So instead of paying the cost of issuance each time, we're able to pay a larger cost of issuance, but not much, one time across all those CFDs. And that's what we're looking to target there. So that whole financing authority concept is that we're grouping these CFDs to share that cost of issuance. Next slide, please. On this side, we're looking at about 3,213 homes along with some apartments. And that, those are the homes that comprise the CFDs that are listed there and on the last slide. Next slide, please. Uh, when we talk about credit, this is a fabulous credit. Uh, we were rated double A minus by the rating agency. And that's very high for a land secured transaction. And one of the main reasons here is that value to lien ratio, 38.25. We do many CFDs with less than 10 to 1 value lien. So when you group them and you get this large size, we're able to get that rating that we're, um, that we're after. So next slide, please. Um, some uh, uh, prior, some of the largest taxpayers, these uh, deal with the uh, apartments, um, and most of them are individual homeowners which you can see there was at 2,672. Next slide, please. I just shared some delinquency history, and you look very positive here. Another positive credit feature. Next slide, please. Uh, what we looked here is uh, when we looked, we were just starting this, we were about a 1.29 coverage. We're now down to about this 1.22 range, and that's due to interest rates increasing over the last few weeks. Next slide, please. Uh, net present value savings on this chart, we have the 91, um, uh, or I'm sorry, 3.113. Want to give you a bit of an update with some of the um, increases uh, in the last two days. We are now at 2.6 net present value. And that translates into a net present value percentage instead of 10.44 to 8.84. Anything over 5% is considered strong. So we're still in that strong range just not as strong because rates have increased. Next slide, please. These are our next steps. And let me tell you, we're moving quickly. Should you give us a consideration approval this evening, we are looking to price these bonds next week. I typically tell you we want a full week. We're not getting that. We need to get these bonds into the market if we're going to do this. And so that's what we're looking to do next week. We already have the call scheduled. Um, so that, that, um, that pricing gets moved up a bit. And then finally, we can close on around that Thanksgiving time frame that we have listed there. So both uh, Ms. Shaw and I are available for any questions. And um, the resolutions are in your packet this evening. Dr. Farouk, do we have any uh, public input cards for this? No, we don't. So when we're saving money, we don't have any. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. Uh, well, I just want to, is there any, any other comments? Thank you. Any other board members? Okay, go ahead, Dr. Brooks. Resolution you. number 2021 20, slash 22 dash 54. Second. Right. We have, we have a motion and a second to approve as staff recommends. Please vote. I don't know what happened. Good. That, that, that's approved. Thank you. Five zero. Thank you for being here too. All right, so I will. Um, so I'm going to adjourn. I'm going to adjourn the board of the directors of the Riverside Unified School District's Financing Authority meeting, and reconvene the public session of the Uni Riverside Unified School District board no, meeting. Not yet. What's that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well,
Well, thank you, Beth. You're right. Uh, so that resolution then is actually, Dr. Farouk, it's, it's on page, uh, well, 911, but uh, okay. F8, you got to go. Yeah, F8 2021-22-01. Slash I, I amend the motion to do that. And thank you to our timekeeper there. Thank All right, do I have the same second on that, sir? Uh, yes. Mr. Lee, okay, thank you. Uh, please vote. I'm trying to think how we do there we go. Thank you. Thank you, staff back there. Very nice. All right, that, that moves forward. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going to adjourn the meeting of the Board of Directors of Riverside Unified School District's Finance and Authority meeting and reconvene the public session of Riverside Unified School District Board meeting. Um, we go to an action item now, item M. Uh, that it is recommended the Board of Education of Riverside Unified School District resolution, the one that Dr. Farouk brought up before, 2021-22-54, approving the First Amendment to the local agency financing documents and the execution of certain certificates relating to the issuance of, uh, by the Riverside Unified School District Financing Authority of refunding revenue bonds for the purpose of refunding its outstanding 2012 Series A and 2012 Series B action item. Ms. Aaron Power, and our uh, Assistant Superintendent, and Adam Bauer, CEO and President of Felton. This, this just corresponds with the, the whole refunding, so we just need your approval of this resolution, 2122-54. Let me allow Dr. Farouk to make that now since he did it before. There's no public comment, and I'll make the motion to Thank you, sir. Them. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mrs. Allaby. Please vote. Very good. Thank you, Aaron. That passes five to zero. Appreciate it. Um, President Hunt, can I make a quick comment yes, before please. Mr. Bauer leaves? You do. You have a great report. Your materials are extensive. Sometimes they're hard to read because there's so much there. But you, you do a good job, and we're we're rushing. It appears like we're rushing through this, but it's only because of the job you've done. So thank you very thank much. You, thank you, Dale. Well, that's. You realize, though, that's because he's a poly grad. I mean, before everybody here <laughs> thinks of that, but he's an RUSD grad, right? Yeah. And we're all RUSD. Thank you very much. And thank you. Okay. Uh, it is recommended the Board of Education, this is item uh, M2, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that the Board of Education consider nominees for the election of the members of the Riverside County Committee on School District Reorganization for the first, third, and fourth supervisorial districts. Board meeting presenter is Ms. Renee Hill. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. And if we can get the slide deck up. Um, the Riverside County Com Committee on School District Organization, we, um, they have some terms that are coming up. If you go on to the next slide, please. The committee operates under the under RCOE, Riverside County Office of Ed, the 11 member, member body with terms of four years. Um, the committee is responsible for re school, re -dist school district reorganization proposals. Um, and they also may consider the trustee areas. Next slide, please. So um, there's three um, representatives whose terms are expiring. Right now, Mr. Hunt uh, sits on the first supervisor role district on our behalf, and we can nominate, RUSD can nominate for all the districts uh, as long as the nominees reside, reside within the district. Um, nomination forms are due on the 25th, and then it, an election will be held on the first, uh, for which Mr. Hunt will be our sitting delegate at that uh, nomination. So our Mr. Hunt's term is coming up. Um, so we, if, should you choose to, you can um, select a nominee to fill that term. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Do we have any public comments on this, Dr. Farouk? Does my board have any comments to give? I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, so 
just to understand, this is the this is that county entity that they kept mentioning that. It would, it would, <laughs> So, 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 uh, if you were to, to continue on this, you would be part of the decision-making body that would accept the only on a rearrangement, and I would, of course, recuse. Recu you do. I've already asked about that. Okay, I, I just want to know just for information. No, no, I, and thank you for that I'm transparency. Not qu questioning you. Uh, so, my one other uh, question is: Is it said there's a voting? Who is who votes on? Gets the rest. The rest of. Oh, go ahead, Renee. Thank you. Sitting. The sitting. Uh, delegates sure. vote now for. For the, this coming election? Push your the, microphone. The sitting Until, team. Your microphone. Oh, sorry. Thank you. The, um, the sitting committee right now votes on the, the people we would nominate this time. And what happens is we nominate. Okay, we, we, <laughs> we nominate. That's not usually a problem. Um, we nominate someone. For the first many years I was on the board, uh, it was a citizen. Kathy, that was very a lady, that was just a private citizen we had that did it was scales no admit, trustee Cloud's friend and all of that, and then we began to look at this thing and we realized, and we actually got kind of messed over one time by the committee, and we realized that our USD needs to have one of its own that's that's on there. So the first two years of my service on there, we met one time each year. Nothing's going on. The big thing right now is that the city of Banning has put a request in the city to have part of the, a huge new development that is in the Beaumont School District to go into Banning. And it's a major fight. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the last, and it, the last meeting was a four to four. Uh, so we, we have to go back. I think it's a, Renee, I mean, uh, Beth just sent me some. It's, Got a meeting coming up real soon. Yeah. So I'd ask to stay because it's in the middle of something and it's uh, become a very contentious issue and uh, uh, it, it affects, uh, and it's really, it's really bad at the city of Banning trying to do this. It really is. But if someone else wants to do it, that's fine too. Don't, don't well, rush make to support a, okay, me. Okay. <laughs> I'll make a motion. I, yeah. You know, you've been serving in this, and you're in the middle of a, pro a process, uh, and uh, we appreciate your acknowledgement of recusing if there's, you know, oh, yeah. on Absolutely. matters related to RUSD. I'll motion to, uh, for Trustee Tom, uh, President Tom Hunt to continue serving. Second. Thank you. Please vote. And I'll tell you what, after banning Beaumont, I can have someone take my place. <laughs> All right, thank you. I think... Five zero, nice affirmation at the end of the evening. Uh, we've already done that, so uh, we're going to go to board member comments uh, that I skipped over before, and I appreciate your uh, allowance of that. And I'll start when Nam's gone, and you want to be sure to send her something from all of us. Good. So I'll start with them with uh, media past president Kathy Allaby. Thank you, uh, Trustee Dale Kinnear. No, no. Board comment. Thank you, sir. Trustee and Clerk Angelo Farouk. I, I have to say a couple things. <laughs> you guys are okay with this. Uh, one, uh, you know, I know you're going to be speaking about Mr. Art Littleworth's passing. Yeah, no. There's another uh, very uh, distinguished uh, person in our community, uh, Mr. Dilip Singh Sethi. Yes. Uh, he's more uh, broadly known as the owner, uh, who was the owner of Singh Chevrolet, uh, the car dealership. He passed away. And he was an extraordinary uh, man in terms of the impact he's made in our community, our school district. Yes, sir. Uh, and I had the honor of um, speaking at his, uh, his service uh, just this past week. Uh, and I made sure to emphasize, you know, the, the impact that he's had on our young people. Thank so you. and just for people to know, he, he the, the program that he did was about for, uh, uh, we know that kids, students only learn if they show up in classroom. And so uh, to encourage perfect attendance uh, from each participating school, you have a chance to win uh, a, 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 a new car uh, among computers, scholarships, and other things. And he expanded the program to uh, middle school and high school uh, and a lot of other charitable things. So I just wanted to, I, I felt it was really important, you know, to acknowledge that uh, his appreciation for, and, and recognition for all the service he's do, done in his legacy. The, the last thing I'll just say is, uh, re regarding the the North incident, 
I you know appreciate the statement from the district. I provide a statement on uh, my Facebook account. I won't reread it since it's already public. But uh, the, the the main takeaway I just want to put is I I want to get some understanding from the uh, staff on the extent of adoption of uh, restorative justice implicit bias. I personally took the implicit bias training myself earlier. Uh, cultural competency, just where are we at with the degree of adoption, and also the evaluation of its quality. So even if everyone's taking it, but it's not having the desired effect, how, how are we examining that? I just want to leave it at that. Thank you, everyone. Th thank you, Dr. For appreciate that. Vice President, Trustee Brent Lee. Yeah, just briefly, I know Mr. Rent's going to mention uh, Mr. Littleworth, but my thoughts are with his wife, Peggy, and family. Um, and uh, just that words matter, actions matter. And, um, I think as, as those that are looking out for you know, students, and I think that's our charge, it's important what we say and how we act and what we do. I think we saw how important that is with who showed up today at our meeting to provide comments. Um, and I think it's important that we listen to those comments. So I'm glad that we took the time and extended a normal amount of time to give those uh, those comments and to listen. I uh, appreciate Mr. Hunt uh, commenting on his um, comment at the last board meeting. His full to do some. Yes, so I appreciate you uh, acknowledging that, uh, apologizing. Um, and uh, just, I, I, I know there's an investigation going on and hope as we, as we move forward um, and uh, learn more that we at least take this as an opportunity to learn from and maybe extend and, and improve our relationship with our uh, Native American local tribes, some of their leadership, so that hopefully we can better. And we, last meeting we had Dr. Milanovic here sharing the story of our, our, our local indigenous people uh, and just the history and the culture. And I think having an opportunity to share that with not just our students more, I know we do it to some degree, but also with our staff I think would be really important and uh, a, a good acknowledgement to the frustration that we heard today that you know our actions and our words matter and that when something happens um, we take the appropriate action but then be proactive about making sure that it doesn't happen thank you that, mr lee thank you very much for that those comments i'll just say uh a few things uh, th thank you for the meeting tonight i would want to be sure superintendent that uh even after your, your comment about the, we, about the testing area, the COVID testing areas and all, I'm not sure they quite understood. And I, I think messaging, it, it, it does bother me, and I'm sure it bothers a lot, that we have teachers who honestly, tearfully think they're gonna lose their jobs if they don't uh, capitulate to the, the mandate of the governor once he finally does one. So please uh, help with the messaging uh, and all you can. I was sharing uh, with uh, some of y'all earlier that I went and took the COVID test at the testing site that's in front of the city hall and uh, just see what it was like. I'm going to go do the one for Riverside. But it was very simple. I walked up and gave my card. I filled out something. We never, they, we never touched each other. She gave me this little tube deal. I was able to go into a little area, but I was, I was by myself. So, you know, and I thought, okay, that's good. And I did that, came back, and I got the thing the next day. And I, but I did think about the comments that they feel, you know, it's their health and it's their, uh, uh, you know, that they want privacy. I don't blame them. So I, I like that version, Tim, if, if it's available to us. I didn't even know they had that anymore instead of the spitting. But anyhow, I appreciate y'all working on it. I know it's not easy. Um, the thing about the North situation, I, I appreciate very much, uh, Renee, how you and, and Assistant Superintendent Yabara have handled it. And, uh, and also, Laura Bowling, getting there right. I, I, I was so impressed that the president of the RCTA understood the gravity of this, and, uh, uh, and I feel for the lady. But I, I think there's some great comments about the young person that filmed this to make sure that how they are and all. Um, but I'll say this, I've been trying for years to get this district involved, and it wasn't anything we weren't, but it was just difficult with the Native Americans in this area. Too bad it had to happen this way. But I appreciate Dr. Farouk has already reached out to uh, Assemblyman James Ramos, former chair of the San Manuels, first Native American to serve in the California Assembly. And if it opens the door, I've always, let me just say this, I've always felt bad that 
this city, and started 20 years ago with me, that we've lost touch with Sherman. As you know, I volunteered a lot of Sherman these years, and uh, uh, it's, it's just a, it's somewhere that we can make a difference, and I think they can make, those children can make a difference with our children, with Arlington being right there. So if we had to do it this way, it's too bad, but I appreciate your staff and you, uh, Superintendent Hill, how you've handled a very difficult situation. I'm proud of the district tonight. I know we're on news in Poughkeepsie, New York or something, but all right, we, we're doing the right thing. We're handling crisis, and we did it in a orderly manner and legal manner. So, um, and thank you everyone for that. Um, and I'm tired. Let's see. We'll now go, we've already done that. Okay, so uh, agenda items for future meetings. You're, I'll hold that one open for 48 hours. It's, it's late. I will say, I just want to bring this up. We've talked about committees and all. I do believe, as I was watching Adam, the one committee we have to keep is governance and finance because it has to go in the details about millions of dollars and there's a lot of questions to ask there. So just the process has to go so well. But that's just something to talk about. So we will adjourn uh, soon. Uh, our next meeting will be November the 18th at 4 o'clock. The board will adjourn a closed session immediately and then go into 5.30. Tonight we will adjourn in the memory of Mr. Singh and I think you covered it very well and thank you. Dr. Farouk representing us there. He was a wonderful man. And uh, to step out and want to give to students and support them is uh, was very commendable. We also adjourn, sadly, the member of uh, our own staff at Fremont Elementary School, teacher since 1995, Donna Romero. Do you want to say anything about? I'm putting you on the spot, but I know a lot of people have been very moved by her passing. Yes, her services are coming up. She was a longtime teacher at a number of schools in our USD, very well loved. Um, when also Laura Bowling, but uh, Bernie Holt and I went over to, to Fremont. Uh, many staff and students just commented on what a great person she was and a beloved teacher she was. Thank you, thank you very much for that. And of course, as I, the, among the giants that have been the history of this city, Art Littleworth, uh, if he's not first, then he's not far behind, but uh, stands with Gage and Miller and, and uh, great founders at North, of course, the Trujillo family. Um, I think you read the stories. Art, of course, was, came on the board, appointed in 58. He served 10 years as our, our uh, president. And during that time, he and those four people who we need to recognize uh, and we haven't, but all four of them, all five of them. In 1965, Riverside Unified became the largest and first large district in the United States to voluntarily desegregate without having a dissent decree and et cetera. Uh, when I talked to the reporter the other day, one th I said something that he didn't add, but I still think this is so impressive. In his book, he talks about that. When they did this, and I think it is, as, as y'all were saying earlier about what our charge is, our minority population, amazingly, in Riverside in 1965 was 14.5%. They got death threats. They, they, some of them had to move their family out of town. Uh, you know, that, that was just uh, two years after the four little girls in Birmingham. At that time, uh, in other southern s s places, uh, George Wallace and seeking dogs and, and billy clubs on, on the Freedom Marchers. And Art and that group, I think, is one of the finest days of Riverside and Riverside Unified. Uh, I was, the moment I met him, just impressed with his, his uh, bearing and who he was and his humility, too, to be, when you read the paper about special master to the Supreme Court on water issues out here. His book was called No Easy Way. I often wondered, I used to tell Kathy this, I wonder if I'll ever have to face anything like Art did. I don't think what we're going up against is anything like art, but it certainly isn't easy. And um, one of the most enjoyable, and Dr. Farouk and I got to go together on this, um, events in my time on the board, was Andrew Walker called me. Andrew's wife is on the board at La Serra University, they're both graduates from there. And he, he called and said, hey, I want you to know 
Vassar University was just named the most diverse university in the United States. Of course, there's only 150 people there, but still. <laughs> and, uh, and so I just took the opportunity, because you know he's a good friend, I said, well, you want to talk about diversity, did you know? No, I didn't, so I sent the book over to him. And uh, he read it, and he gave it to a gentleman you all should meet. He's, we should do more with the dean of the business school there, Dr. Johnny Thomas. And Johnny read it, and he took it to Dr. Wisby, and he read it. And Dr. Hansen got a call, and Dr. Wisby and Dr. Hansen and I went over to meet with Art and Peggy, and LSU wanted to offer, and he accepted uh, an honorary doctorate from La Sierra University. And the interesting thing was, uh, Wisby said, I, we've got a, do you have a rope? And he said, yeah, I got one. It was a rope that a judge had given him, that admired him. And Art went to Yale and then Stanford Law, I, I believe it was. He had, because of his military service, he never got to go to any of his graduations. This was the man's first graduation. And uh, La Sierra University is a beautiful setting. It's a natural arboretum, and they, they have a stage, but the people almost, there's chairs and all, but they just sit out among the trees, and they really, there was 5,000 people there. And uh, Andrew and I got to walk Art up to the stage, and then Wisby tells the story about why they're honoring him. And 5,000 people rose to their feet and had a sustained applause, standing ovation for Art, and Andrew and I are both trying not to weep, and, and uh, and then Angelo and I and uh, Mr. Littleworth got to be together afterwards. I treasure those pictures. And uh, the night, Kathy, that uh, Riverside County School Board Association honored Art at the Victoria Club, that's a picture that I, I, I treasure too. And all of you that knew him uh, feel that way. And uh, we do send our uh, condolences to Peggy. Uh, if someone would like to arrange something for us, and I'm always thinking of Kathy when I'm saying this, that we could all chip in for his services or whatever you think would be appropriate. I'm sure all of us want to chip in. One of the greatest people I've ever met, and I think one of the great Riversiders, and certainly a man of believing like John W. North did in, uh, in opportunity for all. So with that, we close in the memory of those three fine people, Dalip Singh, of course, Donna Romaro, and Arthur Littleworth. Good night. <laughs>